Thank you. Morning, Sarah, would you like to test your mic? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Sure. This is a courtesy announcement that our broadcast is now live on YouTube and our web portal. Good morning, Vice President Ellenberg. Would you like to test your mic? Good morning, Jim. How are you today? I'm good. How about you? Good. Thank you. Have a good day. Coming through loud and clear. Thanks. Good morning, Supervisor Samidian. Would you like to test your mic? Good morning, this is Supervisor Samidian's staff. He will be joining us in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. And the mic is coming through loud and clear, thanks. Thank you. Morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing all right. Thank you. Doing all right. I see Supervisor Lee. Okay, so, so we're, we're going to have the front of your front and center. Recording in progress. We just meet a Supervisor Chavez, and there she is. And 9.30, take it away with a roll call vote, Jim. 
Supervisor Lee. Nancy, be your clerk today. So yes. she's going to do the roll call for you. I'm sorry, was that Nancy? Yes, it is. Okay, Nancy, roll call for you. Good morning. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, I'd like you to lead us in uh, today's Pledge of Allegiance, please. If everyone who can stand, stand. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, nation, indivisible, nation, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor Chavez. Appreciate that. We now move on to the invocation. And the invocation is brought to us today by Supervisor Lee. Ah, Gabrielle. All right. Supervisor Lee, go ahead with the intro. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, Gabrielle Antolovich is the board president executive and executive director of the Billy DeFrank LGBTQ Plus Community Center which provides community leadership, advocacy, services, and support to Silicon Valley LGBTQ plus people and their allies. The DeFrank Center has been a pillar of the LGBTQ plus community in Santa Clara County since its opening in 1981, just 12 years after the Stonewall riots in New York City, which helped to start the modern gay rights movement within America. As with the Stonewall, the DeFrank Center started a modest two-room storefront with a group of individuals who were galvanized to action and Santa Clara County residents vote to repeal ordinances that extended housing and employment protections to lesbian gay men. Since its humbling beginnings at the Frank Center has gone on becoming a gathering place, hosting many discussion groups for many and those identified as part of the LGBTQ plus community, including trans women, trans masculine, gender fluid, non-binary, lesbian, gay, or anyone else who identifies anywhere on the spectrum. Throughout this evolution, Gabriela has always been part of the Frank Center in one way or another. She has been an activist for many years, getting started as a national student organizer in Australia during the 70s, working for equal treatment of gays and lesbians, and later working on substance use prevention in Santa Clara County to help address the high levels of substance use within the LGBTQ plus population, as well as education, outreach on HIV and AIDS. Finally, becoming the executive board president and direct executive director of Billy DeFrank, and while working tirelessly to make sure all individuals have a voice in our society. And with that, I would like to introduce Gabrielle Antolovich to deliver today's invocation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Otto Lee and everybody else here. This is a really difficult time because what we are looking at in November, especially November 20th, is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And we are looking at the people who have been murdered for who they are. And as a person who identifies as non-binary being part of the non-binary trans community, it is a really, really hard time for me personally. Uh, I grew up with parents who wanted a, uh, ballerina pink tutu girl and at six year old I rejected that and I could feel my mother's love withdrawing from me and I started having panic attacks. A six year old should not have any parent withdrawing from them for being who they are. And so I have a, a special Heart in my heart for transgender people who have been murdered. Uh, this year alone in America, 45 transgender people, trans non-binary people have been murdered. And locally we had a trans woman of color, Natalia Smut, who was murdered here in the in Milpitas, not you know, in our own area. And it's so hard when it kids home, but you know, Trans Day of Remembrance is a global movement. We are murdered globally, not just locally. 
And it is so important, and I applaud our County Board of Supervisors for being so supportive of um, this part of our community. And the Billy DeFrank Center is committed to bringing more resources, more attention, more love to our non-binary transgender folks because of that. And one of the things about the Trans Day of Remembrance we say their names, we show their pictures to make them human. You know, the trans non-binary community has been a political football out there while on the ground, we're being murdered. And quite often law enforcement in different areas are not chasing down the murderers the way they would maybe somebody else. Um, they are not often remembered for who they are. And the attitudes of communities needs to be elevated that everyone matters as a human being. And that is our commitment at the Billy to Frank LGBTQ plus community center. We want to be a microcosm of intersectionality. And, um, and I appreciate being asked to give the invocation that our hearts open to everyone, even if we don't know what it means to be transgender, come to the gathering that is on Saturday, November 20th at 1030 at Grace Baptist Church. Your heart will open just by walking in there, seeing the photographs, knowing that these 45 people were murdered in America alone. America, the land of the free, but not for everyone all the time. And so this is a way of recommitting, you know, who we are as a county that we embrace everyone and not just with our brains and policies, but also with our hearts. And that is um, our wish from, um, as a non-binary person whose mother never loved me again, not just as a six-year-old, but for the rest of her life, because I was not who she wanted me to be. And so our hearts are broken trying to find family with each other. And thank God the County Board of Supervisors is part of our family. I, you know, we really appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, uh, for that invocation on today's agenda. We now move to item number four to announce adjournments in memoriam. Uh, Supervisor Lee, you're up again. Yes, um, today it is with a heavy heart that I offer an adjournment in memoriam for our dear friend and my own mentor, Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chen. Supervisor Chen was a fierce leader and devoted champion for accessible and affordable health care, child care, housing, immigrant rights, and services for older, older adults for almost 50 years. Born in Boston in 1949 to Chinese immigrant parents, Supervisor Chen received her Bachelor of Arts degree in, the, in history from Wellesley College and a Master of Arts degree in Education Policy from Stanford. She was first elected to the Alameda County Board of Supervisors in 94 and returned in 2010 after serving in the assembly to represent the cities of Alameda, San Leandro, and portions of East Oakland, Chinatown, and Jack London Square. From 2006, she represented Oakland, Alameda, and Piedmont in the State Assembly until being termed out. Over her illustrious 40 plus years of career service in public service, Supervisor Chen was steadfast in her commitment to uplifting community voices and fighting for social and economic justice. Supervisor Chen broke numerous ceilings throughout her career as the first Asian American being elected to Alameda County Board of Supervisors the first woman and first Asian American to be a majority leader in the California State Assembly. A true trailblazer and a passionate leader, Supervisor Chen 
leaves behind a remarkable legacy of groundbreaking policy and community-based initiatives, including saving San Leandro Hospital from closure, preserving the emergency room, saving numerous jobs and protecting safety net hospital in Central County. Founding first five in Alameda County, an Alameda co collaborative for children, youth, and their families. Ending the practice of hospitals, overcharging uninsured and underinsured patients, and to establish a no lead standard in drinking water pipes. Banning toxic flame retardants and putting California on the map as the first state to ban the chemicals and so many, many more. Supervisor Chen is survived by her two children and two grandchildren. Her passing is a tremendous loss to our community and she will be sorely missed. But her extraordinary legacy will endure forever. Rest in peace and rest in power, Wilma. Thank you, President Bosman. Thank you. I'd also like to turn to Supervisor Simidian. You're muted, sir. Thank you. Uh, forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. There we go, thank you. I just also wanted to add a word of uh, condolence uh, in connection with Wilma Chan's passing, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I um, uh, had the privilege of uh, being Wilma's colleague. Uh, we were freshmen together uh, when we entered the California State Assembly uh, in the same class some years ago. Um, she was a person of uh, good values, but, but more than that, uh, really great determination and um, uh, a person who uh, was very results oriented in terms of uh, always keeping her eye on um, the end goal and what it would take to improve the lot of people who needed uh, our help uh, most significantly. So I, I add my condolences uh, and um, I know for friends and families, it's a deeply personal loss, uh, but it's also a loss in the sense of um, uh, a person in the public arena who really was determined uh, to make the world a better place for the people who most needed her help. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to just thank Supervisor Lee for um, having us adjourn in her honor. Um, she was a, you know, a role model for many, many, um, many, many, uh, not just elected officials, but activists in our community. And I think what is most, um, what will be most missed is that she was championing issues now that we think of as kind of mainstream when they weren't. And we have to appreciate that courage and tenacity. And um, thank you again, Supervisor Lee. Absolutely. Thank you. That was uh, heartfelt from everybody. We now move on to item number five, commendations and proclamations. And it is my honor to present a commendation for 67 community-based organizations for being instrumental in preventing homelessness by providing direct financial assistance to lower income families during the pandemic. In May of 2020, we're gonna get the screen up there. Good, and we should be having the names of the 67 community-based organizations. There they go. They'll be scrolling by on slides in alphabetical order. In May of 2020, 67 community-based organizations whose names, as I just said, are being displayed on the screen right now. And thank you very much to our clerk's office for making that happen. All these groups work together in an unprecedented collaboration to serve the families and individuals who had little or no access to mainstream relief in Santa Clara County. These 67 community-based organizations stretched and sacrificed their organizational capacity to heroically serve the most vulnerable members of our community throughout the COVID-19 pandemic with empathy, empathy, competency, and accessibility. While of course, each of those individuals were dealing with COVID on their own and their families. As part of a collective community response, the organizations rapidly issued 
emergency financial and rental assistance to the most vulnerable Santa Clara County residents to prevent homelessness and housing instability. These efforts have contributed to the distribution of over $60 million in direct assistance to more than 17,000 families and individuals in Santa Clara County. I now would like to invite Jennifer Loving, the Chief Executive Officer of Destination Home, to say a few words on behalf of the 67 community-based organizations. And Jennifer, we're going to keep that screen going. And if we can please, I don't see you on my little screen. If you are there, I'm Jennifer, here. please start speaking. There you are. Hi, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. And to the uh, entire Board of Supervisors, thank you for taking the time to honor these 67 organizations that uh, when COVID hit, uh, uh, when everyone else went home, they walked forward right into the middle of this pandemic and worked really, truly tirelessly to serve our most vulnerable families. Uh, a, a fraction of these organizations work with our homelessness prevention system historically for the last several years. And we launched a fund to support uh, uh, people affected by COVID uh, within a couple of weeks of shelter in place. That was combined with eviction moratoriums, which made this region and the city of San Jose some of the first in the nation to go into uh, eviction protections for people, vulnerable families. That work together uh, allowed these organizations to serve families, frankly, under their direction. And what I mean by that is uh, we were used to a uh, a subset of people that were becoming homeless every month. Our budget was to serve about 2,000 families in the year 2020. A few weeks into COVID, we'd already gotten 28,000 phone calls for help, 28,000. And so we brought community members under also the direction of Zulma Maciel uh, at the city of San Jose, asked our community what, what was needed, and they said money to people as quickly as possible. And so we said, great, can we all do this together? And so all of these organizations joined hands and spent the next many, many months providing first direct cash assistance. And then as finally, there were protections and stimulus money from the federal government to take care of rent. So we started resolving rent and supervisor. Actually, it's almost $80 million to over oh. 19,000 households um, because only because uh, that's the latest and greatest numbers. Um, and one of the, a couple of the things that I think are worth noting is that the, because we took the direction of these partners and what they knew where the needs were, was the money largely mirrored where the highest uh, impacts of COVID were being felt. The same zip codes that we're seeing, the enormous rates of transmission, we're seeing the largest amounts of resources going into the community at the same time. And as the end result, 95% of the families that received this funding identified as households of color. So all of this was only possible because every one of these names from Gilroy and Palo Alto all the way down to Gilroy and everywhere in between spent and risked their lives to make sure that families could be protected during this pandemic and are still to this day doing this work. So uh, at Destination Home, we are so grateful to our partners. And I also would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge that the team at Destination Home who also uh, pivoted and started doing this work almost exclusively for many months. And then we hired a team of, of temporary employees who are still with us, who are still providing support and resources and, and partner guidance. And we are so grateful to the internal team as well. So thank you for taking the time to acknowledge this amazing group of, of people. Heroes is really the right word. They did not have to do this. And it was for a lot, it risked their lives, it risked their families' lives. And they did it because no one else was going to. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for all you've done, all you're doing, and thank you to the 67 groups all being listed here. Um, these names are so very recognizable and very much appreciated. And on behalf of this Board of Supervisors, you have our heartfelt thanks for all that you've done and our best wishes that you and your family remain healthy. Thank you very much. With that, we are going to move on to item number five, which is accommodations excuse me, we just did item five, accommodations and proclamations, uh, item A. Now we're gonna to go to B, C, and D. The first will be brought by Supervisor Lee, 
And then the last two by Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, this one is a commendation um, to Eduardo Rocha. Eduardo Rocha is a District 3 resident and previously served our county as a Santa Clara employee of 30 years with the Department of Probation. After retirement, Eduardo is now the owner of Silver Spurs, a small hauling and handy man business servicing Santa Clara County and has provided 15 years of extraordinary service to private fiduciaries and the Office of the Public Administrator Guardian Conservator. Eduardo assisted the Public Administrator Guardian Conservator staff in finding clients' vital and personal documents, locating and preserving family keepsakes. He is a valued and trusted community partner of the Public Administrator Guardian Conservator. Thank you, Eduardo, for your service and commitment to our public guardian and for going so above and beyond and for so many years. We know that Eduardo is joining us with the Public Guardian staff. And Eduardo, would you like to say a few words? Hi, Eduardo. Go right ahead. You're muted, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Try, try again. You are still muted. You might give it a try again, and we'll see if the echo's gone away from your uh, partners behind you. There you are. I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors and the Public Guardian's Office for this special award. It's greatly appreciated. You're either a man of few words or you were muted. Man of few words. I think man of few words, Eduardo. Is there more you would like to say? I'd, I'd also like to comment that it's been a pleasure working uh, with the Public Guardian's Office, a highly professional group, dedicated, and uh, would like to continue this uh, positive working relationship. I'd like to comment that um, I've got a birthday coming up in a couple of days. So I'm, going be, I'm going to be 39 years old, and, uh, and uh, we'll see uh, if we can keep this uh, keep it going on. Super. Thank you Thank very you much. Very Thank you very much and uh, happy early birthday to you from the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Lee, for uh, bringing us quite a character. Doing a and great I job. apologize, President Wasserman, I clearly could not add 30 plus 15 is 39. That, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We now move on to Supervisor Ellenberg for item 5C. Thank you so much. Um, my first of two proclamations today is in recognition of Transgender Day of Remembrance. Uh, Gabrielle Antolovich gave a beautiful invocation this morning. Gabrielle, thank you for sharing your personal story and the important work that the Billy DeFrank Center does to uplift and support our LGBTQ plus community. Transgender Day of Remembrance will be observed across the country. It's an annual observance on November 20th that honors the memory of the transgender individuals whose lives were lost in acts of anti-trans violence. Tragically, at least 46 transgender or non-gender conforming people were fatally shot or killed by other violent means across the nation in 2021 alone. According to the Human Rights Campaign, these victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, or strangers, some of whom who have been arrested and charged while others have yet to be identified. Some of the cases involve clear anti-trans bias. In others, the victim's trans status may have put them at risk in other ways, such as forcing them into unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and or survival sex work. Too often, these stories go unreported or misreported. In previous years, most of the people who were killed were Black or Latinx women. These victims are part of our communities. They are partners, family members, friends, colleagues, and members of our faith communities. These losses are horrific, unacceptable, and we must do better. In honor of Transgender Day of Remembrance, the County of Santa Clara Office of LGBTQ Affairs and TransCan Work Inc. will be presenting Trans Day of Remembrance, the historical and human experience on Thursday, November 18th at 3 p.m. Panelists of transgender and gender expansive lived experience will speak 
on their own transgender, non-conforming, non-binary, intersex journeys, sharing stories of personal human experience and discussing the stigma of what it means to be TGI. I hope that many of you will join us for this free virtual event as we amplify the importance of Trans Awareness Week and acknowledge the historical significance of Transgender Day of Remembrance. I'd like to invite our Office of LGBTQ Affairs to read the names of those we've lost. As, as Gabrielle said, it is important that we say their names. Hi, Daniel. Hi, and it, I'm here to uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vice President Allenberg. And we wanna acknowledge the, the strength, intelligence, persistence, resilience, and extraordinary stories of our trans, non-binary, and gender expensive community members uh, locally and throughout the world. Uh, trans people should not have to stand for the, for the picking and choosing of rights and dignity. And we look forward for the Santa Clara County to continue to push for trans equity, inclusion, and social justice as we honor the legacy of those who fell victim to anti-trans violence by living bravely in their authenticity. Um, we'd like to also uh, acknowledge the trans lives lost. Um, this year alone, um, this year around uh, 46 trans lives lost, uh, trans lives uh, have uh, lost their lives due to anti-trans violence and brutality. So we'd like to honor them by saying their name. Tiana Alexander, Samuel Edmund Valentin, Bianca Muffin Banks, Dominique Jackson, Fifty Dance, Alexis Braxton, China Carilla, Jeffrey JJ Wright, Jasmine Kennedy, Jenna Franks, Diamond Kyrie Sanders, Brianna Pardo, Jada Peterson, Dominique Luscious, Remy Fennell, Tiara Banks, Natalia Smut, Iris Santos, Tiffany Thomas, Carrie Washington, Jahira Dialto, Whispering Wind Bear Spirit, Sophie Vasquez, Danica Danny Henson, Serenity Hollis, Oliver Ollie Taylor, Thomas Harden, Poe Blatt, E.J. Boykin, Idaline Evans, Taya Ashton, Shai Vanderpump, Tierra Marie Lewis, Miss Coco, Pooh Don Johnson, Desire Monet, Brianna Hamilton, Pierre Lapri Cartier, Mel Groves, Royal Political Stars, Zoe Rose Martinez, Joe. Acker, Jesse Hart, Ricky Otumura, Markeisha Lawrence, and Jenny DeLeon. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Vice President Ellenberg. You have a second uh, proclamation as well. I do, and this one is in recognition, recognition of World AIDS Day. Uh, World AIDS Day was founded in 1988 and is an international day dedicated to raising awareness of the AIDS pandemic and honoring the lives lost to that disease. World AIDS Day invites global communities to show support for the estimated 38 million people living with HIV and to honor the more than 36.3 million who have died from an AIDS-related illness. As of 2020, uh, there were 
3,590 people living with HIV in Santa Clara County. The 2021 World AIDS Day Silicon Valley, which is themed ending the HIV epidemic, equitable access, everyone's voice, brings together members of all communities for a series of free, virtual, and in-person public events that provide support and awareness of AIDS-related illnesses. On Wednesday, December 1st, our county's public health department, in partnership with the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, will, rate, will host a flag-raising ceremony at 70 West Heading. The flag-raising ceremony will be a pillar within a series of county and community-driven events happening locally around World AIDS Day to engage and uplift our Santa Clara County community. I'd like to invite members of the county's HIV Commission to say a few words now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President Ellerberg. Uh, this is Daniel Moretti from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Um, unfortunately, the members of the HIV Commission um, had a schedule conflict or are unable to make it, but they want to share their extreme gratitude and um, thanks to the Board of Supervisors for their continued recognition of this important day. And they look forward to the opportunity for folks to be together both virtually and in person around World AIDS Day on December 1st. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, Dan. It's our honor to do so. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you again, Vice President Ellenberg, for bringing this to this board meeting. Before we move on to item number six, receiving our report um, from the annual CalWORKs Achievement Award, I would like to tell anybody listening if they want to speak under public comment, that will be the item following the CalWORKs Achievement Awards to please register electronically so we have an idea of how many speakers. And a very important reminder today um, is to, if you wish, public comment is to be used to speak about things not on today's agenda. So please do not raise your hand after the CalWORKs award if you wish to speak on anything that is on today's agenda. Thank you. And uh, with that, I will turn to item number six. Robert, do we have you on there? Here's Robert. Hey. Hello good, there. good morning. Good, please. good morning to everyone. Um, so we have Angela Shing here, a director of Employment Benefit Services, to present this item, and um, we'll let her um, let her go at it here. Thank hey. you. Welcome, Angela. Go right in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you so much for um, honoring the accomplishments of our five resilient families. Um, who, through the ter determination and perseverance and dedication, have been able to make significant progress towards achieving their goals in our CalWORKs program. Despite uncertainties and challenges resulting from the continued COVID-19 pandemic, these families have certainly persisted and we are thrilled to be celebrating with you and the public to recognize our families for their outstanding achievements. For 31 years, the CalWORKs program has been providing families with services to transition to financial independence. And over the past three decades, the CalWORKs program has expanded in network of community partners and programs so that today we are able to provide a diverse catalog of services designed to meet the needs of each individual family's unique journey. Thanks to the efforts of the employment services teams and community partners, the honorees highlighted in the upcoming video, as well as all of our families have access to a wide variety of individualized employment-based services, including job placement, vocational training, paid work experience, and adult education and community college programs and have been connected to a variety of useful services, including childcare, transportation, food, and healthcare. Today's remarkable honorees demonstrate that having a clear vision, setting attainable goals, and following a well thought out plan can lead to positive and successful outcomes. So on behalf of our staff, families, and community partners, I'd like to wish our award winners continued success. And without further ado, please enjoy this short video we prepared to celebrate our award recipients. Wonderful, thank you. Each year, the CalWORKs program recognizes the outstanding achievements of five CalWORKs families through the CalWORKs Achievement Awards. This year's honorees are particularly notable, having demonstrated the perseverance and determination required to overcome many life obstacles, as well as the challenges of COVID-19, to create a better future for their families. Please join us in honoring this year's CalWORKs Achievement Award winners. Caitlin struggled with many difficult challenges. Now, she has her sights set on becoming a regional manager and owning her first home. Probably just the support I have in, in my support system and in my family. 
Like, they continue to be there. To just keep going back. Like, it's... Uh, even if you have to, like, take the bus, like, it's, you know, like, just keep going back <laughs> until you find something, you know, like, you'll get it, you'll get an opportunity and just go with that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. That, like, no matter what obstacle that they, they face, like, as long as they don't give up, like, they'll, they'll be all right, you know, but they can't give up. Erica overcame a difficult situation to set out on a journey to provide a safe and stable environment for her two daughters. She has worked as a disaster service worker for the county at the fairgrounds and has maintained economic stability since May. So basically when I went to the fairgrounds, I, was, I wasn't too pleased about it, but I was like, you know what, this is for a good cause, you know, I'm going to be a part of it, I'm going to be, you know, one of those people later in life saying, I was there, I was doing that, I helped, you know, so I thought it was a good positive on that part. I feel like the opportunity of being in the program and having the job, it helped me support my family, you know. Well, if they're in the program, I would highly suggest learning and taking everything you can in um, and just like doing your best so you can show and stand out. Um, because if I can do it, I know they can do it. Anybody can do it. And just to work for the county is something, it's, it's an opportunity. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity, you know. So I think it takes time and patience to get where you want to be. Maria's focus has always been to provide a safe and stable home for her family. Her long-term goals are to become a citizen, establish herself within a stable and good-paying career, and to purchase a forever home for her family. My life has a good because uh, the program hard work helped me, helped me for the English class, helped me for the money, helped me for take care for my kids. It's a good, it uh, has a good in my life. Was there ever anything you wanted me to do for you, but I could not? No, no means you and other people help me. Mohammed and Samar's journey has not been easy. Rather, it has been long and challenging. Mohammed and Samar are grateful to CalWORKS for the opportunities and resources that have made it possible for them to pursue their dreams. Is there anything that you would be most grateful for? Um, so the things that I'm... In grateful in life first of all uh, they're obviously my kids uh, I I'm very proud of them and really grateful for have them in our lives now you've been part of the um, CalWORKS program um, since you moved here to Santa Clara County um, what um, since you've been enrolled in the program um, how has it changed your life uh, uh, well, uh, it, first of all, it gives us uh, a peace of mind that, uh, like I uh, mentioned earlier, that there is help around the corner uh, if we ever need it. And uh, and then we were, uh, my wife and I both were able to focus on study and to, uh, to better plan for a better future of our family. So uh, it's been a great help in getting us resources, uh, uh, make make resources available for us so it's it's been great now for for future generations of your family um uh, watching this video what is something what are some words of wisdom you would like to give them what would you like them um to know oh uh, well um first love each other and care for each other because that's 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 what matters the most Sonia's hard work and perseverance attracted the notice of one of her instructors, who offered Sonia an internship with the Santa Clara County Office of the District Attorney. What are some of the most important lessons that you have learned in life? Uh, the most important lesson that I've learned in my life is that never give up. Achieve your goals where you are and just don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. What are you most grateful for in your life? 
I am so grateful for the people that are around me, my family, my kids. I'm grateful uh, for the CalWorks. I think I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't that help that I received. So I'm so grateful for the people, everybody who has helped me around the CalWorks. Congratulations to our awardees for everything you and your families have overcome. We look forward to your continued growth and future <clears throat> success. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations to everyone. I look forward to the days when we get to see all your faces and your families and your friends and your specifically your Cal um, supporters there in our board chambers in person again. Look forward to doing that next year. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, supervisors. I always say the facts and figures tell part of the story, but me being able to see the, the, um, the awardees' faces Yes, um, truly tells a story, and I appreciate your your recognition of that so much. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you, Robert, as well. All right, with that, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is public comment. Everybody listening who wants to speak under public comment, please understand that items eleven and twelve, which relate to the jail topic, will not be heard today and are being deferred to the January 11th meeting. Um, and I'm guessing at 2 p.m. We'll firm that up at the end. But right now, it's my intent to hear those items, which are on today's calendar, number 11 and 12, regarding the jail, jail system. We're going to hear those on January 11th at 2 p.m. So if that's what you want to speak about today, there's no need for you to do so. It does not come under public comment, and we will not we will not be hearing it today. With that, um, I'm going to turn to our clerk, Nancy, and I'm going to ask you to read the consent calendar, please. Okay. There is a correction to item number 9B. Item number 9B is to consider recommendations relating to the purchase and ground lease of real property located at 3090 South Bascom Avenue, San Jose property, assessor's parcel number 414-14-092. The delegation listed in, in the second possible action should allow for a contract term not to exceed 75 years. There is a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item numbers 11 and 12 to January 11, 2022, following consideration by the Public Safety and Justice Committee. Apologies. Item number 11. Nancy, apologies. Um, yes. I believe we skipped public comments. Super, uh, President Wasserman, procedurally, I believe we need to do that first. You're saying doing doing public comment before the um, consent calendar. You are 100% right. I thank you for that, Jim. And uh, let's do that. I made all those disclaimers about public comment and then forgot all about it. Call me a rook for a day. That's all right, sir. So Nancy, we'll go to uh, calling the folks for item uh, for the public comment item. Yep. Let's look at number of participations. We currently have five, six. Okay, seven. Let's just give it a minute here for all those people thinking I skipped right over them. Okay, let's go. I see we have seven. Let's go with two minutes each. Our first speaker is Sarah Clay Smutnik. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The and timer before, will start when you begin and, speaking. And before you start her time, I want to thank the 23 people who texted me that I forgot public comment. Thank you all very much for having my back. All right, let's start. Sarah, you may begin. Okay, um, my name is Sarah Clay. I work for Santa Clara County Parks. I 
am currently stationed on the grounds crew. Uh, we take care of approximately 200 acres of lawns throughout the county. And uh, we are a specialized crew who does the mowing, irrigation repairs, uh, fertilizing, slit seeding, uh, fixing water breaks. Uh, we completed the irrigation technician training cl class, which is a 40 hour course. <clears throat> the regular 60 park staff who usually cleans the bathrooms and takes care of the group areas, um, We'll have to go through the irrigation technician training, uh, which, in my opinion, uh, is a waste of taxpayers' money. And uh, so our uh, crew is uh, trained to operate uh, smart uh, controllers. Um, but since we are in a drought, we want to uh, try to save as much water as possible as far as the um, lawns go. So, um, yeah, so they want to get rid of our crew, unfortunately, and uh, put all the extra uh, workload um, on top of the regular park staff at all the parks. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, Supervisor. Good morning. Paul, we can't hear you. It was March that Chicanos represented 5% Mexicans, represented 5% of the population, but yet we represented 20% of the casualties in Vietnam. On August 29th of 1970 in Los Angeles, we marched against that. We petitioned, we were redressing our grievance to the government and stating that this is unjust, that they are sending our men, or they were taking us from the fields of Vietnam, from Sasipuedes and putting them in the fields of Vietnam. And we were fighting for their democracy. We were fighting to give them a democracy that the Chicanos were not experiencing here in San Jose. These are facts, okay? And the process that was gone undergone in order to set that monument over that history park I want to know why the public was not notified of that, why the public was not educated about Vietnam, Vietnamese placing that statue there in commemoration and then having them talk like the Americans had abandoned them. They said that the Americans abandoned them and there are Chicanos in this city that died on their behalf. And Mexicans in California marched in that Chicano moratorium against what the government was doing. As a result of that, we lost three people. One of them was reporter Ruben Salazar, who was considered the voice of the people. And he was a reporter for the LA Times and he was killed in the, in the Silver Dollar Bar by the Sheriff's Department. They blew his head off with a, with a gas, uh, uh, like a gas grenade. And so what I'm saying is that I don't have any objections about having it, but the process that you guys undergone is cause for suspicion. I mean, you're putting up a monument that is a representative of war, and you ain't even talking about the Mexican community here that sacrificed their best for them. Our next speaker is Linda Edwards. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. 20 months ago, you asked us to shut down our society to flatten the curve to save our healthcare system. And we did negatively impacting so many people's jobs and businesses, but we did because you said it was for the greater good. Then you asked us to endure more lockdowns and restrictions to reach herd immunity, to save the elderly and immunocompromised. But now after looking at data from around the world, we know that there will be no herd immunity because these vaccines do not provide immunity. They do not stop person to person transmission and their effectiveness against severe disease wanes within months requiring never ending boosters. It doesn't matter if it's the Delta variant, Mu, Nu, Omega, Sigma, or Xanadu. We will continue to have variant after variant after variant. It is now time to treat COVID like the endemic virus that it is, just like the seasonal flu. We have to learn to live with it. Norway has opted to open fully. 
no masks, no vaccine mandates, no vaccine passports, and that was with lower vaccination rates than Santa Clara County. Many of our surrounding counties have opted to reduce the mask mandates for indoor masking, including Santa Cruz County, Alameda County, Marin, Contra Costa, and others. But here in Santa Clara County, we're approaching record 85% single vaccinated rates and over 73% for fully vaccinated. And you want to keep masks indoors, masking for kids, and forcing people to choose between their jobs and forced vaccination. Stop the insanity. Stop focusing on COVID case rates, which we know from past experience are inaccurate faulty PCR tests and many false positives. We talked about this months ago, remember? Instead, we need to focus on hospitalization rates and deaths. Both of those rates are low in our county. Let's talk about early in-home treatment kits like they're doing in parts of India. Let's get IV monoclonal antibody clinics like they're doing in Florida and other states. Let's get widespread antibody testing to see what our natural immunity rates are. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa Ortiz. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Melissa Ortiz and I've been a park maintenance worker with Santa Clara County Parks for four years now. Um, as a park maintenance worker, my coworkers and I kept our parks open during the whole of the pandemic. We provided an essential public ser service when it was needed most. And I'd like to talk today about the parks management's proposal to delete a senior park maintenance worker and the reorganization of our grounds crew. We're concerned because management proposal, one, eliminates one of our few promotional opportunities, two, lowers the quality of service that we deliver to the public, and three, disregards a petition signed by over 90% of park maintenance workers. Uh, a month ago, our membership made three different proposals to management with no reply. Yesterday, we met with management and they told us they still didn't have a reply for us. Even after 90% of park maintenance workers signed a petition against the job deletion. Uh, we do this work to serve the community and make the parks a safe and fun place to be. And we're proud of the jobs that we do. We ask the board to urge management to please negotiate in good faith with SEIU 521 and save our promotional opportunities. Our community deserves better. Thank you. The next speaker is Linda Bookman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. My name is Linda Bookman. I've lived in the county for 25 years. I'm a mother, a public health nurse, and for the last year and a half, I've been a volunteer for the public health department working at vaccination clinic. I would like to publicly thank Dr. Cody for her leadership during this pandemic. And I would like to publicly thank you, the Board of Supervisors, for supporting her and the whole public department. Thank you. The next speaker is Matthew Silva. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Matthew Silva. I've been a park maintenance worker with Santa Clara County Parks for seven years. During the pandemic, our parks stayed open and provided an essential public health service that would not have been possible without park maintenance workers. Uh, I'd also like to talk to you today about our management's proposal to delete a senior park maintenance worker position, as well as our turf and irrigation maintenance crew. Um, again, we would like to urge the board or ask the board to urge parks management to please negotiate in good faith with SEIU 521 and to save our promotional opportunities and to allow us to maintain the standard of excellence that the public expects from us when they visit our parks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Largent. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Santa Clara County, Scott Largent. I'm uh, taking a little drive before I um, head out to work. And I'm over near uh, Bellarmine High School. And uh, some of these neighborhoods over here, uh, they had minimal uh, amount of RVs kind of throughout the pandemic. But now every single spot now is a car, a motor home. And then of course the sidewalks now are starting to pile up with tents and uh, lo lots of people. Um, this is the other direction that everyone was pushed out of that crash zone. Um, the rest of everybody is over there now in zone one. I believe there's zone one there. 
And those ones are all along the Guadalupe, uh, right backed up against 87. Um, I, I wave the flag. Um, I, I try to get you guys involved to do something about this humanitarian crisis. Um, people are not being put on the correct holds right now. They're being allowed to just wander in traffic and setting it as that's their baseline now is just unacceptable. Uh, there's a man, his name is uh, Rainbow. Uh, he, he's had a rough life and we're watching this man die over the period of the last three years. Um, he is now in a set of pumps right now. He looks dead. He just literally looks like the walking dead. And he's going across Taylor, across Coleman. You know, he's convulsing. He doesn't know which direction to go. And um, the county doesn't seem to think that's a problem. The police department doesn't seem to think that's a problem. Um, this is somebody's child, you know, that needs to be pulled out of this type of situation, put on a hold, stabilized, and, and truly helped. And everyone has seen this person out there and, and um, they're, they're damn near dead. And that's unacceptable. So um, get off Zoom and get out here and take a look, please. Next speaker is Elizabeth. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and um, I wanna talk about like, so before um, the pandemic, we had a lot of folks who are homeless in Santa Clara County, over 11,000 of folks who are homeless. And so I'm hearing the, all the statistics about um, the many people who are be, uh, being helped throughout the pandemic, which is really great, but we still have this unprecedented amount of people who are homeless um, and need re resources and need help. And having a new jail would not help that. It would just cycle people um, um, through the jail and not really help them um, with what they need help with. So I'm saying no to the new jail and yes to helping people who uh, are homeless and actually get um, fundamental, the fundamental resources that they need. Thank you. The next speaker is Gail Ann Osmer. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to get on and talk about the RV problem that we're having and um, our unhoused folks not having any place to go. But like Scott said, um, near Bellamon on the streets. Yesterday, I went to get my booster at the fairgrounds and I we had to go on Monterey in the back there. And on the way out, I mean, I was amazed at this land that is empty. There's fences around there. I, I just can't comprehend why we can't put hundreds of RVs out there. This land is just sitting there. And um, I, I just wish that this could happen um, in phase three um, during this whole FAA um, abatement. A lot of the RVs are on that side, phase three, which is Taylor, Spring, Irene, Heading. And um, they need to be moved because there's so many people living so close to each other. So um, I really truly believe that we can find a way to move these RVs out there. Please look into this. It's very important and it's very important for people's lives. Um, I know living in an RV is much better than living outside, but still they need to be safe. And where the folks are, unfortunately, in phase three, they are not safe. So thank you so much. I do appreciate your time. And I really hope we can you can look into this and see what we can do or you can do. So let's move some of these RVs out there. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. And with that, we're gonna proceed in numerical order and move on to the consent calendar. All right, so Nancy, if you uh, will please read our consent calendar again. There is a correction to item number 9B. Item number 9B is to consider recommendations relating to the purchase and grand lease of real property located at 3090 South Bascom Avenue in San Jose, property assessor's parcel number 414-14-092. 
the delegation listed in the second possible action should allow for a contract term not to exceed 75 years. There is a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item numbers 11 and 12 to January 11th, 2022, following consideration by the Public Safety and Justice Committee. Item number 11 is to receive report relating to improving jail management and operations, appropriately sizing the jail population and alternatives to jail. Item number 12 is to consider recommendations relating to the framework for justice involved clients. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item number 21 to December 14th, 2021. Item number 21 is to receive report relating to next steps for the countywide analysis of schools and post-secondary institution compliance with Title IX, the Clary Act, and other relevant state and federal laws. There is a request from Supervisor Lee to add item number 22 to the consent calendar. Item number 22 is to consider recommendations relating to home ownership programs and updates to the 2016 affordable, I'm sorry, 2016 Measure A affordable housing bond guidelines. There is a request from administration to hold item number 24 to December 7th, 2021. Item number 24 is to consider recommendations relating to a challenge grant to fund the development of supportive interim housing sites across the county. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item numbers 42, 43, 48, 51, 55, and 57 from the consent calendar. Item number 42 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 93 in the amount of $138,850 transferring funds from the COVID-19 and other economic uncertainty reserve to the Department of Correction budget relating to adding an unclassified administrative services manager three position to support the chief of correction. Item number 43 is the adoption of executive leadership salary ordinance number NS-20.21.07 adding one unclassified administrative services manager three position in the Department of Correction. Item number 48 is to receive report relating to market research for a new solicitation process for jail, phone, and tablet services. Item number 51 is to receive report relating to School of Arts and Culture's efforts to undertake affordable housing and community development. Item number 55 is to approve delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate pre-development agreements, such as exclusive negotiating agreements and pre-development loan agreements with Eden Housing and the core companies or their affiliates in connection with the planning of and pre-development loan for a potential multifamily affordable housing development of approximately seven acres of property owned by the county known as the East Santa Clara Street site in San Jose. Item number 57 is to consider recommendations relating to the safe parking program for unhoused vehicle dwellers. There is a correction to item number 68. The item should read as follows. Item number 68, Supervisor Lee nominate. Janet Payne for appointment to the Race and Health Disparities Community Board, seat number 10. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item numbers 69, 70, and 71 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently. Item number 69 is to re receive report relating to the draft juvenile justice realignment block grant annual plan. Item number 70 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 82 in the amount of $1,032,405, increasing revenue and expenditures and adjusting reimbursements within the probation department and behavioral health services department budgets relating to the juvenile justice realignment block grant program funding. Item number 71 is to ratify the attestation form for the County of Santa Clara, signed by the County Executive and submitted to the California State Controller's Office Local Government Programs and Services Division relating to the Juvenile Justice Realignment Block Grant Program funding. 
This concludes the reading of the consent calendar update. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna make one comment on 21, and then I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Chavez, who has a number of items that are pulled. Just a heads up, Supervisor Chavez, um, who has a number of items pulled and asked if there's um, anything we could do about those as far as grouping them together or comments that you may have to get Mike, them- Mike, I'm ready to go on it. Thank you, to get them back on to consent or approve. Well, some of them, yeah. The comment I'm gonna make on item number 21 is when it comes back to us from the consultants, um, identifying the problems that they find, that I also expect solutions to be provided. Um, again, my position on this item was, why are we doing this work for the schools? At the end of the day, when they get this information, I hope our consultants not only identify the problems at each site, and I'm sure there are problems at each site, they also come back with the recommended solutions, and then we hand the ball over to the schools to take it from there. Uh, that was my only comment. With that, Supervisor Chavez, I'm gonna turn to you um, regarding the items that you pulled. Thank you. I wanna first um, start with item 18. This is an item, uh, a report back on a referral I made relative to drug facilitated sexual assault. I wanted to thank the staff for the very thorough um, staff report and ask for a six month report out to the full board regarding implementation as it relates to all hospitals in the county. On item, um, on items both 11 and 12, I um, appreciate the direction to hold those to January 11th. I'm supportive of that. Item number 22, I'd like to leave it off um, consent and to have it be heard at its regular position in the agenda. Supervisor um, Chavez, I need clarification, please. On item 18, I heard your comments and your requests, but we are still hearing 18. Consent. Consenting 18, thank you. Correct. And on 22, it was being held, your request? No, it was being heard today instead of being put on consent. I have requests from Supervisor Lee to add item 22 to consent. Your desire yes. is that it be heard. Correct. Thank you. Item 42 and 43 relate to um, hiring a, an, um, an administrative service manager to support the chief of correction. I'd like to put item 42 and 43 back on consent, but with direction to staff to come back to the full board, either in open or closed session as is appropriate to discuss the hiring of a chief of correction. All righty. Item 48 is to receive a report from the office of the county exec and, the, and our procurement officer in the office of the sheriff and TSS relating to market research for new, a new solicitation process for jail phones and tablets. I wanna thank the staff for the work done on this. I'd like to put it back on consent and request that procurement through the county exec consider an annual um, mini market survey to see if there are new technologies that become available. All right. Item, item 49 is on the consent calendar. This is in response to a request that I made to better understand how we were utilizing state and federal funds, primarily state funds for the expansion of housing. I'd like to ask staff to come back to FGOC at its January meeting with a timeline and a work plan attached to the report back. Okay. Item 51 is uh, to receive a report from the office of the county exec related to the School of Arts and Culture. I'd like to ask if my colleagues are comfortable with me deferring that to December 14th. Item 55 um, is to um, this is to approve a delegation of authority um, on a site that the county owns on Santa Clara and 17th. 
I want to remind the staff that the board has asked repeatedly for more community engagement. I am concerned that we have chosen a develop, actually the development companies without educating the, the community about our process and about the um, choice and why it was made. I would like to leave it on consent, but move that there be a communication with the community in December, a Zoom, uh, uh, a Zoom presentation explaining where we are in the process and addressing any and all community concerns relative to the communication process specifically. Item 57, this is to approve an amendment with Amigos de Guadalupe relating to the safe parking services. Colleagues, the reason I asked for this to be pulled out is that you may recall that Supervisor Otto Lee and I brought forward a request for examination for expansion of safe parks. And actually, Supervisor Allenberg, you asked us to even look in your community as well. I wanted to make sure that the Amigos de Guadalupe were um, included in that search process and that there would be flexibility, if necessary, to provide, um, uh, to partner with current service providers for these new locations. I had an opportunity to discuss that with Dr. Smith and he assured me that would be the case. So I will put it on consent, asking staff to make sure that occurs. And those are all of my changes. Thank you very much, Suraj Chavez. Okay, for everybody following at home, and Nancy, that means you in particular, we have those changes. Do we have any other comments? I see no other hand. I see a hand raised by Vice President Ellenberg. Please go right ahead. Thank you so much. Um, just a, a couple um, items on uh, 52 uh, regarding the COVID uh, recovery activities. I appreciate the report. There are just three items I'd like to highlight for follow-up, please. Uh, and it can stay on consent. Uh, first, in the discussion of the access and function needs and multi-agency coordination group, I didn't see disability rights partners on the list of stakeholders um, and would like to make sure that uh, we, we coordinate with the team that's building out the Office of Disability Affairs to identify partners for that, please. Uh, second, now that the City of San Jose is making progress on their recovery priorities, I'd like to request uh, that a future quarterly report include areas of city and county partnership or coordination. And third, I'm very glad to see that there's progress in filing the additional public health infrastructure uh, positions. I do remain concerned about sustainability, though, of those positions after uh, the grant ends in about a year. So I'd like to request that a status report on federal, state, or local resources to extend these positions uh, be included in the mid-year and annual budget discussions this year. I just want to confirm that all of that is clear to administration. Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, we're having yeah. a problem here. Can you repeat the last part of it? Sure, the third, um, it was first an acknowledgement that I'm glad, very glad to see that there's progress in filling the additional public health infrastructure positions, but I'm concerned about how we sustain those positions um, after the grant ends. So I wanna request that a status report on federal, state, and local resources to extend these positions be included in the mid-year and the annual uh, budget discussions this year. Will do. Great, thank you so much. And uh, just a quick comment on item 65 regarding the um, Board of Supervisors uh, meetings that have been scheduled. I, I have raised uh, these concerns with the, with the clerk of the board and I fully understand their reluctance to make changes to a very complicated schedule or schedule back-to-back -back meetings. But I just wanted to note that the September 27th proposed meeting date falls on the second day of Rosh Hashanah and the October 4th meeting falls on the eve of Yom Kippur. I am only one of five supervisors and frankly, I have the prerogative to say that I won't attend a meeting on the 27th and that I'll need to leave by 3 p.m. on the 4th but I was thinking about 
Jewish County staff members who may not enjoy that flexibility and who may be expected to prepare for a board meeting on the first day of the Jewish New Year and attend a meeting on the second. Um, I know that we stand for equity and we celebrate diversity and I know that living in a very diverse county presents challenges along with many, many, many benefits. But I think that acknowledging the conflicts and trying our best to work around them is important. I want to be clear that I'm not asking for a change for 2022, but would ask that the Jewish High Holidays be taken into consideration when scheduling meetings going forward. Thank That's you. all Thank I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to ask that items 73 and 74 <clears throat> come off the consent calendar. Uh, I've given uh, the appropriate staff a heads up that I have a couple of questions, and I think those are my only requests uh, now that we've made our way through the consent calendar. All right, thank you very much. See no other hands. Nancy, I'm gonna to turn to you just to confirm the items that have now been um, removed. I would start with item number 11, item 12, item 18, item 21, item 24, and then we will hear items 73 and 74 um, under item 25. Do you concur? I also have 69, 70, and 71. Did I? That's correct. And Supervisor Chavez, you, you still have 69, 70, and 71 to be heard together. That's correct. And item 22 also. And oops, let me flick back to item 22 is being heard. That Yes, I, I've got that one on there. Supervisor Submitting. Thank you. I'm not sure I heard 7374, which was the yes. request I made just a moment ago. I'll, yes, and then are. you you mentioned 18, Mr. Chair, but I believe it's being added to consent rather than removed from consent. That's correct. Thank you. It's being added to consent. Right. The numbers I listed first were not going to be heard under the regular schedule, but thank you for the clarification. Item 16 is being approved under consent. And the items that will be heard under 25, items previously removed from the consent calendar, are 69, 70, and 71 together per Supervisor Chavez, and then 70 and 74 per Supervisor Submitting. Nancy, how does that sound? And thank you, Peters, for the correction. And forgive me, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I, I, it's 73 and 74 are yes. the two that I've asked to remove. Yes. And, and I may have misheard on the computer, but I think you said, item 16 when you meant item 18 uh, being added to consent. Item 18 is, yes, added to consent. 16 stays as is. And again, the items under 25 will be 69, 70, 71, 73, and 74. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Nancy, how does that sound to you? That sounds great. That's what I have. Okay, so with that, I, I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar and changes as has been detailed. Do I have a second? Second by Chavez. And I just wanted to um, reinforce what Supervisor Ellenberg said on item 65 around our calendar and would like to see that ad addressed in the coming year. Thank you. It's, um, it, it's certainly a significant issue and I also appreciate Supervisor El Vice President Ellenberg bringing up the, the respect of other um, religions and entities as, as well. It's a tough thing to do in scheduling, but that's certainly something we will look at, absolutely. So we've got a motion and a second. No further hands. Nancy, take a vote quick, please. Would you like to take public comment before we do the vote? On, <laughs> boy, I'm really not on my game today. Thank you. Yes, we'll have public comment, and um, we'll we'll do two minutes each. Our first speaker is Al Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Uh, um, it's all right, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. I'm I'm Mexican. I'm from San Jose. We're we're used to it. We're used to uh, uh, being ignored by both county and city governments. And there's been a, a a history of that in this city. My comments are restricted to uh, land use issues and the failure for both the county and the city to use the redlining maps to determine uh, districting issues, okay? Because those redlining maps affected those decisions that we're like dealing with today. Secondly is school allocations, resources for those schools, park deficits, uh, infrastructure uh, investments. You know, we have an infrastructure bill coming in and, and that was passed. So there's, there's going to be billions of dollars coming to this area. Okay, and when we neglect to use that redlining map with respect to land usage, land purchases, and how do we counterbalance the generational impacts of the deprivations that that redlining map created? I don't know if anybody on this council has read the documents. I have, I have them. And they were produced, they weren't produced by the uh, federal government. They were produced by city and county employees. And by creating those maps, it sustained a lot of the systemic and institutionalized racism that we're dealing with today. So to look at a particular issue today with respect to poverty, um, schools, or housing, and not see it through the lens of that redlining map and its generational consequences, I think is very irresponsible because you'll never get to what equity really means when you don't acknowledge that. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Largen. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, kind of cut out of work to uh, hop in the car and uh, do a quick, uh, quick hauler out and begging for uh, safe parking programs. You guys have uh, several items on here on the consent calendar to get today um, involving increasing the money that's going to these nonprofits. Um, I'm still trying to find the unicorn. Where, where is the magical safe parking programs? Uh, I, I, I can't find them. I can't find them for people that are sober. I can't find them for seniors. I can't find them for the disabled. I can't find them for women escaping domestic violence. Uh, where are they? And it's obvious since everybody is packed, jam packed in that field and all the way around Bellarmine, we, we know where they're at. I, I think, well, this is a humanitarian disaster. I, I'm asking for you guys to act. I need a board of action right now. I think it's, uh, I think it's time to open up the fairgrounds right now and, and take this thing seriously. <clears throat> Seeing this unfold firsthand is shocking. Pregnant women getting COVID using one port john for hundreds of people, uh, that, that, that is shocking. Women having babies in trailers is unbelievable. Women escaping domestic violence out there. Uh, the mentally ill just doing things that are the most bizarre stuff you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, it's time, it's, it's been time like years ago. Um, get off of Zoom. Okay, get in your nice fancy Mercedes Benzes and drive down the street and see this. Some of you elected officials have made your way out there because I gave you the tour. Okay, the rest of you, it, it, it's more than time. Please do something. Come in. Sorry about that, had myself muted. Next speaker is Molly M. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Molly McLeod, and I want to um, thank Supervisor Ellenberg for um, the statements and observation about item 52, access and functional needs, and the importance of making sure that disability-led and disability-serving organizations are um, included in the planning process as well as people with disabilities and appreciate very much the linkage to the um, future Office of Disability Affairs. Just 
stating the words disability and connecting it with the, the county is making that awareness grow deeper about the connections and the work that needs to be done. Um, I've been participating on the access and functional needs um, county's sub working group led by Silicon Valley Independent Living Center um, for the last two years. And one thing that I uh, did recently was a public records request to all of the jurisdictions in the county. And um, amazingly, um, there are parts of the county that don't know that there's any obligation to include people with disabilities in the planning and in fact have no responses. I'm gonna be following up sharing the information that I collected with uh, each of the supervisors. My hope is that by next um, November for the Golden Eagle exercise, that people with disabilities will be included in the planning so that when the big earthquake hits, when there are multiple catastrophes and disasters, the lives of those who are disabled are not left behind and left for dead. And I think we're um, along the way of making progress. And again, wanna express my appreciation to the supervisors who have unanimously voted to prioritize um, disability awareness and a deeper learning. Thank you. Thank you. And Nancy, before you proceed, Supervisor Chavez, I just noticed your hand was up. Did you wanna make a comment before we hear from the rest of the speakers? Nope, you're good. Thank you. Nancy, please continue. Next speaker is Alex Shore. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. I wanted to speak on item 55. Is that still on consent? Yes. Okay, great. Well, a, a quick note. It is pretty difficult. I'm sure you've heard this feedback before, supervisors, to track all the items in real time that are getting removed and keeping on consent. And you all know I used to work for the Board of Supervisors, so if it's hard for me, it must be even harder for some other folks in the public. And I, I'm just wondering if the clerk's office or a supervisor, perhaps through a referral, could consider a way to display this information in real time so us as community members could be able to track this a little bit easier and figure out whether we're going to be getting the joy of spending our day with you or if an item's being deferred and we might be able to revisit you in the future. Uh, wanted to check in on item 55. This is a site that Catalyze SV members care a lot about. We have already had our members evaluate the housing authorities part of the site, and we are excited to see affordable housing in this part of town and this site, both from the housing authority and hopefully it sounds like today moving forward from the county as well. We do want to note that the RFQ talks about the goal is to maximize the supportive and ELI units on subject sites. And we have seen, including projects you'll be hearing again later today, uh, developers in the face of some community opposition, uh, reducing the number of homes, decreasing the heights. And that is something our members do not want to see. We want to see as much affordable housing built as possible. So the, ref, uh, the item also talks about District 2 and the Housing Authority coordinating ongoing outreach efforts in connection with the Santa Clara Street site. I think our members would enjoy scoring this proposal from core companies and Eden Housing to good affordable housing developers. So I'll be following up with Supervisor Chavez's office to see if uh, that's something we can do as well as with our, our dedicated housing staff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Our next speaker is Tina Brown. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, this is Tina Brown and I am a system impacted family member with Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm calling in to show support and thank Supervisor Ellenberg's request to holding and moving items 11 and 12. The report is vague and incomplete. It disregards the community input and most importantly, leaves out the voices of those community members caged up inside our county jail, which defeats the purpose of their participation as being a vital and driving force of the process. There must be some further explanation given as to why the county executive's response is entertaining the idea of building a max security jail after the murder of Michael Tyree, numerous hunger strikes, huge lawsuit payouts, multiple COVID-19 outbreaks, and the board's previous declaration to eliminate systemic and institutional racial inequities. 
this recommendation is outright racist. It's insulting and a slap in the face to those with lived experience and for those that are working very hard to bring positive change in this space. I thank you for my time, for your time. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that and all those that spoke. Um, we'll now please call for a vote. We have a motion by Wasserman, a second by Chavez. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Supervisor Simidian? He's muted at the moment. Why don't you continue? We'll come back to him. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. And Supervisor Simidian? All right, he might have stepped away. Let's move on to item number nine, Nancy. And uh, item number nine is a public hearing to consider the purchase of real property at 3090. Oh, we may have Supervisor Smithian. Supervisor, forgive me, I was muted. I, I'm an I vote. Thank you. So we have a 5 0 um, unanimous approval of the consent calendar as revised. We now move on to item number nine, a public hearing to be heard no earlier than 10 o'clock. It is now 11 o'clock, so we've handled that. I'm going to open the public hearing and I'm going to turn to Consuelo and who I see here and Mr. Jeffrey Draper, who may or may not be here. Consuelo, if you can hold just a minute, I'm gonna open the public hearing here. And Nancy, if you'll please recognize our speakers and they can have one minute each. First speaker is Alex Shore. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Alex, can you Hello. please mute? Oh, there you go. Hey, this is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV again. Our members actually had a chance to score this project 3090 South Bascom uh, er earlier this year and scored it a 3.83 out of five which means we would like to see it go forward. It, it scored well on some of the community engagement uh, aspects. Um, we did wonder a little bit about if we could make it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, the commercial space is a little small, our members felt. And we also were wondering about the intensity zoning. The item on your agenda talks about the reduced heights of the project. Uh, Catalyze SV members were very supportive of higher heights and more homes. Uh, if something is gonna be an investment of the county of this much money, we believe the county should continue to push for projects that will build as many homes as possible. And we are supporting this action today from the county soups. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe again. The uh, redlining maps, um, when we're talking about equity and we're talking about um, um, dealing with, you know, systemic institutionalized racism that we, we identify generally, but there's the specificity of how that manifests in our community over generations. That piece has not been articulated, but yet we're making decisions and we're saying that we uphold these particular principles and we acknowledge that these systems have impacted Chicanos, they've impacted Blacks, they've impacted uh, uh, the Asian community. That when we say that and we don't go to where the root, the modern root of that, which is the red line map, then we're doing a disservice to the very people that we say that we're applying those principles of equity, inclusion, and diversity. And so those headlines. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you. So I opened the public hearing and we received uh, public testimony. I am now closing the public hearing. Consuelo, we have you here. Do you have a report or are you here for questions from the board members 
which we'll start off with Supervisor Chavez. Consuelo, do you have anything to uh, say first? Uh, good morning, Board President Wasserman and members of the board. Just wanted to share uh, three points. Um, the project did receive its full entitlements in February 2021, following some intensive um, community engagement. On August 11th, they secured all of the necessary financing, including a tax credit allocation. Um, and then the construction is scheduled to begin in February 2022. And happy to take any questions. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And um, wow, well done. That's very fast. So thank you for all that and working so closely with the community as well. Um, I just had one question and it had to do with the length of the delegation of authority. It, it has it through um, 2026. And what's curious to me about that, especially given the fast track this is on, um, why, why do we have the delegation of authority over such a long period of time? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. We allow for enough time to convert the project from its construction financing into its permanent financing. Uh -huh. Um, so typically that will take a, a year after the project is fully leased up and um, complete. Um, and so we ask for that five year um, delegation. Thank you. That's very helpful. I should have asked that maybe a hundred votes ago. So thank you. <laughs> All right. And with that satisfaction with the answer, is there a motion in there, Supervisor Chavez? I was going to let Supervisor Ellenberg do this <laughs> and she worked with the community and I'll make a second. That's really happy to to move this forward. Thank you, Consuelo. Thank Second. you. Motion by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Chavez. Seeing no other hands raised. Nancy, will you please call for the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you, Nancy. We now move on to item number 10, keeping Consuelo here with us. I'm going to open the public hearing and once again receive any testimony from anyone of the public wishing to do so. And I see one hand raised. Nancy? Next speaker is Alex Shore. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Just wanted to note that these initial ground lease terms have these options of extending both on this item and the previous item. And our Catalyze This Me members didn't have a chance to score this project from Danko Communities, but have scored another one that the county has been supportive of and has helped fund and want to affirm that support. And also just affirm that I think our members would be really excited to see these options for renewing the ground lease extended beyond the 55 years. I think that's a, a great way to guarantee affordable housing for more years. So kudos to the county and your development partners for looking to build this affordable housing to exist longer for our community. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, hi, my name is Catherine Hedges, 11 District 2, and I'm also a member of Catalyze SV. Um, and I echo everything Alex said. And I also want to say I'm really glad that the county is doing a ground lease rather than selling the public land the way San Jose has been doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. So we've opened public hearing. We've received testimony. I'm now closing public hearing. Closing the public hearing. <sighs> Those three bags of MM got to kick in quickly. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Thank you. I, I did have a question for Consuelo on this. And, um, and what I was interested in better understanding is that um, what happened relative to, to the Danco company um, having to change the project relative to low-income housing tax credits. And I'm just wondering how they had to change it to be more competitive. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I will note that the developer applied five times for tax credits. 
Um, and we got together with the City of San Jose Housing Department, the Housing Authority, to come up with different scenarios that would ultimately keep the project intact in what we had shared with the community before and what the entitlements uh, were approved for. Um, and ultimately, the project is still considered a special needs project by tax credit requirements. Um, and we're leveraging 50% of the units with housing vouchers for households that are at risk of homelessness and the balance of the units for our rapid rehousing program participants. But what, I guess what I'm trying to understand, Consuelo, how was this project not competitive? I, I guess I'm not understanding if the intent, I don't know. I, I, I'm just perplexed and want to better understand understand that I didn't get it from the report. Yeah, apologies, Supervisor Chavez. All, a lot of our projects are not competitive because of the cost of construction. Our region, unfortunately, if you're not in a specific area where you get bonus points for disadvantaged areas, we compete statewide for tax credits. There's a small geographic portion, and then you have to compete within different categories, large family, special needs, and it's highly competitive. Most recently, there's an accelerator program with three of our projects moving forward. And then in December, we have seven projects that will possibly be funded with tax credits. So new money coming in makes our projects more competitive, but we see Supervisor Chavez sometimes 15 or 16 applications with the same score. Wow. wow. So the changing it up, what made it more competitive? And so the change, what made it more competitive? Maybe I didn't ask. Sure. What made it more competitive is it that it went from the way that the state classifies special needs being 100% special needs versus 50% special needs. Got it. All right, well, thank you for that. No other hands raised. Supervisor Chavez, do you wish to make the motion this time? I'll let, I'll go behind Supervisor Ellenberg again. Go ahead, Susan. <laughs> Happy to go either way, but I will, will move approval on this second D4 project today. Thank you. Second, Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. Motion by, by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Chavez. No other hands raised. Nancy, please call the vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Aye. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Present. Aye. There we go. That's the third <laughs> time. <laughs> Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Supervisor Smitty, and the secret is to buy more little bags of M&Ms at Halloween than what you might need. And then you have ones left over, but you didn't buy them for yourself. You bought them for others. So it's a, a no guilt kind of thing. The ghost of Supervisor Yeager hangs heavily over our office that I would never never encourage such behavior, even if I might indulge from time to time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, that was item 10. Item 11 was is being held to January 11th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Item 12 is also being held to January 11th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Item 13 regarding redistricting is to be heard no earlier than 2 p.m., which is three hours from now. So we will do that then. We now turn to item 14. Let me just flip my binder over to item 14. And Supervisor Simidian, uh, regarding the Mental Health Systems Navigator Program, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, I will just move the recommended action. If I, there is a second, I will then speak briefly. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, this is a notion that um, had been rattling around in the back of my head for some time. And I, um, it, it, I became more and more convinced at the need for what I've characterized as a mental health uh, systems navigator as we had the conversations in the community around AOT, Assisted Outpatient Treatment, also known as Laura's Law. And I, I think, you know, all of us who have worked in this uh, arena on mental health issues know the pain and the anguish that people feel when they are at, you know, wit's end trying to access the system, which can be complicated and confusing and bureaucratic in spite of our best efforts. 
that involves not just our own county organization, but our uh, partners in the community and uh, private sector who provide services as well. Um, tragically, I had a phone call just a week ago from someone who uh, desperately needed help, and I ended up being the informal navigator on a Friday night uh, with the help, I should say, of our behavioral health staff. Thank you again to them. But it, it was so poignant to me because it was a reminder of just how challenging uh, this arena can be uh, when all of a sudden, or maybe over an extended period of time, there's a moment when someone needs help is um, perhaps less able than ever to ask for that help and is confronting a very challenging system if a system it is. So very simply, the recommended action is to ask our administration to report back to us in three months with option for the creation of a mental health systems navigator program. The only thing I want to be clear about is I want these to be dedicated resources specific to the navigator function, not service providers, because I worry that uh, service provision will always crowd out the assistance that I am hoping a navigator or navigator function can provide. So again, uh, thank you. And the only other thing I would say, Mr. Chair, is I know we had some late arriving letters. So colleagues, if you haven't seen them, I would turn your attention to the letters of support for which I say thank you from the Children's Health Council, Momentum Health, Behavioral Health Contractors Association, uh, folks at uh, NAMI as well, uh, cutting uh, Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County, uh, the Macon Community Center and Aki. Thank you to them for the work they do, but also thank you for their support. I was pleased to see that they share the view that this is a, uh, a really uh, helpful step if we uh, can uh, move it along. Thank you. I'll second it. You, you may have my second, Supervisor Lee. I, I second it already. I'm giving it oh, over I'm sorry. to you. That's that's okay. I've had years of seconds. You're just starting on seconds. <laughs> so, did you have further comment to make before we uh, turn to our public, Supervisor Lee? Nope. Nope. I think, uh, okay, Supervisor, Supervisor Chavez. Chavez. said it best. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'll wait till after the public, and then if you could come back to me. Thank you, Nancy. How much time would you like us to allow? Uh, a minute each is fine. Perfect. First speaker is Mary Gloner. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Thank you, President Wasserman, the Board of Supervisors, and especially to you, Supervisor Sabinian, for continuing to be our behavioral health champion. My name is Mary Gloner. I'm the CEO for Project Safety Net, but I'm a community health educator at heart. As we all know, patient navigation has been essential, especially like promotoras, lay health workers, community health outreach workers, effective in navigating primary care, whether it's HIV AIDS, diabetes, breast and cervical care, and women's health. And as a person who has um, health experience, I know, and many of my colleagues, the challenge of navigating a healthcare system. And so can you only imagine our, our general community that don't have resources and access? So very excited uh, for this uh, to really look at the whole um, well-being and we'll be there to support um, this effort to make it possible for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a resident of Just Route 2, and um, I am completely unable to navigate any kind of health system related to the county. Um, I have been trying to get treatment for a specific medical problem that is covered by Medicare since May, and I've been given all kinds of wrong referrals to places say, oh, well, if you have, you know, they'll keep me waiting for months, say, oh, well, if you have Medicare, you're not eligible. And then another place, they've been telling me, oh, we'll talk about that next week for months and months. And finally, I had a meeting with the boss like, no, we cannot give you a referral for this health problem. Well, then why have I been going here for four months? And it's a total mess. We need this not just for mental health, although that's extremely valuable, but we need it for physical health care too. 
um, Valiumad is utterly unhelpful if patients have anything serious. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. I'll turn now to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to say um, a, um, thank you to Supervisor Simidian for bringing this forward. And just two requests, um, if you're comfortable with this, uh, Supervisor Simidian. One is that um, I am I'm very interested in us streamlining, streamlining, lining, sorry, God, Mike, I've been spending too much time with you this morning, streamlining um, our um, our phone numbers, uh, because the, the number of numbers you have to call to get uh, information is, um, is very overwhelming, especially in the mental health space. And so I, I just want to reinforce for staff that in addition to looking at navigators that we concurrently have to look at how to make the system easier to access because frankly, we shouldn't need nav navigators. Um, in some instances, I think we would need advocates because you know this, the, the issues are complicated, but, but I really want to see us um, moving to reducing the number of, of phone numbers that one has to call to get help at, concurrent to looking at this, how, how do we simplify the system? Um, and then the other thing I'll just add is that, you know, the county has been working on the Child Diagnostic Center for a while, and a core component of that diagnostic center is to make sure that we have um, advocates. And when the report comes back on, on um, this, I just would want to better understand from staff their understanding of a, a navigator versus an advocate, or if in some ways that is seen as similar. Um, I am happy to incorporate, I am happy to incorporate both requests in the motion, but with the caveat that I do not want those two additional requests to delay the report back or action on the pure navigator program. I certainly support um, anything we can do to simplify the system. Uh, and um, I think it is important to understand and be clear about the distinction between an advocate and a navigator. But right now, what I'm asking for and I'm hoping I get um, support for is a clear path forward for a navigator program that comes back to us from staff in three months. And I, and I don't want, uh, and if, if there's any delay colleagues on those other two items, uh, I don't want that to delay the uh, report back and uh, with options for action uh, on the navigator. With that understanding, happy to incorporate it. And Supervisor Chavez, uh, as you were speaking, I just recall a, a favorite quote from the late Walter Cronkite broadcaster back in the day, uh, who uh, you may have heard me reference before, who said, I don't know why we call it a healthcare system. It isn't healthy, it isn't caring, and it sure as hell isn't a system. And um, I, I just, you know, we struggle with that so often in spite of people's best efforts and intentions. So um, I am, uh, fully supportive of anything we can do to simplify the system, but I think we're going to need navigators for a long time to come, uh, as much as I wish I didn't have to say that. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you are not in agreement? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, you have a second. You agree with what the first just said? Absolutely. Thank and I think it's definitely time. I thank a Supervisor Smidian for his leadership for putting this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I call for the vote, the navigator word, Supervisor Smidian, I thought was a great word. I recently went through a system with uh, Medicare regarding the D card for prescriptions for my mother. And it was extremely frustrating over the number of days. And a navigator through our mental health system, I think will be a wonderful addition to our mental health system. I will also say our system, while, while it might be complicated for the public to get to where they want to get, I think a navigator will help make that easier. I think that's great. But I will say, I think our system as a whole medically is absolutely fantastic and fabulous once you get into it. The services that 
are provided by the Santa Clara County Medical Health System are, I think, world class. And I know my fellow supervisors agree that's not the issue being addressed here. The issue is how do you navigate to get to where you want to go. And Supervisor Smitty and I echo what Supervisor Lee said, thank you for bringing this to a formal action. I think this will benefit a lot of people probably forever. Uh, with that, Nancy, I'll call for the vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? I'm sorry, Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. We now go to item 15, which is our report from our county exec, Dr. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I wanted to speak a little bit today about the uh, COVID outbreak at our jail system. You've uh, heard from us a number of times about a significant outbreak. Um, we're now uh, counting about 154 uh, inmates uh, who have been positive. Um, we have uh, initiated with the help of the courts and the DA and the public defender efforts to release as many um, inmates that are at risk or positive as possible. Um, we're continuing to do that. We're also isolating uh, uh, positive inmates and uh, separating uh, individuals who have come in contact with positive cases um, and we're uh, keeping close track of their symptoms. Uh, at this point, uh, that's pretty much all I can give you as an update. So with that, I'll end my report. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I've got a question for you and then Supervisor Smith, you go ahead first. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, you and I spoke yesterday uh, afternoon and I indicated that I had just learned that our county was um, making arrangements for vaccination uh, visits to um, uh, schools throughout the county. Uh, my understanding is there are 97 such visits and vaccination efforts uh, scheduled for the months of November and December uh, at 50 schools, if I am correctly informed. Uh, I am also informed, however, that those 97 visits at 50 schools include not a single school in the 5th Super Resorial District. Do you have a comment on that? That's zero out of 97 visits, as I understand it. Yeah, I am. Um can give you a general update and then we have a representative from public health for further detail. The general update was that the decisions to rank um, schools into two levels, level one and level two, was based on their perceived risk and it was done using uh, zip codes. And as we know from our experience with uh, COVID uh, process and particularly the statewide disparity efforts that if you use zip codes, you get a much different outlook than if you use uh, census tracts or districts or any other boundary. So in summation, um, it was an attempt to try to focus on high risk areas. It was a mistake. We we're trying to fix the uh, equity at this point. And uh, if you have further questions, I think Dr. Uh, Sarah Cody is online to give you some more detail. I think what I will do, Mr. Chairman, is um, in respect to the Brown Act, since this is not an agendized item at our meeting, um, I will just indicate that the notion that 97 visits at 50 schools would include not a single school in um, one fifth of the county uh, with 400,000 folks and probably more than 50,000 young people um, is a notion I find wholly unacceptable. Um, I, I will let it go at that given the fact that this is not an agendized item, but I will note that we have a regularly scheduled meeting of our health and hospital committee 
uh, tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. Um, we will, of course, be getting our uh, routine monthly report on COVID matters at that time. And so I would just ask that Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody be ready to discuss the issue more fully at that time and hopefully offer some uh, path forward um, that uh, is acceptable uh, and um, appropriate. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'm very sure that at the meeting tomorrow, the two doctors will have a list of the other schools in District 5 that will be on the schedule. Supervisor yeah. Chavez, you were we'll next. I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Smith, go ahead. I'm just saying we'll fix it. Yep, I, I figured as much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, Supervisor Lee was before me. My oh, go ahead, this one, Cindy. Um, you know what I what I was going to ask. I was actually going to ask you this, Chair. Is when when are we hearing um, uh, COVID nineteen back on our with our full board again? I have not discussed that with administration. Um, I'll be happy to do that later this week, and uh, we can add it on for the next agenda if you'd like. I would, and the reason is that um, I think that these discussions are really very important and should be discussed by the full board. And um, and I appreciate that committees are great to dive in deep, um, but I think on issues like this, and especially as you know, because I think we're going to have a little more results about who's getting vaccinated and from from where. Um, that that ha having a strong understanding of that information will be very important as the board makes decisions for future resources. So I really want to encourage us to hear it at uh, the uh, next meeting if we can. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly very disconcerting to see the uh, outbreak uh, from the jail this time uh, and again, and we've had quite a few of these. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to ask uh, Dr. Smith, what type of additional strategies we can do in terms of trying to vaccinate uh, both the those incarcerated and also the correctional officers because the data we've been receiving is that that's actually one group uh, of folks who have been lacking on, on, on getting the vaccination. And then the other question is regarding the booster shots. Now that we're giving all booster shots 18 and above, what are we also pushing forward on that as well in the incarcerated uh, a setting. So if we could get some type of, um, um, uh, it could be off agenda, it could be a verbal report back to us. I certainly would appreciate it of what we are doing to try to uh, get that under control. Um, second issue is regarding um, the South County uh, vaccinations. I know we do have Monday through Friday, uh, but apparently there's no weekend um, uh, county uh, vaccination the, uh, being a, a, available for some of some South County residents. And given the need right now, uh, I was just at a uh, uh, site uh, this Saturday in, in, uh, in Sunnyvale, uh, in the mobile home park, and it was extreme, extremely popular. There was a line around the corner, uh, parents bring the kids, the parents getting the booster shot, the kids getting the first shot, five to 11. It's really a great, uh, great scene on weekends. So I do think weekends are a really good place to outreach. And so we also know that uh, Gilroy certainly is one location where the, the uh, a number of uh, vaccinations uh, are, are lower and also some of the case rates early on. So I would just want to ask if we could uh, ask public health to see if they can deploy some resources to uh, Gilroy and Morgan Hill uh, on the weekends. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And before Dr. Smith, I recognize you. Supervisor Chavez, one correction I should make is that we currently have the COVID report scheduled for every other board meeting because that's that's where we are. So it's already scheduled for the next meeting. And Thank I appreciate you. Dr. Smith saying, telling me that. Dr. Smith, did you have additional comments? Well, I was going to make that clear, but then um, I also will address uh, Supervisor Lee's um, concern. Um, we um, do have uh, resources for vaccination in South County. Yep. Um, we are planning to increase the availability there. So we'll give you an off agenda about times and amounts and dates and all of that, because I don't have those off the top of my head, but we'll do that to the board off agenda. In terms of uh, the question about boosters, 
we are uh, giving boosters to anybody who is an adult who's received their completed series uh, in the appropriate time period, which is six months um, after their last uh, shot. And uh, we'll, we're doing that countywide. Yep. Just for general information, we're also having significant success with uh, uh, juvenile in shots over the last couple of days. It's been in the two range. Um, so that's a good thing. And we're seeing participation from the uh, community um, physicians also, as well as our close partners and community clinics. So we'll give you more detail about that on and off agenda. Thank you. Yes, the response countywide for children and unvaccinated adults or adults getting booster shots has been absolutely tremendous. It started off with that kickoff where we did 14,000 kids over the second weekend, which was amazing. And we have numbers coming from all of our partners. I see people lined up at pharmacies. I hear about people at Stanford Kaiser everywhere else as well. The response from the residents of Santa Clara County is enormous meeting this third metric. And I'm very excited to hear at our next meeting about uh, if we've reached all three metrics and, and ending the masking. Um, Sumas Chavez, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment? I just wanted to ask a follow-up question, um, um, Dr. Smith, as it relates to the jails. And that is that I was curious about the vaccination rates of our, our staff that are in the jails. If, if you know the answer to that. I don't know the exact number right offhand. I know we were having some significant problems with uh, encouraging correctional deputies to get vaccinated. However, with the deadline that came up on November 1st, uh, we did have a rush of individuals getting vaccination and we're working through the reasonable accommodation process uh, for those individuals who've made a um, request for a waiver. Um, I can get you the numbers uh, later on in the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. That would be great for both the sheriffs and the um, uh, and the and our correctional deputies. Thank you very much. Vice you. President Allen. Oh, sorry. One other thing, just as a follow up, uh, the immunization rate for inmates is challenging to keep track of because we have um, quite a bit of churn of low level individuals. Um, and so our rates really are um, changing on a day to day, moment to moment basis, depending on new bookings and new discharges. Um, but for those individuals who are admitted, uh, everyone is offered an opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, we obviously can't force them to be vaccinated and we're focused on um, the individuals um, who have either long sentences or have been with us for quite some time to make sure we um, get as many of those individuals vaccinated as possible. It's much harder to deal with the individuals who are gone in a week. I think the board knows that um, well over 80% of our uh, clients are released uh, within two weeks of having been booked. So that makes it a challenging thing to get them vaccinated within two weeks. Thank you. Vice President Allenberg. Thanks so much. I want to um, just just stay with the, the custody COVID concerns for a moment. Uh, Dr. Smith, you, you mentioned, I think in response to Supervisor Lee, that there's uh, some collaboration happening between the district attorney and the courts and probation around increasing that pretrial release. Is there a, a formalized plan or who would be the right, um, well, I'll just a a ask you if the board could get uh, an off agenda report on what that collaboration looks like and what the what the criteria are or the plan is for, for um, expediting or expanding the release. Yes, we can certainly get to the details. Uh, it's actually not 
we're also, well, let me back up. I wasn't specifically referring to pretrial release. I was talking about um, release of current inmates. And basically um, what we're doing is working with the DA and the courts and the public defender to identify individuals who are close to the end of their sentence or who for other reasons can easily be released um, and uh, releasing them as quickly as possible. It's uh, quite labor intensive and I certainly can give you an off agenda with more details uh, that will help. At the same time, we are trying to maximize the pretrial release in addition and maximize our pretrial efforts to keep individuals out of the justice system right. as much sure. as possible. So it's on both sides of the process. Thank you so much for that. So much of my attention has been focused on the, the pretrial, but it's interesting to hear that there's a good number of um, people post-conviction who can be, you said, easily and safely released. Certainly we should be doing this for COVID purposes, but I would also like to think that well beyond the pandemic and separate from it, if there are people in our system, in our custody, who can be easily and safely released, that should certainly be the normative practice. Yes, I would agree. And I I think we'll delve into that quite a bit more in January on the 11th when we talk about trying to maximize our efforts to both keep people away from the justice system, get them out of it as quickly as possible. As you know, you and I have talked about how we could um, create a continuum of care that really maximizes our efforts to keep people away from the justice system. Mm -hmm. system basis. And it will require um, quite a bit of cooperation from the courts and the DA and the public defender and, and police, but uh, we'll make it happen. Absolutely. Looking forward to that conversation. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand still raised. Did you have another comment? Uh, yes, I do. A uh, couple of things. <laughs> One is, I guess, with Dr. Smith is uh, when you say folks coming and booking, uh, we cannot force anybody to uh, get vaccinated, but I'm not sure if that's a question that's being asked is whether they are vaccinated or not. Certainly, anywhere you go to these days, uh, people are checking our vaccination status. So if at booking, I hope they do ask that question. Number one, if they are not, then absolutely make it very easy uh, available so that they could actually get the least to vaccination or booster. So I just want to add that as something that if that's something that is feasible to do, I think it will be a great opportunity to get more people uh, vaccinated, number one. Number two is about the Johnson Johnson outreach. Uh, unfortunately, the so-called one and done does not seem to work as well as based on the data. Uh, and I just want to know if we are keeping track of any of those Johnson Johnson vaccinated individuals and if we're actually able to outreach to them to let them know that they could get their uh, boosters uh, ASAP and they don't need to wait six months. There's a lot of confusion on the dates, like two months, six months, whatever, but frankly, from my understanding, if you've gotten your Johnson Johnson, you practically can get your boosters only after two months. Um, and the fact that they can get any uh, other type of uh, uh, boosters like Moderna or Pfizer as well. So I just want to check to see if there's any efforts in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, yeah. go ahead and answer those. Okay, well, the first question about booking, yes, everyone's asked when they come into booking whether they've been vaccinated or not, and, and if they have not been, they're offered the um, opportunity to be vaccinated immediately. Of course, Great. that would be just the first dose, but yes, we are doing that. Um, in terms of the question about Johnson & Johnson in the general community, we're trying to encourage people who have receive Johnson & Johnson to go ahead and get Moderna or um, mm -hmm. Pfizer um, and do a series. Um, and that's certainly in the communication. We have not um, created a system to find individuals with Johnson & Johnson to notify them, but we are doing outreach 
All right. Yeah. Yeah, if there's anything like an email records of uh, individuals got Johnson Johnson, that would be a fairly uh, low cost and easy way to outreach to them. So I just want to see if this is something that's feasible. If you could look at that, uh, Dr. Smith, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I think everybody is aware right now the why booster is so important is because it turns out these vaccines do wane, right? We have waning problems. So after six months, eight months or so, uh, the vaccines are not as powerful, as strong as they used to be, the 90 odd percent that we've been advertising, right, for Pfizer and Moderna. So um, and, and with the uh, pending winter that we're seeing, uh, if you look at the map of the United States, all the outbreaks currently are all in the northern part of our, in the central part of our country, which shows that weather, uh, colder weather certainly is a big factor uh, on how active COVID is. And now that folks are having waning immunity, the, 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 the boosters are here. So it is so important to get people out there. And frankly, many people who've been vaccinated two times fully vaccinated, I think is developing this like a cause a false sense of security. Uh, so I think there's actually quite a bit of work we need to do to get people understanding the importance of getting boosters. Thank you, Doc Smith. Thank you. And that no, Supervisor Chavez. Thanks. And I Dr. Smith, you may have answered this and I missed it, but does that mean for folks who are in custody now, um, that we have a plan for booster shots, especially those who have been long-term with us and also flu shots. And if if not, um, perhaps at the committee tomorrow, you could talk a little bit about how you see that unfolding. Yes, we already have a plan for uh, booster shots and we always uh, do uh, flu shots um, for inmates who are with us for a significant period of time or who are due for their boosters. But we can explain that some more in the health and hospital. But yes, we do that. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, that'd be great just to get the timeline tomorrow. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Smith, I'll just close with, you know, you're mentioning 80% of the people there, I think you said we're only there for a couple of weeks. And with not being able to force a vaccine upon people, um, you've got people coming in, going, spreading the vaccine or contract, excuse me, I'm sorry. spreading the virus or contracting the virus. I think it's under you. And that's really problematic. And hearing 154 people have it right now, that's problematic. Not being able to isolate each and every person because of not enough room, that's problematic. Um, you're dealing with a huge issue. And I appreciate the fact that each and every person who walks through those doors is asked if they've been vaccinated. And if it's been the sufficient amount of time, asked if they want a booster. And if they haven't been vaccinated, asked if they want a vaccine right there. That's, that's all that we can do per the law. So thank you for that. With that, board members, I'm going to turn to our county counsel, James Williams, for a report of uh, his department in closed session. There are no reportable actions taken at the closed session of November 15th, 2021. That concludes my report. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Was that for Dr. Smith or is that for James? No, you were just waving at me? Okay. All right, that was item 16. We now move on to item 17. We should have our CEO of the hospital, Paul Lorenz here for a monthly report on our Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Good morning, oh. President uh, Wasserman and members of the board. Good morning. Um, I have three points, all of which is uh, included in your written report. Uh, the first is the quality metrics that are reported quarterly to your board. Uh, we are seeing improvement in the colorectal cancer screening, um, as well as in the diabetes area. Uh, we are focused on depression, um, and we do have uh, what I believe a clear, clear path forward to improve those uh, screening metrics, if you will. SB 1152, your board did request an update on how we're performing relative to that regulatory requirement. Um, this is the requirement that we document not only homelessness, but also the medical uh, care provided and support services such as medication, uh, meals, transportation, and clothing. Uh, since we've implemented a new workflow utilizing EPIC, our health link EHR, uh, we are seeing significant improvements at all three hospitals in terms of our compliance. Uh, then with respect to medical respite, your board did ask for an update on the number of 
referrals coming from hospitals. Uh, clearly, Valley Medical Center and O'Connor are the top referrals uh, uh, coming into medical respite. Um, at this point in time, we have about 10 to 15 clients in our medical respite at any given time. The, I think the important thing to note on these numbers is that these numbers are lower than in, uh, lower in terms of prior reporting periods. Uh, much of that is due to COVID, where the other hospitals have uh, reduced the number of elective cases that they were doing. Uh, but we are seeing numbers increasing in terms of the referrals coming into the medical respite program. Uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the report. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, I see your hand raised. We also have a speaker. Would you like to speak before the speaker or after the speaker? I'm happy to wait until after the speaker. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, same question to you after the speaker. Nancy, would you please allow our speakers in? Yes. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, may I uh, speak on the last item? There was no public comment on it. Uh, there, there is no public comment, Paul, on either the uh, CEO or the county council. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, well, then, with respect to with respect to this item, and I'm just I'm very concerned about equity in the way that we are. Uh, trying to apply that principle with respect to the allocation of resources and and uh, uh, decisions within the departments. I think that it was a perfect example that was given by uh, Supervisor Submidian that 57 schools had received vaccinations for children, but the east side was like left out of that. I mean, this is, these are, these are like serious, serious problems that need to be corrected. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting. Uh, thanks for this item. I just wanted to um, try to remind uh, the, the ideas of uh, the importance of mask use coming up at this holiday time. and. Um, that it's quite possible that, uh, you know, we could have a rise in COVID cases again uh, this winter. Um, good luck. I, you know, I'm trying to learn the language of, of, try to, of trying to ask how we can uh, prepare ourselves. Uh, how can we talk about the future of the, of the vaccine process and, and what it's about? Uh, it's lifestyle choices that it can offer ourselves and, and what we'll be living with. Uh, I hope we can consider that as we're uh, introducing the vaccine process to children at this time, and that we can consider the open technology, open public policies with technology practices uh, that can help uh, offer good conversations for this subject matter. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, thanks for the report and particularly for the efforts uh, to improve the reporting of supports provided to patients under the SB 1152 requirements. From the additional data that you now have available on patient acceptance of supports and staff screening of patient needs, do you know if the BHHP team has identified areas for continued effort to get to that goal of 100% compliance with screening? Supervisor Ellenberg, so what we know now relative to just the compliance of documenting the interaction with the, place, uh, the patient is that we do have to spend more time with staff educating them regarding asking the questions and also obviously the follow through. So that is where our focus will be with ED staff at all three hospitals, um, really uh, making sure they understand the importance of it in, in terms of support of the clients. Um, and now that we have the ability to clearly document on a regular basis, you know, clearly that's going to improve our compliance, but we really want to get to really the uh, the compassionate part of this legislation is making sure that the patients get the support they need. Uh, many times when the patient is identified as homeless and they're not known within our system, they, the ED staff will reach out to the homeless program to make that warm handoff to ensure that they get the ongoing support. Thanks, I, I appreciate the connection of 
of data uh, with compassion, and I'll look forward to continued progress um, in providing supports to patients um, in the in the next quarterly report. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Thank you Vice President Nolberg. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I was curious, uh, particularly as it relates to COVID um, shots and flu shots, whether or not the, um, the, the team that focuses on the homeless community also um, goes into our newer um, housing developments where we have lots of clients for this particular service. So wherever the homeless program goes and frequents, they will offer and educate the clients relative to the COVID vaccine, um, as well as the flu shot availability. And so do we, do they currently go to, um, you know, to Second Street Studios or to the Kirtner Studios? Do you know if that's an area we currently set up in? Provider, I think it's best that I get back to you on okay. this to make sure that we identify the frequency for that. Uh, and also visit. whether or not yeah. folks, if they're, if the reason I'm asking is that we have some folks who are, um, who are, who are relatively, relatively recently homeless who are moving into facilities that are just learning how to use the healthcare system overall. And we have a lot of folks who are homeless who um, who who seem to be around some of these facilities. And so anyway, I was just wondering how that gets handled from, from your shop and whether or not they make appointments to provide services. And in particular, I'm interested in Renaissance Place, but there may be others that your staff is already working at. So that would be great if, if someone could just let us know and shoot us all, all a quick email, it'd be great. We, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul, the, the uh... To update is uh, very uh, encouraging. I would like to know if you could maybe walk us through uh, on how this discharge process work because clearly, uh, you no know, offered a meal is great, prescribed medication and prescription, uh, uh, and you know the weather appropriate clothing, all those is good. But my bigger concern is uh, if they go back to the creek to sleep or whatever. Uh, that's going to exacerbate the health condition. So it certainly is not a place to recover. My question is, how does that hook up to our VI SPDET program and whether or not we will be able to give them some type of temporary interim housing with OSH or even uh, motel rooms uh, for those who are you know, recently discharged? Um, if you could give me some um, visibility on how that program works, I would really appreciate it. Sure, Supervisor Lee. Um, so first of all, when an individual presents to the ED, a um, large percentage of time, these are individuals that we are aware of uh, that are homeless and utilize our system. Um, and under the requirement, we're required to document reg the regulation. We're required to document, obviously we know they're homeless, but also the, all the support services that are identified in the, in the regulation, which I've, I've identified in the report. Um, and whether or not they've accepted that support or not. Um, for individuals that present to the ED that are being discharged, outside of these types of support services that we offer, we do focus on their housing situation. Um, if we know that, number one, that they're new to the system and that they're, they're homeless, we work very hard uh, to connect them to the homeless program and the Office of Support of Housing for additional follow-up. Um, regarding their housing situation. Um, so we, we try as much as possible anytime they present to our ED to not only offer the support services relative to the identified areas within the regulation, but also re regarding their homeless status and whether or not we can assist in that regard. Um, so again, it, it, it is a warm handoff as much as possible relative to them wanting the support uh, that we're offering or needing the support. Do you track uh, whether they are going to go back in house situation versus what they're going to have at least a room over the head upon discharge? Something we keep track of? We, we try to um, document their, their situation relative to their housing circumstances. Um, if, in fact, they've been uh, gone through a procedure or a treatment at the hospital, whether 
uh, directly from the ED or um, being discharged from the inpatient unit, we do make a referral to the respite program to ensure that they have adequate time to recover from their procedure or uh, their particular medical condition. Um, so that link is also there relative to um, interim support um, regarding the housing need. Now I'm unmuted. All right. I think. Yes, I don't see any more from Supervisor Lee. Thank you very much. Do you need a motion to receive the report? Yes, I'm going to go. No, we don't. Okay. We don't need to see receive report related to. No, we don't need a motion for that. But they do have um, possible actions. Approve the report, approve the quarterly update, approve the quarterly grant budget update. So we do have three actions that I need a motion for. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Motion by Supervisor Chavez. Second, I believe, with Supervisor Lee. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. We have a motion. We have a second. No further discussion. Nancy, the vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number 19, which is our regarding our health coverage expansion. Supervisor Samidian. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, as you know, this item came through our health and hospital committee. Uh, it was the unanimous recommendation of our committee. That means Supervisor Lee and myself to uh, recommend that we proceed with option three. So uh, I want to offer that as a motion at this time. If there's a second, I will speak briefly. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I'll be second. second. Thank you. And then uh, I should just say um, uh, a shout out to Supervisor Chavez who raised this issue in the context of a possible pilot a while back. And I, I asked at the time that we hold off uh, in the hope that we could uh, do uh, the 400% model for uh, uh, the entire county. That uh, seems entirely practicable. Uh, and I'll just point out that uh, when I came back on the board in 2013 and Supervisor Chavez joined the board shortly thereafter, uh, we had more than 200,000 folks in our county who were uninsured. Uh, and uh, we have managed to more than cut that uh, by half uh, the um, combination of the Medi-Cal expansion, Covered California, Affordable Care Act, and our own Valley Health Plan with aggressive outreach and marketing uh, means that the number of uninsured is probably closer to 80,000 today. But that's still 80,000 folks who frankly need our help and uh, increasing the uh, eligibility criteria to our federal poverty limit of 400 uh, rather than 200%. Uh, in the estimation of staff means we could probably reach more than 20,000 folks with accessible and affordable health care. So uh, a really good day's work if we can do it. So uh, I'll stop there uh, in the interest of time and uh, hope, hope we get a unanimous I vote today. Thank you very much. I'll be supporting it as well. After this item, staff and members, um, we are going to break for lunch. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised before I turn to the public. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, I would like to thank staff for providing information on these options for the PCAP expansion and I'd like to express my enthusiasm supporting this expansion to 400% of the FPL, the, the federal poverty level. The primary care access program, PCAP, has been closing the gaps in care and coverage for neighbors who do not qualify for Medi-Cal or covered California. Let's take an average family of four to illustrate an example. With the current PCAP model, a family of four making less than $53,000 would be eligible for the services. However, what we are voting on today by proposing the expansion to this 400% federal property level, that would allow a family of four making less than $106,000 to be eligible for services. This expansion would double the income requirement for PCAP, and this is going to be a game changer because of, if adopted, this program will more than triple triple the number of Santa Clara County residents currently available to be served through PCAP. And I'd like to recognize all of our friends from the 
uh, Seeks a Predator Collective who have attended meetings and spoken in support of PCAP. And I hope that we'll be able to expand not just access to PCAP, but see more services included, such as mental health, dental, and vision. Finally, as we all know, we do not have universal health care in this country. And this is one of the ways that our county can do as fast as we can to offer as much uh, coverage as possible to our residents. Thank you, and I hope we get your support. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Like I said, I'll be expressing two, but we have one speaker, Nancy. Yes. Oh, excuse me, Nancy, excuse me one second. Dr. Smith, do you have a comment? Um, I just wanted to, for the public's information, make the point that uh, this program really focuses on services provided by our core partners, which are the community clinics, and making sure that <clears throat> access is available to all patients up to 400% uh, of poverty to be seen by the community clinics. Uh, we at VMC and through all of our clinics also have an access program, but it's a separate program. So this really is uh, focusing on allowing the community clinics to expand their services as well as our VMC clinics. Super, thank you. Nancy. Next speaker is Gabriel Hernandez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start and you begin speaking. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yes, so Gabriel Hernandez, director for the CISA Puede Collective. Um, I want to thank um, Supervisor Chavez for uplifting the work of our essential workers in the East Side San Jose doing the work in addressing the pandemic and the lack of health coverage for uh, some of them. Also, thank you to Supervisor Samidian and Lee for the work in the Health and Hospital Committee and the years of the review of the uh, PCAP and, and Supervisor Samidian, uh, thank you for the proposal to expand this coverage to an additional 20,000 families. This is an ongoing cost and cannot, and cannot go unnoticed. And the CISA Puede Collective was happy to participate in the meetings to make a little history with you. This is a big deal. Finally, we would like you to, uh, to urge all of the supervisors to support the health clinics requests like Gardner Health Clinic that provides these type of services to improve their reimbursement formula so that they can continue, continue to afford providing these health services to families like ours. Uh, thank you for making a little his history, and this changes the lives of our families in many ways. Thank you. Good timing on your speech, Gabrielle. All right. The next speaker is Claudia Damiani. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Claudia. Claudia, oh, you may begin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Board of Supervisors. My name is Claudia Damiani. I'm the Program Director from Bejilution, and we are part of the Si Se Puede Collective. Our advocacy and outreach work focuses on housing, immigration, childcare, leadership development, education, economic opportunities, environmental and food equity, and COVID-19 recovery efforts. On behalf of Bejilution and the Si Se Puede Collective, I play a lead role in developing the strategy, curriculum development, and evaluation of our Jobs to Grow Mobility Labs program. I have learned firsthand from the more than 50 food service and childcare entrepreneurs we work with about the challenges of raising a family and finding stable employment, never mind access to affordable healthcare. We need to support to expand access to healthcare coverage, ensuring that thousands of our most vulnerable families, including many of of those that my team works with directly receive health care coverage. Thank you. Next speaker is Casey Hill. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Casey Hill, executive director of Vegilution and a member of the Cise Puede Collective. I'm requesting that you support item 19, the healthcare expansion that will benefit families training to be employed or self-employed, including many members of the Cise Puede Collective. It has been clear that the COVID pandemic has hit low-income communities of color the hardest, exposing a number of inequities that our families in areas such as East San Jose and Gilroy have faced for years. We are asking you to support our ongoing work and strategies to uplift the contributions that our families have made to build and support these parts of the county. The crisis has pushed us all to be bold, innovative, and creative. This healthcare expansion is a perfect example. 
These family first programs and policies do not work in isolation. They are part of a holistic approach to uplifting and protecting our families. Please support item number 19. And thank you. Thank you. And for any speakers listening, they keep adding on one at a time as they go down. Um, we have a motion, we have a second. I'm in favor as well. If you still wish to speak, please go right ahead. The next speaker is Brenda Arenas. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Gracias. Mi nombre es Brenda Arenas y soy un navegador comunitario de Greer Family Services y somos parte del colectivo Si Se Puede. Nuestra labor de defensa y divulgación se centra en la vivienda, las necesidades básicas, la inmigración, el cuidado de los niños, el desarrollo de, de liderazgo, la educación, las oportunidades económicas, la equidad, medio ambiente y alimentaria y los esfuerzos de recuperación del COVID-19. Este año, el colectivo Si Se Puede ha puesto en marcha nuestro programa Trabajos para Crecer y Movilidad para enseñar a las familias a poner en marcha negocios en los ámbitos de la comida y el cuidado de los niños. Este trabajo ejemplifica cómo creamos oportunidades para que los miembros de nuestra comunidad puedan mantener a sus familias. Nuestros programas tienen impacto en Begrusion y Girl Family Services. Tenemos 50 familias aprendiendo cómo in iniciar sus negocios en el servicio de alimentos y servicios de cuidado de niños. Para ayudar a mejorar a sus familias. Thank you. The live transcription was enabled. Is that what you've got, Nancy? That was our final speaker. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. This is Mike, all right. Mike, do we have the translation? I'm sorry. Yes, at the unit translation. Thank you. I thought, never mind. I thought seeing we had that going on at the same time. Go ahead, please. Okay. So my number is uh, Brenda Arenas. Um, and I'm a navigator and um, part of also for part of Si Se Puede Collectives, and we are helping families for delivering different services like housing, basic needs, um, food, children care, leadership, um, um, business opportunities, and also efforts, recovery efforts for COVID-19. We are part, as I said before, of Si Se Puede Collective, and we are working uh, with different families to enable them to help them to enable the business focus on food and children and we are creating econo um, e economic opportunities um, and also we are helping families to start their businesses again for children and um, related to food super thank you supervisor chavez thank you for the reminder that concludes our speakers and our translation dr smith When you get done with this vote, I'd like to make a little bit of an announcement. Okay, when we get done with this vote, Dr. Smith's gonna make an announcement, then we're gonna break for 30 minutes and I'll tell you what we're coming back to. Nancy, vote please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you, Nancy, Dr. Smith. Yes, supervisors, uh, you asked earlier about vaccine status for deputies and correctional officers. Let me just give you the numbers verbally. We'll put this in writing for you. For correctional deputies, we have a total of 767 active deputies. Uh, 688 have been fully vaccinated, 21 partially vaccinated, 50 have pending exemptions um, for the uh, DSA, that's the deputy sheriff's total of 396 active deputies, 345 are fully vaccinated, 50 are um, pending exemptions. So we're doing reasonably better than we have been there's always room for improvement. We'll put it all in uh, off agenda and give you details. But since I promised to give you the details later in the meeting, this is later in the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Smith, I think that'll come out to about 90% have either been fully vaccinated or received at least their first shot. So as we'd all want it to be better, it's certainly better than the public, but we're all catching up. Let's get going, everybody. 
All right, it is now 1213. We are going to come back at 1245. If you had a p if you have a piece of paper and Nancy, please uh, confirm this when I'm done. This is what we're going to do. Item number 20, then 22, then 23, then 69, 70, 71 together, then 73, 74. And I'm hoping to have all that done by two o'clock, at which time we will hear item 13, which had a no sooner than two o'clock start. Nancy, how does that sound? That's what I have. Right on. All right, everybody. Have a good lunch. See you in 30. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Thank you. All right, board members, I see one, two, three, and me makes four, and we need Supervisor Simidian. And Nancy, when Supervisor Simidian appears, if you'll please take a roll call vote to reestablish the existence of a quorum. We go. Okay, and we'll do that. Thank you very much. Paul Lorenz, I see that you're there. You'll be reporting on item 20 in just a moment. I'll give Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian may be having some technical difficulties because I do not see him in the room. Okay, let's resume our meeting and we will start with item number 20, which is a report back on the nursing recruitment, retention and safety at our Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Thank you, President Wasserman, members of the board. Let me catch my breath if you don't mind. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it's an exciting thing to come back to the board meeting. I, I totally understand that. It's well, you know, one of the things that uh, I will share with the board is that I just had the opportunity to do- Supervisor, a... apologies. Uh, I, I think we still need to take a roll call to- Yes, please do. The supervisor's board. committee and is, is here. Yes. Go right ahead, Nancy. Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. I want to make sure Paul gets back to his story of whatever he's excited about. So don't well, just didn't want to lose that. You, you will. If you know Paul, he, it's coming. Okay. And Supervisor Wasserman is here too. Thank you, Nancy. And President Wasserman. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I just had the opportunity to come um, down from the hospital floor from the OB department. Uh, we started a program called the DAISY Award, which acknowledges nurses that do extraordinary things for our patients. Um, and, you know, I'll give more information on the DAISY Award later, but I think this is one of the things that I want to point out that the most we can do in terms of uh, supporting our nurses is actually to acknowledge the incredible work they do uh, and show that they bring immense value to the system. Um, so I could not miss the opportunity to be up there along with the other nurse leaders to acknowledge uh, these nurses. And uh, so, of course, I'm out of breath, out of shape, <laughs> writing back to the board meeting here. But, you know, I, I just can't, uh, you know, say enough about the importance of this topic. Um, we all know that our nurses um, get supported in a number of different ways. Um, two areas which we as a healthcare system are heavily focused on is the ability to recruit and retain our nurses. Um, and the other area that I think we all appreciate is that they are under immense pressure. Um, and, and then when you throw on top of that, uh, some of the difficulties and challenges they have in, in dealing with patients that have behavioral issues, both from a psychiatric standpoint, but also from a clinical standpoint. And they continue day in and day out, um, provide compassionate and, and caring support for our patients. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. So the, the best we can do is not only acknowledge them, but also to focus on those areas where we can uh, make their lives a little bit more easier in terms of the day-to-day -day care. Um, clearly, recruitment and retention is a big area. Um, 
you know, throughout uh, the pandemic, I think we all appreciate the entire healthcare industry has come under a lot of stress. Um, and that stress translates directly into our workforce. Our nurses, as I mentioned, um, work very hard and to the extent that we can support them, express how valuable they are to the system, the greater likelihood that we can retain them um, from all levels of, of leadership, including the board. And I think they, they feel it and they know that. Um, so to bring attention to this item is important. I, I can also share with you, um, if you look at our numbers from an industry standpoint, you know, we're faring pretty well uh, in terms of retention. Uh, we can do a lot better in terms of recruitment. We know that, we acknowledge that. And I think uh, we have taken steps to, to do that along with the Employment Service Agency. Um, so we acknowledge that there are areas in room for improvement. Uh, the other thing is that given the COVID situation, we know that many of our patients present with behavioral issues. Uh, the risk is greater. Um, but if you look at our numbers, we've been able to maintain, you know, a steady number of incidents. The problem is that any one incident is too many. Uh, and so our ability to work together with labor, uh, with our labor partners, with our nurses to develop programs and initiatives is really where the focus should be and has been. Uh, so with that being said, I know John Mills is on the line with me. Yep. Um, uh, Joe Sproul would join in a second. He's but we're here and available to answer any questions regarding our report. Thank you, Jill and John, both good to see you. Um, why don't we go with public speakers first and then we'll go to Vice President Ellenberg and um, we'll go from there. Nancy. Our next speaker is RNPA. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. RNPA, you are unmuted. You can begin. Please go ahead and speak. That is our only speaker. Good afternoon, uh, Model Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, we are at a disadvantage here when we're given one minute to address such a huge topic that our nurses work so hard for. Um, but all we can say is just looking at this report, um, the question that we want to ask the Board of Supervisors is, if all this report that you're looking at right now are all true, mm. why are the nurses complaining? So that takes me to so much of the report that I cannot address in one minute, unfortunately. But what we're saying is the nursing union and the nurses identify two major problems for them. All we ask the board of supervisors help us resolve these issues. Violence at the workplace has risen up tremendously. These data are not accurate. Our nurses are so understaffed. They are so understaffed, they don't even have time to report. And I'm seeing here where it says crisis, post-crisis report. We don't even have the opportunity when we have incidents to have a, a report or to talk about it. That has never happened. So. Thank you. Next speaker. That concludes our public comment. I show, oh, there, okay. That one just went away, thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you were first and Supervisor Chavez. Thanks. Um, I, I do appreciate that. I, and um, hearing from, from RNPA and from the administrative administration's report, I have just a few questions and then some requests uh, to make. I, I do understand that there's a likelihood that assaults um, on on nurses in particular are under reported for myriad of myriad reasons. Um, I've been told that it's common knowledge to anticipate being assaulted uh, by an aggravated patient, um, that that's just part of a nurse's job, and that that contributes to underreporting, as well as a sense of discouragement regarding the likelihood of any follow-up to the reporting. And I'd really like to see um, how, what, what I, I'll say we, but I really mean the hospital administration in partnership with the nurses, create a safe and encouraging place for 
staff to report assaults as, as it's really critical for us to have that data. Um, with respect to gathering accurate data of instances of workplace violence, um, I'm not sure whether to direct this to Paul or, or Jill or someone else. Do you have a sense of how often assaults may be happening that aren't reported? And what are specific uh, steps that are being taken to encourage reporting? Thank you, Paul. And Jill can uh, add on to this, but yeah. you know, I, I think, let me, let me start off by expressing to the board in, in response to this question that I think industry-wide there are challenges with hospitals working with their staff and reporting. So even if you look at our statistics, and I would also agree that um, there are situations that aren't reported that should be reported. And I think the same would be true for other healthcare facilities. And we know that in speaking to our association and our counterparts. So industry-wide and specifically our Valley, you know, we want to encourage reporting of all levels and types of incidents. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, typically you would see if, if we've been successful in encouraging staff report, you start to see a trend of numbers and the, uh, the volume going up. And that can be attributed to, to two things. One is that there's now staff that are reporting. And number two, uh, that, you know, it, it continues to be a challenge for the system to address. Um, so, you know, what we try to do is uh, through the, the leadership and through communication with staff, a uh, reinforced importance of this, and not only for their safety so that we can help manage the situation uh, going forward, but also for their, their peers. Um, I think RNPA um, is right in the sense that we have to work together and to your common supervisor to encourage this type of activity. Um, and it's really uh, coming down to our ability to build trust and communi direct communication around these issues with our staff. Right. Thanks for that. Well, what is the, um, I have a, a several more questions. What is the follow up um, once a report is made? Um, obviously, we're collecting the data in whatever cases are appropriate, we're reporting it to OSHA. But what what is the feedback loop as far as the um, reporter is concerned? If the, the individual reports the, the situation and there's a process for which they report, mm -hmm. um, the expectation is the quality department follows up, but more specifically works with the department manager to ensure that the employee has received the appropriate support that they need. Um, at the time of the incident, the expectation is that the manager, uh, you know, if there's an injury involved, uh, immediately provide support. Um, also let the employee know what resources are available to them. Uh, and that's specific to the employee. Um, what we also try to do is have a debrief uh, given the, the level of it and type of incident that occurs. Uh, and, and that debrief involves staff that were present uh, that and or responded to the situation to ensure that we understand the, the entire situation. Typically in healthcare, we call that a root cause analysis. So from a system standpoint, what could have we done differently or better relative to uh, the incident itself? Uh, so we, we learn from the debriefs uh, from a system standpoint. We also are given the opportunity to interact with staff to ensure that, you know, that, the, that their concerns are being heard and listened to. to. And are, are those debriefs being conducted um, in with regard to every single incident? Are they, I'm looking for a gap between the policy, which sounds like a very good one, and the um, on the ground implementation. So, I mean, and Jill, can you speak to this? But there are two parts to this. So an inpatient unit, depending on the severity or the level of the incident, the manager can institute a briefing and work with leadership and the staff to, to uh, conduct that debriefing, if you will. Uh, bring EAP and bring any other support uh, stakeholders, if you will, into the process. Uh, in EAP and BAP, the expectation is that they debrief on a regular basis, on a per incident basis, uh, given the level and severities of many of the incidents that include, are included in BAP and EPS. Um, this was brought up by RNPA in the last meeting, I understand. 
Um, and that's something that uh, we need to follow up on because it needs to be consistently done uh, in support of our staff. Thank you. And Jill, can you add? Sure. So as far as the inpatient, um, and as Paul mentioned, depending on the severity, um, we, we do have an inpatient de debriefing team um, that whether it is an assault or um, a behavioral verbal assault or, you know, maybe a tragic death, we have a team of not, I mean, just of death of a patient or a traumatic code. We have a team that does go and they set up do, do several debriefings to catch all the staff. So that's to deal with the emotional, you know, well-being of the staff. That's usually at the request of the team. Um, but then we also, as Paul said, quality and risk also do a follow-up and work with the manager because they have to investigate what happened. Um, and, you know, I know we've had the sheriff um, meet with, um, with certain individuals that have had concerns with leadership also to help answer questions and what the process is. And um, I just I just wanna say, you know, we, we I think we all have the same common goals and I absolutely want a partnership with our MPA and how we can decrease, because none of us want to, you know, our nurses, our doctors, none of us wanna see anyone get hurt. I can tell you on a national level, this is a very topic of concern. Um, I'm also uh, still connected to the burn centers across the country. And it is like a major concern, um, really kind of bubbling up right now with this pandemic, but it was an issue prior to the pandemic. So I know we're all trying to do whatever we can to address this. But thanks for that, Jill. I have no doubt in my mind that everyone has the same goals. I'm just looking as we all talk about, you know, continuous improvement and iteration, and, and that's a, a theme in my own office, I have to say of how we can do better the things that, that we know we want to do. One suggestion I, I'd like to make is um, perhaps creating a, um, a survey that is used as a follow-up um, when people report incidents of violence so that we can hear, did they get what they need? Did they have the debrief? Did they get whatever supports they needed? Were they satisfied with, with administration's response? And if not, what what do we still need to be uh, doing to to provide them with the support um, that they that they um, that they really do need? Um, uh, last question before I um, make just a couple of additional requests: Are the protective service officers and acute psychiatric services and hospital and clinic staff all trained together in how to respond to patients that have a uh, that that may have assaulted staff in the past or or for whatever reason are at high risk for assault are those are those departments trained together well for psych we have done some joint training um it, that hasn't happened in the inpatient setting um so there may, may absolutely be an opportunity there um but we have we have done it with the psych services um because, oh sorry I was, I, and they were the trainings were virtual during the pandemic, but I just wanted to note that they have gone back into um, live person trainings. That's good to hear. And and I'm fully aware that I'm an outsider offering two or three cents um, we're worth of opinions here. Um, but thinking also that that communication really is so key to ensuring success and safety. And, and if the staff and the protective service officers are expected to de-escalate or respond to a um, a patient who is who is behaving uh, violently together, then I I would think that receiving training together and having opportunities to discuss possible scenarios um, would really um, help build trust and also avoid communication or any kind of disharmony uh, between the two between the two departments. Um, I I do think that there is is tremendous potential for real integration and partnerships. And I think about this, you know, certainly not only with regard to our, nur our nurses, but with our bargaining partners and departments across uh, the county. But I want to just finish with um, some, some more general comments about, uh, about the nurses. 
it is for sure not a secret that, that we are facing a national shortage of nurses. That's one of the reasons that Supervisor Chavez and I introduced a referral addressing not only workforce development concerns, but workforce safety concerns. Um, and I'd like to ask that administration consider extra help and per diem nurses for the critical care training program prior to any nurses from outside the county so that we can help uh, retain our, our current nurses. And second, I just want to uh, revisit the issue of pandemic pay for part-time workers. We, we've all discussed that many of our part-time nurses worked full-time during the pandemic. We, we talked about this issue under the ARPA item at the last board meeting, but the board didn't provide any specific direction. And my goal is to, to ensure that the nurses and other identically situated county employees receive that full 2,500 pandemic pay bonus. So Dr. Smith, what is the appropriate path or, or James uh, for this board to discuss and potentially direct administration regarding nurses and any other part-time employees that had been asked to and did work full-time hours during COVID? Dr. Smith and James? We're scheduled to come back to the board in the second meeting in December to give a report back about uh, the extra help uh, strategy. And that would be a time period where the board could direct us differently or make uh, suggestions. So I would say that's the best time. Okay, thank you very much. Then I, I will wait for that and um, appreciate consideration of the two suggestions uh, that I directed to Paul and Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, so thank you um, for the report, and I want to make a few um, a few recommendations as well. Sorry, I'm just looking for my notes real quick. I I want to be able to make a motion to receive the report with additional direction. Uh -huh. And um, I second it. Thank you. And and let me just share with that. Um, uh, it, that additional direction is. I want to, um, Supervisor Allenberg, I'm going to start both with the first with the hiring process and then with the public safety issues. So um, in December, what I would like to request is that we receive an off agenda report with the timeline for the engagement of the external uh, firms. The report should respond to the five year reserve. Um, idea and the original referral that was intended to ensure funds are set aside for uh, to address workplace safety. And second, I'd like to ask staff to report to the board during mid year with more information on the status of the engagement with the external firms and a thorough analysis of the vacancies within the hospital system, including turnover rates and retention. Third, because nurses retention is so critical to ensure we continue to offer the highest quality care. Um, and I appreciate the ideas you suggested. I'm therefore requesting the staff share a progress report during mid-year on the development of the retention program, such as the clinical ladder and critical care programs. Once a, an external firm has been chosen to support its work, this staff, um, I wanna make sure that the, uh, that the union, RNPA, is included uh, in discussions with ideas so that, uh, you know, to help with uh, recruitment and then just two other things that I would like to add based on the, the discussion that I've heard today. Uh, one is that, um, that we need to address the presence <clears throat> of the public safety officers on site, um, both how many of them, how available they are and their training. Um, and then what I would like to ask um, that gets included is that we have a, a Harvey Rose audit the actual responses. Um, and the reason for this, the, and, but what I mean is the responses to workplace violence, both the reporting and the um, support services. And the reason for this is that I think part of what needs to be um, strengthened is the, the relationship between our staff um, and our management, particularly with the nurses. And I think having both the external firm and, the, and an outside auditor giving just you know, direct, clear, 
observations will help all of us um, right size the direction we're going. Um, and then I, I think the other thing I just wanted to say, um, and really Dr. Smith, this is more to you and to Paul than to Jill. And part of the reason that, you know, I, I think that uh, Jill, your point about what the trends that are being seen across the country is such a critical acknowledgement that um, our environment, that there's just a high level of agitation in our environments. and. You know, we're seeing it in grocery stores, we're seeing it in restaurants, we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it in road rage. We're, it's just, we have to acknowledge that that's part of the environment that we're operating in. And then the second thing I, I think that's really critical to acknowledge is that when people don't feel well and they have to wait, there's this higher level of agitation. And then when people are waiting with a loved one, you add this other level of tension. And I think that um, we need to take a deeper dive into you know, wait times, which is actually part of staffing. And it's also part of, I know something that you're already doing as you're looking at, um, you know, new ways of procedures and always trying to make things run more smoothly. I recognize that. I, I just lift that up because um, I think we're in a new era. And I think absent really being able to address that in our workplaces, we're gonna have a different kind of retention problem. And again, something that's being seen all over the country, right? People opting to be out of the workforce instead of in it for, for those reasons of stress. So, um, so Susan, those would be my uh, recommended additions. Thank you, is that fine with the seconder? It is. Thank you, I'm just gonna uh, echo my support for whatever we can do to retain recruit and protect our nurses. That's uh, extremely important to me. I, I'm proud of the retention rate that we have compared to the national average. Paul, I appreciate your perspective that we can always do better. I think increasing the safety, we can always do better. And um, recruitment's a tough thing. You know, my daughter's 33, 15 years ago when she was 18, you know, she asked me, dad, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, 15 years ago, there was a nurse, a nursing shortage. I said, why don't you become a nurse? She didn't happen to become a nurse, but as far as I know, there's been a nursing shortage for 15 years oh, nationwide. And the more schools, you know, go Spartans, San Jose State, the more schools that can have classes to train people to get their, their nursing license, the better. And I hope that increases. I hope the universities recognize the shortage and to uh, have more and more classes because the patient's experience 90% of the time when they're at a hospital is with the nurse. And um, that's important. And I'm glad to see all the support that we all seem to have to try and make things better. But every single hospital wants to get more nurses and keep more nurses. So it's, it's a competitive world there. Before I call for a vote, Paul, your hand is up. Did you have one additional comment? If I may, Supervisor. Um, yes. So one of the things that's, I think, important to understand about the nursing industry and um, the number of individuals that are entering into nursing is that we have great success in recruiting new nurses. The number of job applications we receive and the number of individual nurses that want to work for your healthcare system is, is very large. Um, our challenge and the challenge with most hospitals is that as Supervisor Chavez has indicated, many of the experienced nurses, skilled nurses, are leaving the industry, or simply they're retiring and it's their time to move on. Uh, what we've acknowledged as a system is that we're large enough to be, begin to develop and grow our own. Um, we've had conversations with RNPA and with uh, you know John Mills and ESA about how we continue to develop programs to develop our nurses so that we can move them up to the next level um, so they can be intensive care nurses, burn nurses, uh, that they can work in our emergency departments. Um, and so we have to start to change our focus uh, to not only on recruitment, but really developing our own nurses internally within the organization. And that's something that we're focused on and we'll start to keep your, uh, we'll continue to keep your board informed upon our efforts. Thank you very much. Board members, um... I'm going to take this vote and Supervisor Ellenberg, I'm going to need you to take over the meeting. I've got a, uh, a family matter that I need to step away from the meeting for right now. Uh, 
Nancy, will you please uh, call for the question? Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Westerman? Yes, as well. Thank you. And my apologies to everybody. Vice President Ellenberg, you've got the helm. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, I believe that the next item is 23, no, 22, 22. Yes, that's correct. Apologies, I don't have the, I'm trying to organize the agenda in front of me with the item. Yes, and this was something I pulled off, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, if it's helpful, Fantastic. I'm happy to jump Take in. Take it from here. Thank Great. you so much. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to, um, first of all, I'm, I want to say a very special uh, and very sincere thank you to you all thinking creatively about what um, what next steps there are in the home ownership areas in particular. I am concerned about um, the, the approach relative to ownership and what I'm most concerned about is actually ownership of properties and then the ma maintenance of the um, the uh, affordability, even if you have folks uh, get enough money and out of a project they sell or a home they sell to move on to another location. Could you walk me through the, the benchmark that you put in and the why of that? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, if we can, we actually have a short presentation. Oh, for great. You. That'd be great. Um, Thank and, you. and I also wanted to take the time to introduce the board to Natalie Monk. She's our H uh, Housing and Community Development Division Manager. She's been with our office for about six months now um, and doing all of the work of Measure A um, and creatively thinking about new ways to accelerate development, come up with some homeownership ideas. So I will um, defer to her. She will provide the presentation. Thanks, Consuelo. Okay. Uh, Uh, on June 22nd, staff presented three ideas for pilot projects, which could increase affordable home ownership opportunities in the county, including cooperative housing focused on ELI households, new large scale affordable home ownership development, and infill development on small sites up to 20 homes. These project types are incorporated into the new proposed cooperative housing and home ownership project types in the proposed updates to our NOVA. Uh, we're proposing a new goal of 400 units associated with these two project types. We're also updating the guidelines to amend requirements for type two and three projects and to clarify and add requirements for community engagement and for the acquisition and rehab of existing housing. Uh, type two is currently for projects with an average affordability of 45% AMI with a 33% set aside for supportive housing. We're proposing to lower this to a 25% set aside to encourage more integrated development. Type three is currently for projects with a 25% set aside for individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities and their families. We're proposing to amend this to projects with at least 10 IDD units and a maximum of 25% IDD units. This is based on community feedback that the proposed change is expected to lead to an overall increase in IDD units distributed across the county. Uh, type four is a new proposed project type for developments with at least 20 rapid rehousing units. In this case, the county's financial contribution may be capped at $4 million. Uh, type five is a new proposed project type for cooperative housing projects. This chart shows example scenarios of how extremely low income, very low income, low and moderate income households could be served by this project type. Households would have an income of no more than $181,000. They would pay PCAC rent, which would be set at 30% of their income. Uh, and they would accept, expect to receive approximately $25,000 to $45,000 in equity if they moved out after 10 years. This type of cooperative housing offers very limited equity compared to home ownership but it can make a meaningful difference to households with the lowest incomes. Type 
six is a new proposed project type for affordable home ownership projects. This chart shows example scenarios of how very low income, low income, and moderate income households could be served by this project type. Households would have an income of less than $181,000. They would pay an affordable mortgage, which would be set at 30% of their income. And they would expect to receive roughly $75,000 to $230,000 in equity if they sold their home after 10 years. The administration is also requesting authorization to apply for $5 million in Cal Home Program funding from the state. These funds could be used to support a variety of home ownership opportunities within the county. And that, that concludes our report. I'm happy to take any questions. Supervisor Chavez, do you have follow-up questions before I look to the public? For speakers or do you want to wait? Oh, the public's fine. Thank you. And then I'll okay. go. Great. It looks like we have two speakers on this item. Let's uh, let's do a minute each, please. Thank you. First speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, uh, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, thank you for that. Uh, um, that report, it, it looks like you're really um, trying to get creative and you're brainstorming like a lot of different ideas in order to to secure uh, residents of different incomes here in the city and the county. But the if if we're not factoring in the generational consequences of of redlining, when I looked at the when I looked at the how much equity a person would be able to get after 10 years i looked at that and there are homes right now in redlined areas that are getting that in one year and i think that we need to kind of like have some open conversations about that about how these properties were able to acquire that kind of equity thank you next speaker is blair beekman please accept the unmute to begin speaking Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I'm really impressed with this item as well. Uh, thank you uh, for it. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's really important to me the ideas of future ideas of mixed income ideas uh, that uh, you're trying to uh, navigate and better understand at this time. Um, these this offers uh, incredible ideas towards. Um, a future of, uh, I, I guess it's called uh, reparations. I mean, that could be one way to look at it. Um, it is trying to define uh, past generations, how past generations can have a, a certain place, I suppose. Um, it's good thinking, it sounds like, and, and you're, off, you're in a really good direction that may be related to COPA ideas as well. Uh, good luck in, in further practices of these ideas. Thank you. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. I uh, want to say thank you for the presentation. My name is Victor Vasquez at Somos Mayfair. And we at Somos, we've been looking at all these different solutions. And we also believe that cooperative housing is an excellent way for us to think about how do we prevent um, future homelessness and how do we start thinking about both prevention and intervention or continue to think about that but actually take some action because um, the ideas of like potentially building new homes, but also acquiring properties already in the market to to address our, our displacement crisis, it's it's a better approach in our perspective because it addresses a current need, an urgent need that people are being displaced that's only exasperated by the realities of COVID. And we hope to work with you and the staff to continue to make this a reality, not only within the county, framework, but also with um, and with our city partners. Um, and hopefully this could happen in, in East San Jose and other areas impacted by displacement. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, coming back to my colleagues, are there any uh, further comments or questions? Supervisor Travis. Thank you. The reason that I um, asked this to be heard uh, were two issues. One, I think this is such a significant uh, program of the county. I think it's really important that these these kinds of reports not necessarily go on consent. 
um, and also so everybody understands what we are saying yes to or no to. What I was hoping you could do is if you could talk just for a moment about the new pro project type four and um, and then just to remind me that the overall um, in each category, we still have funding. I mean, I'm sorry, we still have um, income restrictions, right? So we have that when I'm looking at the 800 million, that multifamily is for extremely low and very low income households. So the, the, that doesn't change. It's the, it's the mechanisms you're using for funding or the kind of product you're creating availability for. Is that accurate? That's correct, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And does that, so on the new project type, is that what you were referring to as being um, more along the lines of a cooperative? Uh, no, the project type four is essentially the same type of multifamily rental. Um, in short, we have a few projects across the county that don't meet the measure A requirements exactly um, the way we would like them to. Um, but there are other efforts in that respective city where when you think about, you know, the 10 projects in any one city, collectively, they meet the Measure A requirement. Um, but right now, they won't apply for Measure A funding or any of our county funding, um, with the exception of the IDB dollars, because um, they don't necessarily want to have a large number of supportive housing units in their, in their buildings. Um, and so this would provide an opportunity for us. Um, Pre-Measure A, this is more or less the way we were funding supportive housing across the county. Small investment in our dollars, um, and it would yield anywhere between 20 and 30 units at a given site. The cooperative models, um, Supervisor well, Chavez. Just if, I'm sorry, Natalie, if I just could go back to this. So the source of this funding for, for the new project type is not Measure A money then? It could be Supervisor Chavez. And sorry, Natalie and I are in the same room, room trying to use <laughs> one video. <laughs> um, it, it can be. So we've actually, um, all of our housing funds available throughout the county are in one NOFA. Uh, so we utilize our home dollars, CDBG dollars, Measure A. Um, in 2002, 2003, the board at the time approved an affordable housing fund. We get repayments from that. Um, funding source. And so we use a variety of funding sources, leverage home key dollars and anything really at our disposal to leverage increased production. And this would basically give a new opportunity to developers um, to rapidly um, increase the production of units that are reserved for rapid rehousing. So it can include Measure A. So what I, I think that, um, let me just share with you all and my colleagues a concern that I have, which is that um, this, this is not, it's not clear from reading this report that that's the, that we're, that we're, um, how we're approaching this. And so I, and I don't, there's a, there is a section that talks about, you know, how we're using our, our NOFAs, but all the funding sources that are going into it. And here's the reason I'm, I'm really wanting to press on this. At some point, we're going to be running out of Measure A funds. And it's hard for me to understand from looking at this report what are we focused on relative to measure A? What goes on after measure A is, um, is used up? And does it still meet the higher goals that we have around permanent supportive housing for people who are homeless? And so, um, and I know, um, I know that you all have a lot of moving parts. Uh, so I recognize that this may seem very, very, oh no, it's so super automatic to you, but that, that is not really what I understood from reviewing this. The second thing I just wanna say again for my colleagues is that um, there, there is an interest, at least I have an interest and have had one on the, on the for sale product of seeing how much of that money that gets invested can come back into that pool of money. And the reason that's so critical is that, um, you know, here it says we have um, 25 million programmed and 25 million left to program. Of that 25 million total amount programmed, we probably spent, what, less than 5 million so far? Yeah? Correct. So, and, and this to me is an opportunity to have an ongoing fund either for first time home buyer programming or being able to take what comes back from that and invest it into other parts of our program. And so I can't see that that thread through here. And if that's something else that's still being considered, I, I would wanna 
better understand that. Um, and, you know, and again, I think from a general perspective, I think the direction is fine and creative and I, I really appreciate you all digging in and thinking about it. Um, but I am really trying to better understand the, the you know, the, the, um, the evolution of, you know, where we are today and then where we're going to be going relative to what kinds of resources we're going to have over what period of time. So as an example, I don't know if you know Consuelo off the top of your head, and I, and I know the, the first time home buyer money we have to take out just for this one discussion is that when we will have depleted everything but the first time home buyer program and perhaps even the moderate income, I know we're a little bit more behind on that too, but do you have a sense of timing on when the 800 million will be committed? Yes, Supervisor, we're scheduled um, or planning to come back to the board in January with the next round of projects. And at that time, we are going to present to you all what we um, have left after the eighth round. Um, we are leveraging, our county is a recipient of no place like home dollars directly from the state. Uh, we just received notification that we're getting another $30 million. Congratulations. So Thank you. And, you know, we're doing everything we can to leverage other funding opportunities, for instance, the $5 million that we're um, is part of your recommended action today to bring in $5 million that we can leverage for home ownership opportunities. Um, so in January, we do propose to bring with bring to the board an update of everything related to measure a from the seven objectives you all approve the geographic distribution of measure a projects across the county and where the gaps are and re and a look at how much money is left to program from that 800 million i'm sorry left to allocate for projects thank you and then the the 20 the um yeah i think um well i think that that um you know i i i won't uh for my colleagues with more questions, I'll get more time with you all. But I, I do, the reason I did want to pull this is, I do think this is such an important program. And I I am a little bit concerned that that I don't yet understand as we're using up the, the money that we have right now, um, whether or not we're going to meet our permanent supportive housing goals, as that was the primary um, driver of, of Measure A. And so I, I just want to better understand that. And then I think your points about being innovative and creative, and I've seen you do that with our um, CDGB money too. I've seen, you know, you kind of cobble it all together, but really better understanding longer term what those funding streams are and then what is our capacity going to be um, post measure A. Thank you. Would you I, like I would, to make a motion to uh, move this item forward? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. And is there a second? I'll second. Thank you very much. Are there any additional comments from other supervisors? If not, let's uh, do a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Still away. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to move now to item 23, which was held from November 2nd. This is to receive a report relating to the public release of audiovisual recordings of the incident involving Andrew Hogan and the status of county compliance with consent decrees involving the jail. Do we have a presentation on this item or are we going right to questions and comments? Uh, Supervisor, we're available for questions and comments. The report uh, indicates that we've provided the uh, videos and they're available on the county website. Supervisors Samidian and Lee, as this was your referral, do you wish to have a report made? I have uh, questions when the time is appropriate, uh, Madam Chair. Thank okay. Okay, then it sounds like you're good without a report. So let's go to the public first and see if there are public comments on this item and let's do a minute per commenter, please. First speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I, if you can repeat, please, specifically where the location is of that uh, film. I'd like to I'd like to review it, um, if I could, please. Uh, secondly, is that 
I am counting on you, uh, Supervisor Smidian. When you had given some comments about a couple of months ago with regard to the jails, you articulated, I mean, precisely that you at least understand the issues and you, uh, you, you articulated it perfectly in terms of what the issues are, what the county's accountability is, and what it is that we need to see from you. I mean, because I've seen what, what happened with Andrew, that's, that's common practice. I've seen that for decades. It's just that this one was caught on film and he really, really hurt himself and injured himself. But there's countless incidences that have never been reported that are at that level of severity. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I think uh, this was an item that was uh, on your agendas a few uh, weeks or months ago. Now, um, it was the first time that I, I think I tried to mention the ideas that uh, there, there needs to be an important, uh, robust and healthy new uh, exploration, I think, into the ideas of uh, open and accountable practices with uh, biometric uh, camera technology. I know you have the policies in place uh, for that work. I think it's a time to review those good practices and and bring them out and, and what we can develop for ourselves and our future uh, community practices. Uh, it can be a lot of help for ourselves and make a language understandable how to talk about subject matter um, for ourselves um, uh, and our future uh, that uh, we are entering into. And so thanks for your time uh, to hear myself on this item. That concludes public comment. Thank you so much. I'll go to Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. Let me uh, ask first, uh, following up on the request from one of the speakers, if the county council or someone from uh, the county council's office could describe again for folks where they can view the relevant video that has now been made public. It is available at jailreforms.sccgov.org. That's jailreforms.sccgov.org. There's a direct link uh, in the ledge file, which is available online. Thank you. And uh, let me also ask, uh, Madam Chair, do we know if Mr. Janako from the OIR group who serves as our Office of Cray? Ah, there he is yes, available. Here. Thank you. Um, well, let me just say, um, I think the video is as gut-wrenching today, a year and a half later, as it was when members of the board first had the opportunity to review it. I think it is important that it be publicly available in part so there can be no denial of just what kind of conduct took place that left one of our inmates brain damaged for the rest of his life and cost $10 million in settlement fees. Um, and uh, I would encourage members of the public with a caution uh, that it really is disturbing video, that if they uh, want to get some sense of the nature of the problem here, uh, num videos number 24 through 30 are perhaps most relevant uh, to the discussion that I'm hoping to uh, begin uh, again right now. Let me ask the county council's office um, a question about the sharing of these videos with re relevant agencies. Uh, at our uh, first meeting on this topic back in mid-August, I believe, uh, the board took action to share information, including these videos with um, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, the State Attorney General's Office, the Santa Clara County Civil Grand Jury, and the state's Fair Political Practices Commission, also known as the FPPC. Is it, has that, has that information been shared yet, uh, Mr. Williams, or is that still a work in progress? And if so, uh, do you have a rough timeline on uh, when that information will be shared, including uh, this video? That information has not been shared yet. We were waiting to, uh, of course, have the videos and everything else done so we could send 
uh, one packet with everything together. Now that this item has been done, we'll be putting that together. Uh, I don't have a specific timeline, uh, but uh, probably the next uh, next few weeks, we should be able to get those packets together and sent out and we will uh, copy the board uh, on those packets. Thank you. Turning to Mr. Janako, if I may, through the chair from the um, OIR group who serves as our Office of Correction Law Enforcement Monitoring entity. Uh, Mr. Janako, um, as I have indicated previously at these board meetings, um, given the fact that we have uh, someone who was in the care of our, of our jails, brain damaged for the rest of his life and a $10 million settlement, it, it was not surprising to me that an internal affairs investigation was opened. It was um, quite surprising to me uh, a year and a half ago to learn that that investigation was shut down uh, by someone uh, in the sheriff's department. And so I had asked uh, you and others have asked as well, um, who shut down the internal affairs investigation and why? And um, because you had characterized that in your report of September the 14th this year as highly uh, unusual. And I'm looking back at that report and looking at the language of your report, it says, and I'm going to read uh, verbatim here just to make sure I get it right. Uh, the sheriff, through her attorney, has expressly declined to provide us any information relating to the internal affairs investigation that her agency appears to have initiated and then deactivated. Without this information, we cannot answer this board's question about whether any meaningful internal affairs investigation was conducted and or the appropriate disciplinary action taken. Accordingly, we plan to use our subpoena authority granted by this board to compel the sheriff to provide the critical information. And then um, later on in the same report of September 2021, you indicate that um, based on available information, we believe, as did the sheriff's office initially, that a formal internal affairs investigation was necessary. Um, moreover, the heretofore unexplained closure of the sheriff's office administrative case is highly irregular and problematic. Uh, and You further indicate the internal affairs investigation appears to have been abruptly halted before the investigation could be completed or any findings made. Once an internal affairs investigation is initiated, it should be the extraordinary circumstance that would cause it to be closed without a finding. And Because the sheriff's office has refused to provide OCLEM with any documents relating to the internal affairs case or access to internal affairs leadership, we have no ability to independently evaluate the rationale for the sheriff's office closure of the case. And again, it mentions, uh, we therefore intend to exercise our subpoena authority as needed to carry out our responsibilities. And there is a footnote at page 25 that specifically talks about the political environment swirling around the case and the closure of the internal affairs investigation. So my question for you today is, where are you in that process of exercising subpoena power or has the information regarding who shut it down and why with respect to the internal affairs investigation been shared with you uh, without subpoena? Where are we in that process, sir? Uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Sumidian, you read a report that I authored in the middle of September. All of uh, what you read is uh, still accurate as of today. Um, we have not been provided any information uh, relating to uh, the shutdown of the internal affairs investigation voluntarily by the sheriff's office or the sheriff. 
Um, so we are still at a standstill with regard to accessing that information voluntarily. As we indicated in our memo, uh, we intend to issue a subpoena uh, for the internal affairs information and for access to internal affairs personnel as well. And um, I've been working with county council on this. This is the first time this office would be issuing the subpoena. There were some details, but my understanding is that the issuance of that subpoena is um, imminent. All right. So by imminent, we mean within a matter of days or a couple of weeks at most? I hope so, sir. I um, have been uh, just received a um, communication this morning from County Council, and I uh, wouldn't, I would say it's going to be days more than weeks for sure. Let me turn to the County Council, if I may, through the chair and ask uh, Mr. Williams if he can provide us any more clarity or not yet at this point. That's consistent with my understanding, Day, days, not weeks. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful to know. Um, and Mr. Williams and Mr. Janako, uh, I, I'm looking at this footnote 29 on page 25 of the September report, and I'm going to read it verbatim again, Madam Chair, because it I think makes the case for why it is so important that the public have uh, a, an explanation as to what happened or didn't in connection with the internal affairs investigation that was commenced but then shut down. Uh, this is from Oakland's report of September 14th, 2021. It says publicly available information suggests that the investigation may have been irregular in other ways that merit attention. Public sources indicate that one of the supervising officers involved in the incident was a leader of the Correctional Peace Officers Association, which provided significant support for the sheriff's reelection. Public sources also indicate that the sheriff promoted that officer soon after the election and just a few months after the incident involving Mr. Hogan. These facts taken together with the unexplained closure of the internal affairs investigation certainly raised the question of whether the officer's position in the union and its support for the sheriff's political campaign played a role in the decision to deactivate the internal affairs investigation. But those concerns cannot be definitively assessed without OCLEM obtaining the requested information and access to sheriff's supervisory internal affairs personnel. So Mr. Williams and Mr. Janako, I just want to exhort you again to pursue the subpoena if that is the only means by which uh, the county and the public can have a fuller understanding of who shut down the internal affairs investigation and why, particularly given the political uh, context that has been identified by the folks at OCLAP. The relevance uh, of all this, of course, to the tapes is that the tapes show just horrific uh, the incident was, why the county felt it should settle for $10 million, the highest amount in the history of such cases in our county, and, and why we need uh, to know what happened to the IA investigation, why there was not a completed internal affairs investigation, uh, and some measure of accountability in this instance. I just want to close, Madam Chair uh, and colleagues, by saying I think it is important not to paint with too broad a brush, as I have said before. Uh, there were individuals involved in this tragedy uh, who were confronted with very difficult circumstances and who comported themselves uh, actually quite, uh, quite well under very, very difficult circumstances. I wanna acknowledge that. I think that is the appropriate and respectful thing to do. I also wanna make plain that I'm trying to get an understanding of individual behavior. And so when I say don't paint with too broad a brush, that means Let's not uh, uh, suggest that any larger group of individuals or organization is accountable uh, in uh, cases where they may not be accountable. But again, until and unless we have clarity about why the internal affairs investigation was shut down, uh, we will not have answers to any of those questions. And uh, even a brief view of these videos I should compel us to demand answers and accountability. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. That's all I have today. 
Thank you very much. I have a couple of brief comments, but want to first look to Supervisors Chavez and Lee to see if there's anything that you would like to ask or add. No, thank you. Okay. Um, None for me. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I realize that we have, have a lot to cover today, um, but I do want to make just two, two comments. Um, the conversation that I've just been listening to um, really re relates as well to my referral with Supervisor Lee that sought to bring to the public information about use of force incidents and also just um, makes me think again about the importance of naming a chief of corrections as uh, Supervisor Chavez mentioned earlier and shifting internal affairs investigation to the chief's jurisdiction so that the board can have clearer access to that information. Is that something Michael or, or Dr. Smith can speak briefly to? Well, I um, maybe I can speak to that. Yeah, maybe I can speak to that. Um, Please. The question has to do with who's the appointing authority for the relevant uh, personnel. And so if we're talking about peace officers or correctional deputies, that is the sheriff. And so the appointment or not of the chief of correction won't change the uh, that function, but it depends on you know how how positions are staffed and structured. So, for example, there used to be uh, correctional staff that reported to the chief of correction instead of the sheriff, and they didn't have the same uh, status uh, under state law. But um, those folks would, for example, then report to the chief of correction and be subject to uh, IA by the chief of correction. So if this board desired to initiate that process, what would be the appropriate pathway? Uh, well, we've brought forward an item uh, several times uh, on a, about an annual basis regarding the structure of the jails. And so the board would need to adopt an ordinance moving and transferring functions from the sheriff to the Department of Correction. Uh, and take the other kind of related steps. And we've outlined the various issues around that when we brought those items forward. That item will come again to the board uh, sometime this uh, upcoming spring. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, James. I didn't realize that, that it was an annual occurrence somehow. Um, just one more point um, that I wanna make today it's because it, it feels important to just put on the record some concerns I have about the way we approach these consent decree updates. The board has received regular updates through the years. I've slowly been moving toward a realization that we really need to, to rethink the fundamental premise of addressing the consent decree. It's interesting to me that the lawsuit, which was supposedly brought to protect the best interest, interests of the plaintiffs, mostly concludes that some harmful practices must continue just in a slightly less harmful manner rather than redirecting people from being made vulnerable to that harm entirely. And I want to just highlight um, one aspect of the report that states construct directs us to construct a new jail with 3% ADA capacity or if the county elects not to build a new jail meet and confer with plaintiffs counsel about additional construction needs in the existing facilities to achieve ADA compliance. I just want to remind everyone that um, we are not required um, to create uh, to create a, a new jail. That is, that is one way of addressing the consent decree, but not the only option available to us. So that doesn't need a, a response or comment. Just wanted to put that on the record for today. And uh, Supervisor Sumidian, would you like to make a motion on this item? With uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Williams and his team at County Council and to Mr. Janaco for their, their work, uh, I would uh, move approval of the recommended action, which is simply to receive the report. And is there a second? Happy second. second. Thank you so much. Let's do a roll call vote, please. Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Still away. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So colleagues, let me ask um, for some input here. It is four minutes until two. The redistricting item number 13 cannot be held before 2 p.m., but doesn't necessarily need to be held at 2 p.m. So I'm offering the options of either continuing um, with our agenda and holding 13 for, for last. I see vigorous nods from Supervisor Lee or pausing our agenda, handling 13 uh, at 2 p.m. and then returning to the remainder. Otto just made his, his preference clear. Um, Supervisors Chavez and Smidian. I agree with, I believe I agree with Supervisor Lee's head nodding. Uh, I, I think um, uh, our board can make uh, our way with just four of us through the remaining other items. I do think we probably want all five members together if possible for the redistrict conversation. Fair enough. Supervisor Chavez, any objections to that? Agreed. All right, leading by democracy here. Uh, that brings us to items 69, 70, and 71, which Supervisor Chavez asked to hear concurrently um, after removing them from the consent calendar. Thank you. I wanted to just give Chief uh, Garnett an opportunity to walk us through a brief presentation so that everybody knows what we're doing here. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Sure, absolutely happy to do so. Um, good afternoon, board members. So today we're going to walk you through our draft juvenile justice realignment block grant annual plan that has um, had a lot of lot of input and we're super duper proud of it. Um, presenting today is Dr. Holly Child from our department, Grace Gonzalez from Behavioral Health. Um, Judge Lucero is on the line to answer any questions that people might have. A lot of my staff and I'm on here, more behavioral health staff are on here. Um, and with that, let's go to Holly. Uh, good afternoon, Vice President Ellenberg and members of the board. Um, as you know, my name is Holly Child and I'm the Director for Research and Development for the Probation Department. And I want to pause a moment and give my partner for today's presentation an opportunity to present herself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Grace Gonzalez and I am the Program Manager um, with Behavioral Health overseeing our secure youth treatment facility. Nice to meet you all. And today our focus is to present an overview of the local juvenile justice realignment plan. Um, for those of you who are listening in today, you can find the full plan on page 1439 of the agenda packet. We're going to do our best today to summarize and honor the work that was done at this plan. There's a lot of really great detailed information and we're going to give you a high level view of today's plan. We'll also have um, reserved some time at the end for questions. So to give everybody on, on today's call some background, through Senate Bills 823 and 92, the legislator is closing the department, the Division of Juvenile Justice within the Department of Corrections. That means that those facilities that were available for youth um, in our county who went to long-term uh, facilities, um, they're no longer taking youth. So I want to be just a little bit clarifying for the audience who's listening today is that the youth who are currently at DJJ are not coming back to the county. This is really impacting the youth who were newly committed as of July 1st, 2021. So we're only looking kind of forward in this program um, and we'll make sure we reiterate that a few times as we go through today's presentation. The other thing that's really wonderful about this legislation is really in line with a lot of the juvenile justice reform work that's been happening in the county, really thinking about natural supports, communities, families, this legislation, this idea of bringing these programs locally gives an opportunity to have our youth closer to home where they can have more connections with family and community and to really have supports that are built during their time with us so that when they do go home um, back to their home communities, they have those connections in place and those relationships and trust to build. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is the plan. There is a plan that each county is required to submit to the Office of Youth and Community Restoration by January 1st of 2022. This plan will be updated annually and uh, um, presented to that, to that department on um, May 1st of every year. The intent of the plan. So during the short time for implementation, it's important to know that this is kind of an initial plan and the plan will evolve as we work towards our goals and we learn more about the program through our youth, families and community partners. We've already made some modifications and adjustments 
hearing from some of you through in the program um, currently. I know, for example, our chief was actually in the facility yesterday who talked with all the youth to get feedback. So we're definitely staying connected with the voices and ensuring that we're meeting everyone's needs. The program is developed in collaboration with behavioral health and in collaboration with other various stakeholders. Um, the, the unit will be staffed with both probation group counselors and behavioral health staff. We're anticipating about 15 to 30 youth per year at any given time within two units in the juvenile hall. Given the timing of the passage and the implementation of the Senate bills, the juvenile hall facility was the only facility that was available that was both secure and appropriately rated for the population being served. It's really important to note that the county doesn't own the ranch, um, the, at the state owns the ranch and we currently lease the ranch from the state. As part of uh, the California Local Youthful Offender Rehabilitation, it's a long word, or long title, Facility Construction Funding Program via Senate Bill 81. Um, the county was able to construct the ranch, which is considered a minimum security facility that supports youth who are committed under um, certain offenses. The probation department would need approval from the California Boards of State and Community Corrections, also known as BSCC, if you hear the acronym, and SB 811 bondholders to adjust the intended use of the James Ranch to allow our county to use it as a secure youth treatment facility. So although probation and behavioral health are presenting today, the plan was developed by a wide array of community partners and stakeholders. Their voice, time, and commitment are truly valued and it couldn't have been done without this collaborative approach. So I wanna show you um, some of the stakeholders that we engaged during this time. We have had some really wonderful partnerships with some of our community, community based organizations who've actually gone to DJJ and talked with youth who are currently in the program. As I said before, we've also been really speaking with the youth who are currently in the program, getting lifetime feedback. We've had an opportunity to speak with youth who had been at DJJ previously to incorporate their feedback. We also conducted various community forums. We had some that were open to the general public. We also made sure that we had forums that were conducted in Spanish and also focused for young adults who potentially would have shared life experience to provide feedback. These focus groups were, were in collaboration with the Behavioral Health Department. They were hosted by the MIG group and we had approximately 150 people participate. Additionally, um, at, in October, we had the Burns Institute and the National Center for Youth Law. They hosted a community engagement session via Zoom to discuss the draft plan with youth community stakeholders and advocates, and they provided those findings to the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council at the end of October, and that feedback was integrated into the plan. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the body that works with this. Under the legislation, we do have what's called the Juvenile Justice Realignment Subcommittee, and we have had a very uh, numerous meetings. Meetings of the subcommittee are public, the agendas can be accessed through the County of Santa Clara County meeting portal. All meetings are held via Zoom currently, and the meeting links are posted on the probation website, in addition to the county meeting portal. Additionally, the probation department, we have a web page dedicated to the implementation of the new program where community members or other partners can also find information. Let's talk a little bit about the purpose of the program. So it's very different than what we're talking about with the ranch in terms of the, the youth who are being served. The intent of this particular program is to provide a therapeutic healing environment where youth can build and strengthen resilience and protective factors. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these youth and some of the challenges that they face in a little bit. It's important first though, to tell you what are the four program values that we are focused on during this work with the youth. These values were developed from feedback from youth via forums and also feedback from community partners and approved by the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council. And those program values are community, integrity, love, and respect. We try to bring those forward in all of our meetings. We try to lead with those in our discussions. And we try to remember that those are the core values as we're working through this plan and implementing the program. The state provided a plan template and the counties are required to follow this template. There are eight sections to that plan. And today the presentation will be organized by those sections so that you can flow along if you have the actual plan printed out. Um, and so you'll see that that's the organization of today's presentation. 
The legislation requires each county to add a subcommittee to their juvenile justice coordinating council to oversee the plan related to the local SB 823 program. You'll see here on this slide, these are the people who are currently serving on the subcommittee. The subcommittee composition was defined by the legislation and the county was able to double the minimum required community members. And we're actually fortunate to have two youth who have volunteered to serve on the committee. They've actually been incredibly helpful and we're incredibly grateful for the contributions. They've actually provided some really meaningful information back to us. So let's talk about the target population of this program. We're really looking at youth who have very high complex needs who are 14 and older. These youth are found to be wards of the court based upon their most serious, the most recent serious offense. We call them 707B offenses. And on the next slide, I'm gonna go through some examples to explain what those offenses are. In order to be eligible for this program, the court must find that a less restrictive alternative is not appropriate for the youth and set a baseline and maximum term of commitment. Youth whose cases originate in juvenile court can remain in a juvenile facility until age 25 with limited exceptions. So something to keep in mind is the probation department can petition the juvenile court to transfer a youth who's age 19 and older to an adult facility. It's important to note that most of the youth adjudicated for 707B offenses in our county are currently committed to the county's William F. James Ranch, also referred to as the James Ranch. And the intent of the plan for the new SB 823 program is to maintain that practice and only recommend commitments to the new program for youth who would have previously been recommended for commitment to DJJ. We really wanna ensure that we are not net widening and we are not putting youth in, in a higher level program than we need to. So let's talk about um, examples of 707B offenses. This is probably really helpful for our members of the community who are listening in today. So for reference, um, the, the, the offenses that you see on the slide are referred to in practice as 707B offenses. In a little bit, I'm gonna be presenting what are the offenses look like for youth who are currently at the DJJ program at the state so that you kind of have a general idea of the offenses that we'll be looking at for youth locally. So just for comparison, this is information that are on youth who've actually gone to DJJ, which is the state program. And what you'll see that between January 1st of 2015 and December 30th of 2020, 64 duplicated youth were placed at DJJ. Most of the youth are male and Latino. Only a, only a small percentage of them um, had previous ranch history and 13 of those who left the ranch actually left successfully. For 30 youth who exited DJJ during the timeframe of this data, the average length of time was two years. And so you'll see, if you look at the timeline, you can see the number of youth who were committed to DJJ by year. And what's really interesting is during this time, um, we only had six girls who were committed to DJJ during this time frame. And during the same time period, there was an average of 10 girls committed to the ranch program and juvenile hall respectively. However, that doesn't negate the need for special programming for girls in our custody, and which will be discussed in the program section of the plan, along with the probation's partnership with Vera's Institute their initiative to end girls incarceration, which has been very successful in our county and contributed to the low number of commitments in custodial settings. It's also really important to note that on average between 13 and 15% of youth in custodial settings are LGBTQ and or gender non-conforming. And the program will continue the county's efforts to be sensitive and responsive to the needs of these youth. So this slide is to give you an example. These are the offenses of youth who are currently at DJ, DJJ, which is at the state facility. And of the 30 youth who are currently there, you'll see that 33% are there for offenses such as murder or attempted murder. Eight are there for carjacking, four are there for robbery. And then you'll see the rest are there for a variety of offenses. From this list, you can see that the offenses that we're dealing with are very um, significant in nature. And a lot of these youth have had multiple years of trauma and complex needs that need to be addressed. This is information that we gather from our risk, need, and responsivity assessment here within probation. And it's to really give you an idea of the challenges these youth are facing. You'll see that a lot of our youth have significant behavioral health needs. They struggle with pro-social relationships. There are family issues that need support. We also have youth that, some youth that have substance use issues that are connected to their, their offenses. We have some issues with school um, and caregiver supervision. 
And so our focus for the program funding and services is really focused on the most prominent needs that youth have. How do we offer them the coping skills and the resiliency that they need in order to be successful once they're released back into the home communities? For these reasons, our program is really being um, focused on our collaboration with behavioral health. They're such an essential part of success for these youth. And we're really gonna have a huge focus on family and caregiver connections. I'd like to now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Grace, who's really gonna share more about the program interventions and services. Thank you, Holly. So as previously mentioned, the purpose of the program is to provide a therapeutic trauma-informed environment. Many, if not all the youth currently in custody have had traumatic experiences. We are dedicated to providing care that is trauma-informed and embrace the core guiding principles, which include understanding trauma and stress, compassion and dependability, uh, safety and stability, collaboration and empowerment, cultural humility and equity, and resilience and recovery. By practicing the core principles and providing services with the healing perspective, we can promote a climate and culture of wellness cultivated for youth, family members, and staff. Next slide, please. Additionally, gender responsive and cultural services are offered to all youth. Listed on the slide are just some of the services we currently provide. The Young Women's Freedom Center and Girl Scouts are specific programming offered to our girls. The probation department has other enrichment program opportunities that continue to be developed in coordination with our uh, partners. Services will be provided in a culturally responsive manner to be developed in coordination um, that is a culturally responsive um, to the entire population, demonstrating fair and equitable practices for participants with diverse identities, including gender, age, uh, religion, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. Next slide. There will be four educational and vocational pathways that are offered to youth. The county is working with multiple partners, um, San Jose City College, Foothill, De Anza, to name a few, to develop different opportunities. The four pathways are outlined here, and I just wanna point out that these pathways may be completed simultaneously depending on the youth needs and interest. Each youth will be supported through a partnership with the County Office of Education to develop an education plan that's inclusive of high school diploma and college or career pathways. For example, we have a youth who's about 50 credits shy from obtaining his high school diploma. He shared an interest in learning more about his culture and heritage. So our County Office of Education counselor assisted him with enrollment in a Mexican American history class through San Jose City College. The youth is ecstatic because not only is he learning about his heritage, but is also earning credits as he continues to work towards his high school diploma. Next slide. So there are several vocational uh, elective problem, uh, programs offered. Some programs offer certification within 12 months, such as culinary, uh, pro computer programming, pet grooming, and personal training. Other programs take more than a year to complete the certification process, which uh, include auto body or mechanic, barber program, and clean energy. Next slide. In addition to the vocation and educational services, youth are offered a wide array of uh, enrichment activities and supportive services. These programs will be available to all the youth in juvenile hall, um, specifically the secure youth treatment um, youth. And these activities were developed with feedback from the youth in juvenile hall on their interest uh, feedback from stakeholder forums and research on evidence-based practices. Other enrichment program opportunities will be developed in coordination with our partners. Our current uh, Secure Track youth have begun the music production program and they're really enjoying it. Um, both youth and staff are excited about the programs and services that are underway. Next slide. Behavioral health management system. So this level system is based on the evidence-based practice, uh, positive behavioral interventions and supports, we call it PBIS. Um, it allows for youth to learn coping skills through positive uh, reinforcement. Through this system, youth are provided with a seamless transition into our secure track uh, facility, and the youth are given incentives and goal setting um, that are done at every level, regardless of the commitment time. A key component of this behavioral health management system is that it increases collaboration, goal setting between the youth and the staff using consistent progress reporting. 
and progression through the level system will require that each youth um, is actively engaged. Next slide. While we all agree that it's imperative that we assist the youth in rehabilitation and successfully reintegrating into the community, we must not forget the victims of the offenses. Um, victim or survivors are connected to an advocate that informs them of their rights, bridges them to different uh, system officials and links them to services for ongoing emotional support. Also provide uh, restorative justice services such as victim awareness workshops, victim offender mediation and healing circles. These offer opportunities and spaces that allow for healing for both the victim and the offender. Next slide. So existing enrichment programming and services are available through our, our MAC Center, our Multi-Agency Assessment Center, um, that will also be accessible to our Secure Track youth. Uh, procurement for additional programs and services will occur as the gaps are being identified. Uh, but most likely in the fiscal year of 2023 and 24, RFBPs will be released. Um, however, in the meantime, off cycle procurements are possible to meet um, some more emergent needs. Next slide. So the juvenile justice realignment block grant funds will be used to augment behavioral health staff to support the operations of the facility. These include the program manager one, a clinician, rehabilitation counselor, and psychosocial occupational therapist. Um, we've obviously filled the program manager one position, but I'm also excited to announce we have filled the uh, rehab counselor position, and we're actively recruiting, recruiting for the uh, clinician and occupational therapist. Next slide. So the Behavioral Health Services Department will continue to conduct comprehensive screenings and assessments that include a behavioral risk assessment and integrated assessment, which includes both substance use and mental health. The assessments will include the youth needs, uh, strengths, trauma history, readiness for change, safety, and assessment for cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms. Part of the assessment process includes partnering with our team psychiatrist to determine any potential benefits of psychotropic medication. One of the practices that we're using is the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, uh, UCCI, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Interventions. This approach will teach youth strategies to manage risk factors in a way that is developmentally appropriate. This includes the implementation of groups that are co-facilitated by behavioral health and probation, um, and, probation um, and also include individual sessions with the group counselors. We're also utilizing Bruce Perry's uh, neurosequential model as part of the assessment and clinical care planning process. Not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Bruce Perry, but he just wrote a book called What Happened to You? He's done a lot of great work in this developmental neurobiological approach to clinical work. Our behavioral health staff have begun training on the neurosequential model. The assessment looks at uh, developmental risk, adversity and resiliency, uh, neurodevelopmental needs and strengths, and provides treatment considerations uh, to guide clinical work through a trauma-informed lens. The neurosequential model considers brain development, relational and cultural connections into the assessment process and supports intervention planning that's culturally sensitive and developmentally appropriate. Individual therapy continues to be provided using a psychodynamic and behavioral therapies and will include evidence-based practice models such as motivational interviewing, interpersonal psychotherapy, um, seven challenges, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and uh, CBT. The youth will continue to meet with their current behavioral health therapist to ensure a continuum of care. Additionally, family-based interventions using multidimensional family therapy will be provided by the therapist to support uh, strong family connections and relationships, as well as offer family or caregiver support. Young parent support will be an integral part of behavioral health services for youth and young adults as well. Sexual behavioral health treatment, uh, sexual behavior treatment services will be delivered by a contracted provider. And lastly, our behavioral health clinicians will continue to provide substance use and mental health care based on screening and assessment. Next slide. So the youth and family engagement begins from the moment the youth is committed. Within the first 48 hours of commitment, um, the program manager, uh, myself, and the rehab counselor connect with the youth to provide overview of the program, 
explained the child and family uh, team meeting process, obtain releases of information, identify uh, family or natural supports, explain the individualized rehabilitation plan or the IRP process, and discuss the transfer to the secure track unit. Within the first 72 hours, the entry, the re-entry support counselor meets with the youth to conduct vocational assessments and reviews the educational and vocational track opportunities. The assigned group counselor and supervising group counselor will also meet with the youth during this time period to provide an overview, uh, review unit expectations and uh, brief orientation. I then contact the family and the supports that the youth have identified to introduce myself, uh, explain the process, explain the individual rehabilitation plan, and schedule the, the CFT or the child and family team meetings around their availability. Within one week of the commitment, the first CFT is held, and then by the 15th day, we have another CFT. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, the CFT team is ready. Pardon, pardon the interruption. I just want to get a time check. How many remaining slides do you have? Um, not that many. Uh, we have about maybe five or six, if I'm not mistaken. We have five slides left. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so again, the CFT is created in support of the youth. The entire CFT process is youth-centered where the family and um, supports are asked to provide input. As a facilitator, I emphasize to the youth and family the importance of expressing their needs because they're a part, they're, they're the experts really of their lives. And although the professionals at the table have conducted their assessments based on their respective fields and have given their recommendations, ultimately the youth and family know exactly what they need. And it's because of this that the CFT is an imperative collaborative effort. This process ensures transparency and accountability. The youth, parent, and family voice and choice are assured throughout the entire process. Some of the feedback that we've already received from the youth and caregivers is that they're extremely grateful for the meetings as they've allowed an opportunity for them to receive information, ask questions, and partake in the development of their rehab plan. Parents have expressed a deep um, appreciation for the many opportunities offered to their son and the chance that they have been given to change their lives. So next I'll hand it over to Holly who will speak about the facility. Great, thank you. As part of Senate Bill 823, there was a, a small pocket of money that was set aside to award one-time grants to counties for the purpose of providing re resources for infrastructure-related needs and improvements to assist counties in the development of a local continuum of care. The probation department applied for and was awarded $356,000 to address the confinement of youth um, and what you'll see is this competitive grant is, is going to allow the county to soften the look and feel of the designated living environments within the juvenile hall to the extent feasible. None of the juvenile justice realignment block grants were earmarked for renovations in juvenile hall. Um, but what we are planning to do is really consider a trauma informed design. And so what you'll see on the slide are photos that represent some of the ideas and examples from the architectural design firm of what could be implemented in juvenile hall. All youth will have single occupancy rooms. There'll be an expanded lounge and relaxation area. They'll have their own classroom. There'll even be a room for specific behavioral health services with privacy, um, where it's a warm, safe, comfortable environment, a wellness room, um, having a visiting family room, and to do some modifications for the outdoor areas. And what you'll see, it'll have a very dorm-like feel. Um, and we're also really excited. We've gotten some early feedback from youth um, who are currently there. And what you'll see is these are pictures currently from Juvenile Hall to give you an idea of the attempts to kind of repurpose Juvenile Hall. As you know, since we are, um, is currently the only facility available due to the bond situation, we are, have done some really um, great things with the particular space. And some of the feedback, early feedback we got from youth was more sense of autonomy, really, for example, having access to snacks and drinks when they're hungry and not waiting for certain times. So the staff in Juvenile Hall and, and Behavioral Health have, have created this little kitchenette where youth have open access to drinks and snacks. They're out of their, their rooms almost all day long, um, really interacting and, and being supported and integrated by staff inside the facility. One of the important things about this initiative is really collecting good information and being able to have it data-driven 
to get not only that qualitative voice from youth, but also to track outcomes. What we're using for this particular project is the results-based accountability framework. So we're gonna be looking at how much was done, how well did we do it, and are the people that we serve better off? We will be collecting typical program information that you would, you would expect for us to collect regarding demographics, case information, looking at MFTs, CFTs, looking at assessment data, um, are youth meeting their goals? How are they progressing through program phases? Looking at dosage information regards to all the intervention programs. But in addition to the outcome measures required by the Welfare and Institutions Code, we're also committing to looking at information that will look at three key things. We wanna ensure there are no net widening impacts and commitments to the local program compared to the commitments to DJJ. We also wanna protect against any increase in adult court prosecutions of youth in the county. And finally, we wanna ensure that, any, that we, we monitor any racial and ethnic disparities to try to reduce the impact um, of youth of color compared to white youth. And we're very committed to the, those three data points and work closely with the JJC to present information when available. Specific outcomes. So this was actually a quote from one of our stakeholders, which I think is very important when we talk about outcomes, is that everyone is someone's child. And we all look at this again, we go back to our four pillars, um, four values that we talked about before. You'll see those reflected in the outcomes that the group has, has kind of committed to. The first one is youth have a sense of hope for their future and they feel valued. Strength in family and natural support relationships, improved housing safety and stability, reduction in new offenses, improvement in well being and the reduction in trauma related issues, improved school and meaningful and sustainable employment, and changes within system partners, holding ourselves accountable to see where we can do better and what's working. Next steps um, the probation department is here today to present to the Board of Supervisors so you have the needed information when making funding allocations and other related decision points. We will go back to the JJC subcommittee in November. The plan is due to OICR the 1st of January 2022. And then after the plan is submitted, the probation department is committed to a collaborative inclusive process to work towards the development of a long term plan and looking at various options for step down models to a less restrictive facility or placement as appropriate for the youth in our care. And now we'll have an opportunity to answer any questions. And everybody, just Thank for you. the record, I'm, I'm back, um, but I'd like Super, uh, Vice President Ellenberg to please continue running the meetings as my present may, presence may be intermittent. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, President Wasserman, uh, thank you all so much for, for the report. This, this really is um, a dramatically new, new direction for our county. I want to thank Chief Garnett and, and her staff for the very comprehensive presentation. And, and thank you, Chief, as well, for continuing to center directly impacted kids and visiting with them to, to solicit direct input. This is exactly, I think, the best, the best approach we could, we could ask for. And I know that we've been in this together since the governor signed SB 823 a little over a year ago. And just want to reiterate again that I'm very grateful for our partnership as I've been working on the DJJ realignment at the California State Association of Counties uh, as our board representative. So thank you for the report. I don't have questions today, but glad to turn to my colleagues. Supervisor Chavez. Um, I would just want to say thank you. I know we have a couple public speakers, but I, I just wanted to say very sincere thank you for the work. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? If not, we'll go to the public, please. First speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Sickle from the Horseshoe. Um, I spent from 79 to 85 um, in and out of juvenile hall. I, may, I never made it to uh, YA or, or to the uh, Boys Ranch. But I, I have to tell you that whoever, somebody was listening, you, 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 you're, you're getting it. And, and the way that you set it up, the, the very humane environment, to where the person doesn't feel like 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 they're being punished, you know these are kids, you know they're 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 coming in saddled with 
all of these kinds of issues that you know have have generational impacts and 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 to have that compounded in my generation by like there was something inherently wrong with us we didn't have the kinds of programs that you have outlined here and just i cannot thank uh whoever designed these programs enough for the humane approach that you took thank you next speaker is andrew please accept the unmute to begin speaking hi can you hear me yes Hi, my name is uh, Andrew Bigelow, uh, organizer of Silicon Valley Debug uh, and work with families who have loved ones who go through the juvenile system. Um, uh, we are uh, participate and have been actively participating in the A23 subcommittee and the working groups. Um, uh, I know the board is not making a decision, but want to plant the seed that uh, you know, we, we're asking for the board to reject this plan and, and ask the subcommittee to come back with a temporary plan that does not involve juvenile hall. Uh, we acknowledge the time constraints because uh, DJJ stopped intake, um, but this subcommittee has been meeting for over six months um, and there's been enough time to come up with a temporary immediate solution that did not involve juvenile hall. Um, and here we are. Uh, the community has been very clear um, about uh, not wanting to use that facility um, and for that to not be the floor. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't seem to have um, have been incorporated into this plan. Next speaker is Ron Hansen. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon, supervisors. Um, I want to compliment uh, probation, uh, the community partners that have worked with uh, with the subcommittee, as well as the all the others in the juvenile justice uh, um, legal system, uh, the, the court, uh, the, the public defender's office, and the DA's office for putting together uh, a what I believe to be a very strong program uh, that will serve the needs of the youth that uh, are committed there and uh, that this is not the end, this is the beginning. And uh, I look forward to, um, to looking at this program again uh, as it matures. Thanks for, so much for your work. The next speaker is Sparky Harlan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO, Bill Wilson Center. As we have the conversation about not building the new jail, I think you all are going to know that for almost 40 years, I've been trying to reduce population in juvenile hall, not increase it. And even though it might look nicer on the inside, it's still a jail. There's still four walls that kids cannot get out of. Kids are still suicidal when they're locked up in jail more than 24 hours. So I really beg you to consider more alternatives than just making juvenile hall, quote, trauma informed and to look better. We need more community alternatives, including more residential alternatives. Please don't just accept more jail for our young people. Thank you. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Victor Vasquez at Somos Mayfair. Um, our families participated in some of these input sessions. It was clear from our perspective that young people should not be involved in any kind of jail or policing intervention at this point. We believe that racism and injustice and unjust policies create the conditions for incarceration. It leads to criminalized behavior when someone is hungry, poor, struggling, being displaced. You have feelings and those feelings could become self-blame or we are put in a position that we must um, take action by any means to, to survive. And so when that happens, solutions like, like jails, like involving the police are normalized and we end up suffering. Um, in our neighborhoods. So we believe that some of these elements are great. We should be working with the city and the count and you all to make sure that we have many youth centers, many interventions uh, for young people outside of the streets, no jails. Next speaker is Marty Estrada. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. I think the key word is less restrictive programming. That's according to the law, SBA 28, if you look at it. Uh, it doesn't mean there has to be juvenile hall. Juvenile hall is not set up or meant to house youth long-term. 
Judge Lucero and her colleagues also supported through a letter that she does not support long-term housing at Juvenile Hall. We needed to come up with different solutions. What was presented to the state of California was just a placeholder. It was not set in stone. This is a working document. We gotta, we gotta find other resources, other placements for kids instead of Juvenile Hall. And, and if you look at trauma-informed lands, juvenile hall is not the right placement for youth. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Alex. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So having worked with youth involved in both DFCS, so child welfare, and the juvenile justice system for almost four years, I feel like this is something where we have a truly amazing opportunity to completely redefine what juvenile justice can look like. In the short time getting to attend some of the um, meetings around this topic and working directly with families and community providers, well, it is heartening to see that we've added many more community stakeholders and families to these discussions. What I'm really seeing and hearing is we need to have an overbalance of community members versus professional stakeholders in determining what this could really look like. Um, really getting outside of the system to redefine what juvenile justice looks like from a community and, and family standpoint. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Walter Wilson. I'm um, a chair of the county CCLEM, but I'm speaking specifically for myself. And, you know, it's almost as though the people who created these great programs and did all this work to put together these, these far reaching brand new ideas didn't listen to the community. And that's unfortunate because if they had, they wouldn't have not included juvenile hall, that facility in this process. And it's unfortunate because there's so much good that's come out of that will come out of the work that they're talking about doing. But the deal is juvenile hall is not a place where we want to put our children if you plan on having anything positive come out of it. Because the deal is a pig is still a pig. I don't care if you put lipstick on it. And that's the case here. We 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 cannot have our children in that facility. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lori Valdez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Lori Valdez um, with the Just for Josiah, and I'm calling to ask the Board of Supervisors to not um, think about doing another juvenile hall. Our children deserve better. Where we need trauma-informed is in our schools. Before they get there, our teachers need to know how to recognize trauma so they're not funneling these kids to the school-to-prison pipeline. We have to get them when it first starts and we have to do the interventions before it gets to that point. When it gets to that point, you're just adding more trauma to these children because they don't deserve to be treated like animals locked up in cages. They're children, they're somebody's children and the people who are there supposed to be watching them, they're abusing the children, forcing them to do things, come out of their rooms, that if a parent was to do that, it would be child abuse. But because the state says it's okay, it's not child abuse, but it is. So please think about the children before they go there. Don't lock them up. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Are there um, further additional comments from supervisors? And if not, um, I will turn to Supervisor Chavez who pulled this off of consent for any final comments and or a motion. Um, I, I move that we receive all three reports with our gratitude to the staff. And, you know, I, I um, so anyway, that'd be a motion and then I'll make a quick comment. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And my only quick comment is that um, I think that, you know, we're going to be, I, I think it's going to be really critical that we get an opportunity to um, have success in this environment and move creatively from here. Um, I want to thank um, you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for really, you know, taking, taking a look at how this can be um, something that is really reflective of our community values. And, you know, I, I did hear all the speakers. I, I just want to reinforce that these are um, young people who've committed 
relatively serious crimes. And so I, I think that starting where we're starting is actually a very, very good place. So thank you. I will just then add to that before I, I call a vote. Um, I don't think any of us want to see children confined um, in, in these very prescriptive ways. One of the things that I am extraordinarily concerned about is not having uh, children sentenced to adult prison. And a, a very substantial risk exists that if we do not have a local secure track facility that meets the expectations, frankly, of the district attorney in the court, then they are, I, I can't say likely, I won't speak for them, but, but their conclusion may be then to send the kids to adult prison, which is an absolutely unacceptable um, outcome in my view. So I think what we're trying to do here is really um, mitigate harm to the greatest extent possible. I'll note that we need to have the plan submitted by January, but that it can be reviewed and amended uh, at any time. So I appreciate the work of staff. I appreciate um, my colleagues and all of the, the members of the public who, who weighed in today. You're, you're not wrong uh, in my view, in the supervisor's view. So um, with that, let's uh, do a roll call, please. I'd like to confirm that the motion is to receive the report from the probation department to approve the request for the appropriation modification and to ratify the attestation form for the County of Santa Clara signed by the County Executive? Yes. Great, thank you. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more items uh, to go through before we begin the, the conversation around item 13, which is redistricting. Uh, these two items have been removed by consent by Supervisor Chavez. So let me turn to you for item uh, 73, which is adoption of an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors uh, amending chapter nine of division B11 of title B of the County of Santa Clara ordinance code relating to garbage and refuse. And Vice President Vice Ellenberg, if you don't mind, I'd like to re retain, get back. You got it. Take <laughs> the gavel, chair, sir. My chairmanship for now. And um, I appreciate you standing, uh, standing by. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. This was actually pulled by Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, if staff is available, I pulled these items because I have three questions slash concerns that I want to raise publicly. Um, as I understand it, essentially staff has said, uh, we have some new legislation from the state regarding um, waste management, garbage, uh, and uh, we need to have ordinances in place to conform to that state uh, mandate uh, let me just ask uh, who's the right person to address my questions to and also to confirm that my understanding is correct about why we're uh, being asked to head down this path. Uh, Joe Santa, head of the SEPA, is the right person to ask. Welcome, Joe. Good uh, afternoon, supervisors. Hi. I'm here hi. to ask a question. I, we also have a county council here uh, for to answer some of the legal. Thanks, Ms. Um, my. I've got three three concerns. The first is, it sounds like we are now going to have people rummaging through uh, other people's garbage, which raises some privacy concerns. It also um, it gave me some comfort to know that there was a plan to provide notice to customers of uh, some changes in the requirements for customers. But candidly, we've struggled with notice in the past as a county and only to discover that what staff thought was adequate notice um, wasn't sufficient to really get the word out. People still felt blindsided, even though we had met the technical requirements of providing notice. And the third piece is, I understand that there's no expectation of a cost increase, but if we're asking our waste haulers to do something differently or new than they've done in the past, 
My recollection is that there's a provision in their contract that allows them to say we're entitled to more money. And I'm remembering that when uh, we had a change in uh, recycling uh, practices as a result of change behavior by China, all of a sudden our board had uh, a higher rate in front of us. So my first question is privacy related. Who's going to be rummaging through whose who's garbage? Could we just get that part out there straight? Yeah, certainly. Um, so this is uh, Joe Zintek with the Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency. The state law uh, requires that uh, the local jurisdiction, and for, this is pertaining to unincorporated county, which is about 16,000 residential customers and about 500 businesses county th throughout unincorporated all districts. Uh, the state law requires um, that uh, we provide uh, services for organic waste collection, which is basically uh, things that rot food paper to get that organic waste out of the landfill uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas methane. Um, the, it requires a monitoring program. All local governments have to have a monitoring program. In this case, um, uh, the standard monitoring program is for uh, the local government to um, review 10% of the customers every year to make sure that they're uh, getting the organic material out of their garbage cart and putting it in one of their other two carts they have uh, that would uh, recycle the material. Um, so we're required to do 10% of the customers in uh, uh, calendar year 2022. And I, as you mentioned, um, for uh, this would largely be lid flipping of the garbage cart out after it is set out for collection. It would be done um, at least the first year by county staff in SEPA. The, uh, if um, we're able to get 90% of residential and commercial customers with organic waste service, we can uh, request the state to stop doing the more um, uh, customer by customer assessment in 2023. And we're well underway to be able to do that already. Uh, all, all residential customers have access to organic waste collection already now. They've had it since the beginning of these contracts. So um, that's already in place. So that's 100% of residential. And then we're well underway of getting the commercial customers subscribed. So after 2022, we'll ask the state to go to a more route level monitoring system, which does not require us to go customer by customer to to flip garbage lids and look inside and see if they have material in there. Yes. Let me just uh, ask you to pause there so I can uh, drill down on that. Uh, so if we have to monitor, uh, which I think is um, another word for look inside somebody's garbage pail, yes? Yes. Uh, then 10% uh, of 16,000 is 1,600 uh, residences. So does that mean that county staff will be uh, forgive my phrase, poking around inside 1,600 garbage cans and 1,600 residences, looking to see whether or not the residents have properly complied with the uh, organic uh, waste uh, directive? Yes, we're not going to be moving the stuff in the cart. We're going to be opening it up and looking what it looks like on the top and then using that for education. And I, after the first year, we're well underway to go to the less invasive um, uh, component of the law where we can do it on a more route basis and don't have to go house by house. But the first year, there's no out for that house by house look. So, so if somebody went to, if one of our team uh, from uh, the county, from uh, SIPA went to a residence, and found organic waste in the garbage can. Uh, I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, coffee grounds and eggshells, for example, are organic waste, yes? Yes. Okay, and if they're in the garbage can, uh, what happens to the offending homeowner? We would just leave them a note saying that, uh, reminding them of the law and asking them to put the material in either the recycling cart or the yard waste cart. Okay, and what happens if week after week they decline and they continue to throw out their uh, organic waste in their garbage can? We would just, all we're doing is education and behavioral change. So we do not need to enforce 
that part of the law, but we're requiring we're required to do the monitoring and to do the education. And fortunately, every city's in the same boat, so we'll be sharing a lot of material and and hopefully doing a being able to standardize some of that messaging across okay. the county and the. So you know, I know as much as you encourage people to shred their documents and exercise care. You know, I think most people have the expectation that once they throw something in the garbage, nobody's going to be rummaging around through it and looking at it. Um, do we have any privacy directive directives for your staff that say, hey, while you're there reading other people's mail, for example, or uh, financial documents is uh, not allowed, prohibited, anything we can or are already doing to make sure yeah. that people are privacy sensitive? Certainly. I mean, already uh, most people recycle, use the put, separate their paper and put it in the um, the recycling cart that they already have. And the way people typically protect their private is either they sh they tear the, uh, the paper uh, to get rid of their address or confidential information, or they um, uh, mark the material out. So uh, that's how people typically do that, that have been recycling paper in the recycling cart. Our staff uh, will be instructed not to read that thing, but all they're really doing is opening the top of the cart and seeing what they see from the top. So they won't be touching the material. They won't be reading the material. They'll just uh, be doing that quick look. Thank you. I'll move on to the next uh, piece of my question, which is my understanding is that there's a plan to send out, is it one notice or is it more than that? Yeah, we've already been notifying customers of the change. For residential customers, there, there is no service change. So they, it's the three carts. That system is already compliant with the new state law. Um, uh, so they, they won't be sorting the material differently uh, from, from, for uh, going forward, except for the issue of the organic waste that they're putting in their garbage cart needs to either go in the recycling cart or the yard waste cart. So there's no service change for them. So it's really just that very um, uh, specific behavior change of put it in the yard waste cart or the recycling cart if it's clean paper. I can just tell you that uh, if I were to glance out a front window and I don't think I'm unique or unusual in this regard, uh, and suddenly saw people rummaging through my uh, garbage uh, or inspecting my garbage uh, from the government, I'd sort of say, what on earth is going on? Uh, and with 1,600 folks, I think you're going to have some folks who uh, think, what on earth is going on? So um, I'll come back to that in a moment, Mr. Mr. Chair. And then um, what, is, what, if anything, uh, are the obligations on the waste haulers themselves uh, or are there none really in this instance? There's none in this instance. They provide all the compliance services are already in their base contract. So they're, there's, they're not providing any additional services. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chair, I, um, I have answers to the questions I wanted to ask. Thank you, Ms. Intec. I'm going to abstain on today's items. I have concerns about privacy implications, notwithstanding the fact that this is a state mandate. Uh, I do want to encourage um, the staff to make sure they have some sort of written formal privacy directive that they can say that they have truthfully say that they have shared with uh, the county staff who's involved in this process. I also want to encourage staff to uh, step up the noticing efforts. I just think with the, uh, all the noise in the background, uh, folks are not um, likely to process this information if it's tucked in the middle of a newsletter or a card about other issues. Um, and I think we know from experience that uh, as much as it may seem a relatively pedestrian activity, garbage pickup is something people take sort of seriously. They think of it as a core service and uh, they react when uh, things don't go according to expectations. So with that, I'll be uh, an abstention today, mostly as a way to register my concern that we get this right and not create a problem for ourselves during the course of the coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Do I have any other comments or a motion? Um, James, can we put 73 and 74 together or because they're ordinances, we do them separately, I presume? You can take them in one motion to approve okay. both 73 and 74. Okay, thank you. Nancy, could you please let our speaker in and then we'll take, uh, we'll consider taking both in one motion. 
Actually, Supervisor Osman, I'm ready to make a motion to uh, for both uh, 73 and 74 to adopt the ordinance. Okay, we'll take the motion from Supervisor Lee first, and I'll look for a second, and then we'll turn to our speaker. Do I have a second? I'll if second. A second by Ellenberg, thank you. And now, Nancy, if you'll let our speaker in, please. Our next speaker is Kimmy. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Kimmy, can you please unmute yourself? And Kimmy is not responding, and that is our only speaker. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Lee, a second by Ellenberg for the adoption of the ordinance in 73, the adoption of the ordinance in 74. They were introduced, the reading, I'll say, was waived. Uh, preliminary adoption is today. Final adoption is on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day for both. Nancy, please. Oh yeah, uh, may I make a comment, to President Wasserman? Sorry. Oh yes, of course. All right, I just wanna mention that this item has been heard through the uh, RWRC and the change will help them in the incorporated area falls in line with the requirements of the SB 1383 to divert organic waste from our landfills. Uh, to achieve this, our staff with the, within the Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency, specifically the Recycling Waste Reduction Division, have been working with our existing franchise agreement vendors to implement these organic waste division by expanding the utilization of the green bins for both yard waste and organic food waste. The county is working with vendors to conduct on-site outreach for all tier one commercial edible food generators, such as supermarkets, grocery stores, food distributors, wholesale vendors, and institutional food service providers, of which there are approximately 20 within an incorporated uh, Santa Clara County, to make sure they have the appropriate containers of the initial streams and education so that they are able to comply with the new state requirements come January 2022. We have also reached out to all vendors to make sure that uh, appropriate language specific outreach and services are available so that all population are able to better understand the new requirements. Currently, the the, all the data compilation that's required to produce the required reporting information for cow recycle is being handled by John Venture, who is a contracted agent handling this project and is handed over to county staff to transmit to cow recycle. And this is only at the educational phase right now, and there won't be enforcement phase for at least another year. I just want to make that comment and thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent report. Whoever appointed you to the Recycling and Waste Commission, really knew what they were doing. And uh, with that, Nancy, if you'll please uh, call for the vote. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Abstain. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Westerman? Yes, as well. Thank you very much. Nancy, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. That leaves us with item number 13. You see that? That, that is correct. All right, everybody, we're taking a five minute break right now. I will see you in five minutes and uh, then we'll address 13. Thank you. Recording stopped. Oh.
All righty, how are we doing here? Supervisors Lee, Chavez, Ellenberg, Smitty, and Wasserman makes for a full house. Thank you very much. Nancy, please take a roll call. Recording in progress. Nancy, please take a roll call vote to reestablish our quorum. Supervisor Lee? Present. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Ellenberg? I'm here. And President Wasserman. Thank you. Here as well. Appreciate that, everybody. Welcome back. Anybody wishing to speak on this item, um, please go ahead and register electronically. Um, in the meantime, I will turn to staff. I'm assuming Melanie. Let me look around here on my screen. So since this is a public hearing, possible actions you can have Okay, we're gonna receive the report first from the Office of the County Executive. There is Melanie Jimenez Perez. And then we will open the public hearing and receive testimony and we'll go from there. Melanie, welcome. Thank you, President Wasserman. And my colleague, Daniel Christian, will be starting the presentation. Hey, Daniel. Good afternoon, board members. Um, Danielle Christian, Legislative Manager. Ad administration and the county's consultants redistricting partners will jointly present draft redistricting plans today. While there are six draft maps in your agenda packet, we will be highlighting three this afternoon. The yellow plan first refinement, purple plan first refinement, EE 2.0 plan first refinement. Refinements were made to the three maps the board forwarded at its last meeting based on three criteria. Those criteria were lowering the deviation of the maps, maximizing received community of interest testimony and maximizing natural boundaries to draw the lines between districts. Redistricting partners will present each of the three maps I just mentioned to highlight the refinements that were made. Melanie Jimenez Perez will then highlight demographic information and specific neighborhoods in each map and also go over the next steps. Following the presentation, staff can pull up the maps to zoom in on specific areas if a board member would like. And now I'm going to ask Liz Stitt, project manager from redistricting partners to go over the draft maps with you. Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, let me just pull up my screen really fast. So as you can see, this is draft yellow redistricting plans. Uh, to give you a little bit about what makes this unique compared to the others, this one has Almaden Valley uh, neighborhood in San Jose in District 5. The Deridon station is split in two districts, District 2 and 4. Evergreen neighborhood in San Jose is split into two districts. So it's in District 1 and District 3. Willow Glen neighborhood in San Jose ends at Bird Avenue. And then District 3's southern boundary is the furthest south of all district maps. Go ahead, go to the next slide. So I believe this one has the largest deviation. It is at 7.2%. The API citizen voting age population um, for District 3 is 50.1%. And then the highest Latino influence district is District 2 at 49.7%. We also see three city and census designated place splits. So uh, in District 2 and District 3, there's a split uh, of the East Foothills. San Excuse, Jose. Me, oh, yeah. Excuse, excuse me for interrupting. Um, it was my understanding when Melanie opened up, you're doing the refinement maps only. And it looks like you're doing the yellow map now, but not the refinement version. I can't, that is the next slide. So let's just go ahead and go into the next slide. Oh, right here. Uh, what, whatever, your, whatever your intent is, and Melanie, please correct me if I'm, I'm misstating. Are you doing the original and then the refinement of each or doing the refinement of each only? What, what is oh, I was doing the original and then refinement, but if we just want to do refinement, that's yes, if we can just pull up the original, but we'll actually present on the refinement, please. Excellent. Okay. 
So here in the refinement, you see a total deviation that's lower. It is at 5.2%. Uh, the API CVAP is at the same, so 50.1%. The Latino influence district is at 47.7%. And then there are four city and uh, CDP splits. So East Foothills in District 2 and District 3, Los Gatos uh, in District 1 and District 5, and then San Jose is in all districts. This is the same for every map that we're going to see. Um, and then unincorporated all five districts, and it splits four COI neighborhoods. Uh, Thank you. So we can just go through these pretty quickly, but happy to stop if you have any questions um, specific, specifically. Um, so here is the Southern District of the County. You can go to the next one. And then this is the predominantly San Jose District. And this one is the, um, sorry, if we can go back one more. So that would be the uh, Latino influence district. Go to the next slide. And then here we have um, the citizen voting age population for Asian um, voters, voting age folks. You have Sunnyvale, Milpitas, and it goes to east to the edge of the county. Next slide. And then we have Santa Clara and Campbell along with San Jose in District 4. Next slide. And then we have the Western portion of the county and you can see it goes down and past uh, Los Gatos. Uh, next slide. So now we're gonna get into the purple district, the purple plans. Go ahead, go to the next slide. So this is the original one, 2.6% uh, deviation, uh, CVAP, uh, API CVAP of 50.1%, a Latino influence district in District 2 of 44.5%. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here is the first refinement. The total deviation is at 5.2% here. And just a reminder to folks, the total devi deviation needs to be under 10%. Uh, so this is um, totally in line with that. We have an API CVAP uh, in District 3 of 50.1%. And then we have a Latino influence district in District 2 at 47.7%. And we see four city and census designated splits in district two, two and three with the East Foothills, Las Gatos in district one and five. San Jose again is split in all of them and then unincorporated in all five districts with four COI and neighborhood shifts. We wanna to go to the next slide. We can go through them a little bit more in detail. So here is the eastern, uh, southern portion of the county or District 1. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, here is the uh, predominantly San Jose district. And here we have a Latino CVAP uh, influence district. Uh, for District 3, however, this is where we have the uh, 50 plus uh, Asian CVAP. Um, so this encompasses Sunnyvale and Milpitas uh, and much of North San Jose. We'll go to the next slide. And then District 4, we have Santa Clara and Campbell along with San Jose. Looks, uh, this one in particular looks similar to the first one. And go to the next slide. And then this one goes much further south uh, compared to the yellow map. Uh, so this encompasses all of Palo Alto, Mountain View, Saratoga, Los Gatos, and uh, goes further than that. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then here is map three. So the uh, draft EE 2.0, 
plan. Let's go to the next slide. So we had a total deviation of 3.6% that will get lower. Um, perfect. Uh, so we have a total deviation of 1.2% now. So this is the lowest out of all the maps we are presenting today. Uh, we also have a Asian CVAP in District 3 of 50%. Um, so it is still a majority Asian seat. Uh, we also have a Latino influence district in District 2 at 49%. Uh, the, this splits uh, cities and uh, census designated places in two places. So again, San Jose is split amongst all five districts and then unincorporated is in all five districts as well. And this does split uh, two Koi's neighborhoods. So now we can look more uh, specifically at the districts. So this encompasses the Southern and Eastern portion of the county. Go to the next slide. This one is the seat that encompasses much of San Jose. And this is the uh, Latino um, influence district. So you can see that the Latino CVAP is at 39% here. Go to the next slide. And then here we see Sunnyvale again with Milpitas and North San Jose. Uh, and the uh, citizen voting age population for Latinos here is 39%. Um, I, that might be different. Uh, but anyway, go to the next slide. And then here we have Santa Clara and Campbell with San Jose in District 4. Go to the next slide. And then we have um, a District 5 that is um, much, uh, much closer to each other, um, much more compact. So you have Mountain View and Palo Alto, Cupertino and Saratoga together, uh, but Los Gatos is in District 1. And go to the next slide. So here, and Melanie, do you want to take over from here? Yes, thanks, Liz. Great. So good afternoon, President and members of the board. So this is our updated um, compilation of some of the key facts for all of the six maps that we just went through pretty quickly. And what we've also done here is to bold some of the key key factors that will help to inform um, how we move forward. And these are some good discussion points for us to start with. And as Liz showed you, we have achieved a 1.2% deviation for, for the EE 2.0 first refinement. Um, and we have a 50.2% with the EE 2.0, but still the highest Latino influence district is with the yellow map, which is at 49.7%. Um, so there's a lot of additional details that are in this spreadsheet that is attached to your report. So it'll explain when it says split districts, it'll tell you which districts have which cities so that you can get a sense of how those are. And we also have an attachment with the city population. So if you wanted to consider maybe unifying some of those cities that are split or CDPs that are split, I'm sorry, census designated places, you can see kind of what those numbers would be. So I wanna point out that there are some minor splits that are reflected in the other documents because this is a work in progress and these maps have been an iterative um, labor of love. So what was reflected here is really the intent of the commission and the staff as we're working quickly to try to make these updates. So if you do see some additional splits, it may be that there's four people that we accidentally left in a previous district, but we're working on fine tuning those as we go. So what would be helpful for us today is to really hear what are the communities of interest the board wants to ensure are kept together. And I wanna highlight before we move on to the next slide that as you're having those conversations, Evergreen, which is a neighborhood in the city of San Jose, is currently in a different option 
for each of the different plans. So you have three options of where to place evergreen, and those options are all different than the current alignment of where it is only in District 3. So those are some of the, the key details that we can continue to highlight for you, but the ones that are on this chart are those that have really um, come up a lot through the communities of interest testimony. But today we are hoping to continue to move forward and the board still has the opportunity to ask us to make new maps, refine maps, um, or even move them forward as they are. But um, we wanna hear if there is additional data that may assist you with um, making the next decision as we move forward. And if there are maybe some minimal city splits that, that you would be willing to consider because we worked, um, many hours to try and lower the deviation. And in some areas you will see some strange boundaries between districts. And that is because we try to maintain the integrity of the city boundaries as they currently exist. So if we were to continue to refine those, we may need to shave off some small tangents of cities that, um, that are currently in our map. And this is all to help us move forward to the December 15th final adoption by resolution. And our next scheduled meeting is December the 7th. So we are here today to bring up any of the maps to give you a sense of how those boundaries actually look. And we wanna just thank you for getting through all of these many documents and we are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Liz. Um, We'll consider that one done. I want to open the public hearing now, Nancy, and receive testimony regarding the draft redistricting plans. And the number I've got right now, let's let's do a minute each. But if this, okay, everybody waited. <laughs> That's funny. They wait until I say a minute each, and then they uh, they all jump on it. Um, Wasserman, you have muted yourself. Here we go. Unmuted now. Thank you very much. Um, let's go one minute each. And um, James, I'm going to put that number all the way up to 50. We're currently at 31, 33, 35. When I made the one minute announcement, we were at 19. And then when I did that, everybody jumped right on to, uh, to do that. So James, just for clarification, please. Um, we're at 38, 39 now. As far as me going to a different number, once we establish one number, must that be for everyone? Or can I say once we hit 50, it drops down to a, to a half, half a minute? My recommendation would be to um, allow a period of time for people to raise their hands, then close that and not have further signups after that point. Okay. Uh, so we are at 41 right now. And you know I think it's already been been a little while um and then i would just you know close new hands at that point sure i i appreciate that yep it's been okay it's been okay um it's been 18 minutes we'll do that let's just give nancy another 30 seconds here for anybody else to get on and then uh looks like we're stopping out right about there so nancy we're at 44 but let's let up to 50 people speak on this item. Why don't we get started? And uh, we'll do the one minute each. Great, thank you. First speaker is Isa. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, it is well known that Cindy is supporting Mayor Constantine from Morgan Hill, and Susan has endorsed Claudia Rossi. Labor's yellow map will be eliminating Constantine and Rosie's competition. Cindy and Susan, you should both strongly consider recusing yourself in this map decision next month. This ethics concern is spelled out in the county's ethics guideline, section A3-30, personal conflicts. Cindy, this is directed to you moving forward and ignoring your ethical responsibility as county supervisor to recuse yourself will only show your true colors to residents of San Jose when the vote for our next mayor. Special interest groups has no business being involved with redistricting. Hence, Labor Yellow's map should be eliminated. And also, 
the E, the the one that's leased is, I think it's EE 2.0. Next speaker is Arconda. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. This is Richard Conda, President Wasserman, members of the board. I'm Richard Conda, Executive Director of the Asian Law Alliance, and I am speaking in strong support of the revised unity map. The revised unity map is the only map to unite Evergreen, bringing together diverse working class neighborhoods in South San Jose with South County. Adding Evergreen into District 1 will increase the voice of the Vietnamese community. With more South San Jose residents moving into South County, there are growing familial and cultural connections between the areas. Please support the revised unity map. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I support the uh, yellow unity map because it you know, keeps the API community together. As the previous speaker said, it also keeps the Latino community together. And um, these groups have just not had good representation in the past and allowing them to have a voice in our elections uh, would support our principles, racial unity, racial, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting my words here, uh, racial equity, that's the word. And um, also as someone of low income, it seems like um, keeping communities of low income, you know, a lot of the districts were dominated by higher income groups and they will not be voting against my interests. Thank you. Next speaker is Tara Martin Milius. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you so much. I'm Tara Martin Millie, as a former Sunnyvale Council member, Chair Wasserman, and Honorable Supervisors. I'm pleased to be here today. I'm, I'm constituent of District 3. I'm supporting the EE2 and EE2 refined maps, which keeps Sunnyvale and whole, whole in District 3 and retains its a standing as an Asian minority majority district. And from my point of view, it appears to be most environmentally sound. You are where we turn when things go wrong and for regional support. We're facing many environmental challenges and we'll face more in the future. I believe to best protect our environments, to protect our populations, districts facing similar environmental issues should be clustered as much as possible to focus resources on similar problems like wildfires in the forested areas and sea level rise in some of the urban areas. Such districts can then focus on resources, focus resources on, on the multiplicity of challenges. Next speaker is Dennis Byron. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yeah, thank you for letting me talk today. Um, I'm a realtor, Montava Realty, and a developer. And I've been in this county for most of my life, uh, well over 50 years. And I've noticed that the demographics have continually moved south. And Los Gatos has more in common with the mountain communities, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, and, um, and, and areas south. Uh, the population is gonna continue moving south. It's been moving south since 1950. And I think that to keep uh, District uh, EE2 is the most logical uh, realm of possibilities for this map. Uh, yellow and purple don't seem to make cognitive sense to me when it comes to strictly demographics. Thank you for letting me talk. Next speaker is Sandra. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you very much for your time and for allowing me to speak. I would like to point out several items. First, the yellow map was developed by software not given to other community maps. That software very well could have had um, demog could have had voting information and precinct voting information and alignment. That map should not be used to. We do have conflicts of interest for two of our supervisors. They should recuse themselves. Three, I support the EE map. It keeps communities together. It's more compact and it follows more consistent lines that we have now that assures representation. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Bye.
Next speaker is Connie Chu. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, this is Connie Chu. I'm with SEIU 521, retiree of Santa Clara County. As stated early this month, the um, unity map, uh, known as the yellow map, was created by civil rights and community-centered leaders and organizations. The coalition of leaders and additional community organizations supporting the unity map is continuing to grow. And this is how we get a fair map and build consensus. The redistricting process should not be about who's running or how current or future candidates may be affected. We need a map that puts together communities of interest and push back a history of voter suppression, limiting the voices of communities of color and working people. The unity map is both balanced in population deviation and racial and ethnic spread while also seeking to advance fair elections simultaneously and ensure that there is a multiracial consensus. Thank you so much. And to the man about labor, uh, we're not social interest. Next speaker is Cher. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, yes, I live in San Jose and I am here to recommend that you vote for the EE 2.0 equal and equitable map. Um, the DVA's got the best deviation of all. And I would recommend that you reject the yellow map. That is done by special interest groups. One of the reasons that we moved to redistricting commissions were to move away from politicians being able to um, do the redistricting, but instead now we move to a political party and a, a labor union to do the redistricting. That makes no sense. It's not fair. It's, it's totally circumventing the, um, the purpose of having people have a voice in the redistricting process. So I urge you to accept the EE 2.0 equal and equitable map. Thank you. Next speaker is Diane Gleason. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi. I, I, am, I am strongly in support of the EE uh, refine, uh, refine map does unify Sunnyvale, but it also keeps Los Gatos and District 5 with the other rural areas which have the same environmental concerns, particularly wildfire prevention. The EE map keeps more current communities together than the yellow and purple maps do. In fact, the EE refined map has the least total plan deviation. Redistricting shouldn't mean major changes to the current maps, but just a few tweaks. EE2 map has similar racial demographics to the yellow map and better than the purple map. And this supports the goals of the groups who created the unity map. So the EE map supports their goals, plus it doesn't make major changes. So why do we need the major change of moving Los Gatos to a different district if the statistics don't support it? Plus, I am concerned about the two candidates who are supporting the two um, um, others and concerned about uh, bias. Please recuse yourself. Thank you. Next speaker is Ben Vo. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Ben? Yes. Um, hi, members of, of the board and of the public. Um, my name is Ben Vo. I am a Santa Clara County resident um, in District 2, and I'm here in support of the Santa Clara County Redistricting Unity Map, um, also now known as the Revised Yellow Map. Um, not only will it ensure that all of our votes have equal weight, but I stand with the district lines that were drawn by civil rights and cultural organizations in San Jose, such as the Asian Law Alliance, NAACP of Silicon Valley, the La Raza Roundtable, as well as the Latino Leadership Alliance. I think that strongly, I strongly support the UNIMAP um, because it keeps neighborhoods and communities of San Jose to, of whole, of Santa Clara County whole. Um, and I urge you all, like um, Supervisor Chavez and former Supervisor Cortez once did for the new, newly opened Vietnamese American Service Center, like Richard Honda mentioned, um, to keep the Evergreen neighborhood together and to support our communities. Thank you. Next speaker is caller with the number ending in 459. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, my name is Chris Logan, and I am the organizing manager for the Real Coalition. The following members support drawing Santa Clara County's electoral district boundaries in a manner that does not suppress the votes of Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous residents. The unity map creates 
created by a local coalition is currently the only map that does not suppress the unified voices of people of color who have been historically underrepresented. Um, this has been signed by representatives from the Asian Law Alliance, Loaves and Fishes, Recovery Cafe, Latinas Contra Cancer, As You Care, Cal California, Sil Silicon Valley, Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County, Downtown College Prep, Ujima Adult and Family Services, Project More, Peninsula Family Services, Latinas United for a New America, Somos Mayfair, International Children Assistance Network, UACI, Sacred Heart Community Service. Next speaker is Madison Beckett. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, yeah, my name is Madison Beckett and I'm a resident of District 1 and I'm in strong support of the Unity Map. Working class people such as myself in South County have had vastly different experiences and interest than those that live in areas such as Monte Sereno, Almaden Valley, and Los Gatos. The Unity, the Unity map is the only map that addresses this unfair districting that has allowed incredibly white suburban cities to overpower our votes in District 1. Our issues have been historically diluted and underrepresented, underrepresented and the Unity map addresses this. The fact that the Unity map was created by civil rights and community-centric leaders is essential. Um, and because of this, I'm in strong support of the Unity map. Next speaker is Ms. Rain Gabby Mendoza. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Unfortunately, Ms. Rain is using an older version of Zoom and is unable to participate. Next speaker is Joanne Fierro. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, thank you for this time. I would like to just, uh, I live in District 1 and I am for the yellow unity map. I feel this is the map that is the fairest to uh, the majority of the people that live in Gilroy, our Latinx community. Uh, we face a very difficult a, a way to get services down here when we're combined with other areas that are more affluent than we are. We're always competing. I would really encourage the supervisors to vote for the unity map. Uh, also, I think that it isn't harmful to have the whole of the West Valley be together as one district. So thank you for your time. Next speaker is Adriana Ologni. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Adriana, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Adriana Garcia and I am a resident of District 7. Um, and I'm here in full support of the Unity Map. I um, also want to support some of the ways that the Unity Map is inclusive and some of the recommendations uh, within the map in each district. This map um, was created by civil rights and community-centric leaders and organization. It was crafted with thoughtfulness, um, inclusion, equity, and a justice lens. And by considering this map, uh, we're going to not only set the tone, um, at the end of the day, we are uh, people who have migrated to this county and or have a historical relationship. But by using the unity map, it allows in, in through an indigenous lens, right, set the tone uh, for an equitable way of living seven generations forward. Next speaker is John Cordes. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. My name is John Cordes. I'm a resident of Sunnyvale, California. I'm calling today to support the E2.0 map with refinements. Um, I think it's the best balanced map looking at uh, all the criteria and the data that's been provided. And it's also the most comp uh, compact as far as keeping together. Um, I need to understand for uh, supervisors are going to vote on this. What overriding concern would you have for picking another map when the EE 2.0 has the least total plan deviation by almost an order of a magnitude of 100%? Right, it's more than twice as good as the purple or 
and way, way, way better than the is at 5.2%. So I don't know, you know, it'd be really strange for me to see why those maps are better. And also, I think this one has the best balance as far as uh, racial equity in that it's got the uh, API of 50% for one district and the Latino API uh, and the Latino representation is 49% for another. And I'm also very concerned by the um, apparent. Next speaker is Steve Pagan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. I'm a resident of District 1 and against the yellow map. The redistricting process is based on the state's election code under super, supervisorial districts. Special interest groups are demanding that demographic criteria like income levels or unsubstantiated claims of voter suppression be considered in determining boundaries of the district. However, these are not valid criteria under the state's election code. The code specifically states that the first criteria is that the supervisor supervisorial districts shall be substantially equal in population. The yellow map does not provide this. The next criteria, oops. The, the next criteria is that geographic integrity of any local neighborhood or local community of interest shall be respected in a manner that minimizes its division. The evergreen example of, of evergreen being combined with Sunnyvale and Milpitas violates this criteria. Uh, the yellow map must be disqualified because it violates the criteria spelled out in the election code and was. Next speaker is Rebecca Armendares. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, honorable supervisors. As a long, as a lifelong D1 resident, I'm writing to you in strong support of the unity map, the yellow map. It was intentionally created to seek an equitable, fair district that will give an undiluted voice to the people of South County that we have been lacking for generations. My community deserves a voice. The median income for several neighborhoods in Gilroy is less than 40,000, while the median income for Almaden Valley is 270,000. The Latino population of Monte Sereno is in the hundreds. We do not share a community of interest with either of these communities, nor Los Gatos. The current district lines uh, in, for District 1 are a form of voter suppression of working class and Latino voters, plain and simple. The unity map diversifies the district by substituting Los Gatos, Monte Sereno, and Almaden Valley for Evergreen and Silver Creek to create a diverse district that is racially balanced as opposed to the current white majority district. As a democracy, it's imperative that we recognize that this unity map keeps communities of interest together. Thank you. Next speaker is Teresa Perez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Teresa Perez, a D1 Gilroy resident, and I'm calling in support of the proposed unity map. There's a greater connection between Gilroy and Morgan Hill with places like Evergreen, Oak Grove, or Cambrian, and many families have moved from South San Jose to South County in recent years, including myself and a handful of my closest childhood friends and family. D1 would have a more diverse electorate with communities that share cultural resources and interests rather than what it is now, a district where a more diverse area such as South County is dominated by exclusive wealthy suburbs. The unity map dismantles years of unfair maps, which has allowed white suburban cities and areas to overpower our votes, such as Monte Sereno, Elman and Valley, and Los Gatos. Many of us have unique challenges not represented by someone from those cities. We have more working class folks. The unity map is the only map that addresses this. In the South County and South San Jose area, when promoting and supporting initiatives, our neighbors to the immediate North will unify with our needs and us with theirs. This map recognizes and addresses the disconnect from leadership to the community they represent. Thank you. Next speaker is Sam Sal Forum. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, President Wasserman, uh, esteemed supervisors. I am a long time resident of Santa Clara County, currently in District 2 uh, in the Reed Hillview area. So basically on the cusp of East San Jose and Evergreen. Um, I'm speaking today to encourage you to please support the unity map, the yellow plan. Uh, I think that this provides the greatest amount of balance and fairness for working families in our community. And those of you that cast aspersions on Cindy Chavez 
and Susan Ellenberg. Uh, I take great exception to that. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Gilroy Mayor Marie Blankley. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Supervisors, I implore you to reject the yellow map as a redistricting option. Gilroy's struggles to fit into Santa Clara County are hard enough without losing our contiguity with the more rural areas so that needs like transportation and fire protection, to name a few, remain similar within the same district. We struggle with affordable housing for our own residents because AMI is a countywide figure that prices Gilroy residents out of even the most affordable of affordable housing. We are arguably a city more akin to San Benito County, where AMI would mean much better access to affordable housing for Gilroy residents. But like it or not, we are part of Santa Clara County, and our District 1 representative is the only voice we have. The needs of rural South County are not better served by the yellow map that introduces even more differences and disparity into District 1. Instead, I urge support of the EE 2.0 because it retains the existing contiguity and keeps Gilroy from struggling even more to fit in. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ali Miano. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm a Los Gatos resident uh, and I'd like to see us uh, go with the unity map. I would like us to be in District 5. I think that's the best way uh, to ensure that uh, Los Gatos, which is 80% white, doesn't water down the Asian and Latino votes in South County or the low income votes in South County. Moreover, uh, as a Los Gatos resident since age five, uh, I can tell you that um, most of us work up the peninsula. Um, that's where we, you know, when we're not in town here, that's where we spend a lot of time. There really isn't a large affiliation with uh, South County, unfortunately. Um, and in terms of fire districting, uh, we have a great deal in common. And if you look at the, uh, the fire districts, same thing right up along the Polinsinola, uh, along Skyline Boulevard. Thank you for taking my comment. Next speaker is Brian Wheatley. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Brian Wheatley and I'm a resident of D4 as well as the current SJUSD board president. The unity map or yellow was created by civil rights and community centric leaders and organizations. It was crafted with these insights in mind. The coalition of leaders and additional community organizations supporting the unity map is growing deal daily. This is how we get a fair map and build consensus. The redistricting process should not take into consideration who is running or how current or future candidates may be affected by this process. The unity map empowers our AAPI and Latinx Latino community by creating and maintaining AAPI majority and Latinx majority districts and keeping our marginalized communities of South and East San Jose together to ensure their voices are not diluted. We need to create a map that puts together communities interests and pushes back on the history of voter suppression, limiting the voices of communities of color and working people. I ask each of you to support the unity map. It's what's best for the entire community. Thank you. Next speaker is Neil Park McClintock. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, President Wasserman and County Board members. My name is Neil Park McClintock. I'm a community leader in District 5. I'm the president of Cupertino for All. I'm also a community organizer for the Yellow Map, and this means I've had the privilege of speaking with hundreds of folks throughout the county, having organic conversations about what folks would like to see and what they would not like to see. I have also been a resident of Cupertino in District 5 um, for most of my entire life. Um, we have a distinguished region with two excellent community colleges. We are a community of interest. We're served by West Valley Community Services. We have similar tech-based economy with Apple and Netflix. And we have a unique spread of, of South and East Asian communities. Los Gatos should be part of the West Valley. We should be united. I have yet to hear folks explain why it shouldn't, except that it's rural, but it's obviously a different kind of rural in comparison. Um, I, I implore you to support the yellow map. I had a lot more to say, but time is short. Thank you. Next speaker is Marty Estrada. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. As a Santa Clara County resident, I am in support of the unity map. This map will ensure our votes have equal weight and value in our communities of, of color. And 
also like just like the folks that have drawn up this this map, cultural organizations and uh, law alliance, NAACP, La Raza Roundtable, Latino leadership. This is not a labor movement. This is a a call to now provide the right votes to folks that have been disenfranchised for such a long time. We deserve better, and we would like you to consider Unity Map going forward because it's the only best place to do this. And also, Susan, I mean, uh, Cindy Chavez, supervisor, you go, girl. You go win that mayorship in the city of San Jose. Thank you. Next speaker is David Noel. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is David Noel. I'm president of Erickson Neighborhood Association in San Jose, currently in District 1. I urge you to adopt the refined equal and equitable 2.0 map, which was created following the fundamental guiding laws and best practices for redistricting, namely contiguity, <laughs> compactness, local geographical boundaries, minimizing division of cities, and preserving communities of interest, enabling effective and efficient governance for all. I urge you to reject the yellow map from further consideration as it was blatantly developed contrary to these laws and best practices to disenfranchise moderate and conservative voices and tilt the political balance of the Board of Supervisors. Please keep the needs of underserved communities at top of mind in all your decisions while in office, but don't fall for the false narrative that massively disrupting district boundaries along racial lines is the silver bullet to solve wrongs from multiple generations ago. As requested by the Mercury News, I urge you to ensure that good governance and what's best for Santa Clara County prevails. Thank you. Next speaker is Dennis Ramon Herrera. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Dennis Ramon Herrera, please unmute yourself. Sorry, it's not Dennis, it's Denise. My apologies. That's okay. Good afternoon, honorable supervisors. Thank you for attending the March on Sunday. Los Gatos stands against hate. My name is Denise Ramon Herrera. I've lived in the Valley of Hearts Delight since 1959. Our family relocated from New York. My husband and I were educated in the Oak Grove and Frankly Henley School Districts. We graduated from the East Side Union High School District. Our children were educated in public schools in the Santa Clara County. I spent 35 and a half years as a public education service servant, 33 and a half years in the Los Gatos Union School District. I am a resident of Los Gatos, rural area in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I support the EE2 and, re and EE2 revised map. This map keeps together the rural communities, communities including Amaden, Gilroy, Los Gatos, Manasareno, Lexington Hills, Morgan Hill, and San Martin near the mountains, District 1. Thank you. Next speaker is Mary Gloner. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you, President Wasserman and supervisors. I speak to you as a community health professional dedicated to strengthening the lives of our most vulnerable the lived experience of a Filipino immigrant family and a member of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits Policy Council. Please adopt the unity map. For many cultures like mine who thrive in an extended family network and village structure, neighborhoods and district maps can preserve and foster an environment of connectedness for diverse communities through equitable access of resources, investment of services, and exercising their power to elect officials that understand their village. Finally, while I'm a San Jose resident, my work spans throughout the county. It's important to map out districts that are not San Jose centric when combined with other smaller cities to ensure parity and the voices of smaller cities are not overpowered by San Jose. Thank you. Next speaker is Laurel Hanchett. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Laurel Hanchett. I'm a lifelong resident of District 1. I am also an Asian American and mother, and I am urging you to vote no for the yellow map. I live in a rural area in New Almaden uh, in South San Jose, and I want to stay with our, my South County neighbors, people who understand um, what it's like to live in a rural area and have the same concerns as I do, especially about fire and infrastructure. So I'm urging you, please vote no on the yellow map. Next speaker is Yuri M. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. 
Hi, my name is Yudi. I am a resident at the District 7, um, and I am calling in in support of the Unity Map. Like I said before, um, these changes to the lines are supposed to give people um, equality, um, and the people um, sitting that are going to make the decision are supposed to be able to support that. And if the change that you're going to make is not uh, is not really doing anything and it's keeping people uh, oppressed like it has over the last years, and there really is no point in changing the lines. Um, so I'm in support of the union map because it would finally give everybody uh, the equal vote, equal chance, and equal rights um, that everybody deserves. Thank you. Next speaker is Forrest. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, Honorable Supervisors and President Washman. My name is Dr. Forrest Peterson. Uh, I was born in South San Jose. I've lived in three of the five districts and in the remaining two districts I've worked. Uh, essentially, I've moved slowly north. Uh, my comments are in support of the revised Unity uh, Yellow Unity Map. Uh, growing up in the South County, I didn't even know where Los Gatos was. I'm not sure if I even knew there was a Los Gatos. It's that disconnected from the South County. Um, it wasn't until I moved far enough north that I lived in Cupertino that, uh, of course, I immediately knew that area. I probably visit that area now more from Palo Alto. And then my comments quickly in the research space, I work with uh, workforce education where I've learned through that, that redlining is an undeniable current force in shaping the communities. Uh, I work with Eastside, Live Oak, and Gilroy uh, High Schools. And the Unity Map is created by a community that I've seen through my labor standards research that is a network of feedback from the community. Thank you. Next speaker is Kimmy. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. I support the map added by Supervisor Westman. It's called um, EE 2.0. Um, the map limit the split of all cities with only San Jose split, keep our community together and united um, Las Gatos, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, and Armadon together in District 1. Um, I'm also very surprised people nowadays still using the victimhood to um, um, uh, saying that Asian and Latinos are oppressed. There are many of uh, successful Latinos in the in the in Santa Clara County, and yellow map is decide uh, is um, divisive. It's hateful. If you are minority, you are supporting this hateful map. You should be very shameful because. Next speaker is John McGowan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. I'm John McGowan, live in District 3 in the south half of Sunnyvale. Uh, and I reject the concept of gerrymandering strictly for short term political gain. And unfortunately, the yellow map, uh, which is in fact a labor and special interest group document, uh, it breaks up the cities and communities of interest. It doesn't do anything to uh, benefit either uh, contiguity or racial balance. And uh, I am opposed to that. I think uh, it, it should be called out for what it is, which is special interest position. Uh, and I'm a strong supporter for the EE 2.0. I think that districts like Sunnyvale and Evergreen ought to be unified, and I believe the rural parts of the county deserve a voice from Gilroy to Los Gatos. Thank you. Next speaker is Melissa Willett. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Melissa Ouellette. I am a resident of District 2. I am, in fact, a person and not a special interest, and I support the Unity Map. And a lot of my neighbors here in Seven Trees neighborhood in San Jose are working class, and we may not have the ability to weigh in on this conversation like those in the wealthier, wealthier areas, but that doesn't mean our voice shouldn't be heard. The Unity Map is the only map that keeps East San Jose whole. Every other map breaks up parts of East San Jose's community of interest or lumps together areas that will dilute the voices of residents in East and downtown San Jose. 
So I'm asking you all, our county supervisors, to not break up culturally connected communities, keep those interests together, and please not dilute the working class voices. Thank you. Next speaker is Elizabeth Doyle. Elizabeth is using an older version of Zoom and unable to provide public comments. Next speaker is Rafael Villagracia. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good day, President Wasserman and County Board members. My name is Rafael Villagracia and I'm a young renter living with my family in Mr. Green. My representative is Supervisor Otto Lee, who I thank for being a steadfast supporter of API communities. I say this as a member of the building community myself. I'm in strong support of Community Map, which has pulled, managed to pull off an incredibly difficult task, keeping together our cities, neighborhoods, and communities of interest, while simultaneously implementing a framework of equity in the district process. Unity Map empowers API community interests, not just in District 3, but throughout the Santa Clara County. An essential aspect of any fair map, given that Asian Americans are the fastest growing demographic here. I trust the civil rights and community groups that came together to create this map, and I implore the Board of Supervisors to do the same, instead of listening to baseless accusations of jury. There's nothing inherently fair about the current map or other proposed maps, but the Unity Map seeks to make it fair. Thank you for your support. Please support the Unity Map. Thank you. Next speaker is Andrew Toulson, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Toulson. I'm a longtime resident of Santa Clara County in San Jose. I strongly encourage the supervisors to adopt the EE 2.0 map. It does the best job of all the maps at keeping communities, cities, and people together. That is shown in the deviation and statistical analysis of the different options. We need a map that allows similar peoples to be together, and the EE map does that better than any other map. Please adopt the map that most fairly groups our county into light groups. The yellow map skews the population and representation away from our voters. Again, please adopt the EE 2.0 map. It is representative, it is fair, and it's mathematically proven to do a better job than all the other maps. Thank you. Next speaker is Ruth Callahan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity. I am a resident of San Jose since 1974. I am a member of Council um, President Wasserman's district. I'm speaking on behalf and against, on behalf of the EE2 map and against the yellow unity map. And the reason against the yellow, um, <clears throat> the yellow unity map is that its basic criteria is race. Its basic criteria is a, advancing a political party agenda. These are in direct dispute with the mandate given the supervisors to do as little damage as possible to keep communities together and not have kind of crazy non-contiguous maps. Um, when we speak about community, it's neighborhoods, it's association, it's... Next speaker is Araceli Redan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Araceli Rueda. I was born and raised in South San Jose, and I am in strong support of the Unity Map. The Unity Map overall does a better job than other proposed maps at empowering the Latino community and bringing us together in our electoral districts. While this process is not designed to rectify legacies of racism, this map allows us to do that while also abiding by all the necessary laws and expectations for the redistricting process. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Fong. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello? Yes. Okay. The Unity Map was created by civil rights and community centric leaders and organizations. It was crafted with this insights in mind. The coalition of leaders and additional community organizations supporting the Unity Map is growing daily. This is how we get a fair map, this is how we build consensus. The Unity Map keeps every city and town in the county whole except San Jose, empowering our cities to speak with one voice in elections. The Unity Map empowers our AAPI and Latinx communities by creating and maintaining an AAPI majority and the Latinx majority districts 
and keeping our marginalized communities of South and, and East San Jose together to ensure their voices aren't diluted. The redistricting process should not take into consideration who is running or how current or future candidates may be affected by this process. We need to create a map that puts together communities of interest and push back on history of voter suppression, limiting the voices of communities of color and working people. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeffrey Suzuki. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jeff Suzuki. I am a Los Gatos resident and president of the Los Gatos Anti-Racism Coalition. My message is simple. Los Gatos nor Almaden Valley should not be in District 1 and instead should be included in District 5. For that reason, I thoroughly oppose maps like E2 and I support maps like the Unity Map. I have two basic reasons. When people talk about neighboring cities and how we interact with them, we don't talk about cities like Gilroy, like at all. People in Los Gatos have more affinity with everything from Saratoga to Palo Alto and residents here just don't talk about Gilroy. The people that live there, the transportation infrastructure, nor any of their policies, because we aren't in the same community of interest, which brings me to my second point. Regardless of the intent, supporting the placement of Los Gatos and Albany Valley in District 1 is effectively voter depression. Um, you are basically guaranteeing that the votes of Latinos and other people that live down the South don't matter. Put Los Gatos in District 5, don't vote for EE2. Thank you. Next speaker is Brian O'Neill. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Brian O'Neill. I've been a resident of Almadan Valley for 36 years and I have lived in the county for 61 years. I am in support of the yellow map. I do not believe the yellow map is trying to gerrymander two candidates from competing in District 1 supervisor election. I am sure there are conservative independents, moderate Democrats and Republicans that can be candidates who live in the new district one if the yellow map is approved. This is not about individuals or political ideology. The yellow map is about making sure working families and communities of color that have not been fairly represented in the past have equal access to community resources and a fair say in the representation. I resent that the Mercury News editorial has made ideology an issue in this important job the board has to do, which is to make sure that all members of our communities have a fair say in their representation. Thank you. Next speaker is Jose L. Haven. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jose Luis Pavon. I am a political organizer for SEIU USWW. Our union represents uh, senators and security officers and uh, airport workers in Santa Clara County and San Jose. And um, um, speaking in, in full support of the unity map, uh, we are not, the labor movement is not a special interest group. We represent people with uh, low amount of uh, education, uh, financial assets, political access, and we make sure everyone is given a voice and we support uh, a more robust democracy. And the unity map is what's going to secure uh, a, a functional and strong democratic process in San Jose and Santa Clara County. And it, it, is, um, it is the best way to make sure everybody has an equal voice. Thank you. Next speaker is Maria. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Maria Rocha. I have been a resident of Santa Clara County for over 40, 45 years now. I am in favor of the redistricting unity map, which is today the yellow map. This will ensure all of our votes to have equal balance. All of our voices have equal ability and that our communities and that our have the same resources. I would like to see it create a more fair-minded and just city for our Latino, Asian, and Black, as well as our indigenous neighbors. I believe that we need to do more than to try to balance populations because there is nothing constitutionally fair, honesty, or righteousness about this current map. Like many other community members in our region, I stand with our region. I stand with the district lines drawn by civil rights and cultural organizations in San Jose, 
such as La Raza Roundtable and the Latino Leadership Alliance, as well as the Asian Law, as the Asian Law Alliance. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Victor Vasquez, the director of Somos Mayfra. I live in Morton District 2, which includes a large percentage of Latinos and Chicanos. To be clear, we're not using any victim cards. We were born out of segregation, colonization, redlining. This is a fact. We've been border suppressed. We've continued to experience racism and isolation. Please do not gaslight us. Despite all these efforts and despite being indigenous people of this land, we don't have the power in our communities to represent us. And at times, to have the resources that we need to survive and thrive. COVID has shown us that, that this issue impacts us as Latinos and BIPOC communities. Our promotoras went door to door to make sure that we had the census data so we can have the right maps being drawn so that we can have hospitals, resources that will save our lives allocated to our community. We support the unity map for our community. We think that it's a fair way to make sure that um, we're all represented in the city and the county as well. Next speaker is Brian Pors. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. I'm Brian Pors and I'm a UA Local 393 plumber and Morgan Hill resident. Um, I'm strongly in favor of the unity map. Um, you know, many of us have uh, unique challenges that isn't quite represented by, uh, by some of our other cities in the district like Monte Sereno, Almaden Valley and Los Gatos. Um, we have more workers out there and uh, you know, the unity map is really the, the only map that addresses this. And uh, you know, the redistrict redistricting process should not take uh, into consideration who is running or how current or future of candidates might be affected by this process. There are multiple candidates who, who might have to run for a district, different district, and uh, you know, all in all, this product, uh, this process should not be centered around them. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeffrey Buchanan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Members of the board, uh, on behalf of the Unity Map Table, uh, I'd like to recommend that the Board of Supervisors uh, consider the revised yellow map uh, that was submitted earlier by the Unity Mapping Table uh, going forward in future hearings. Uh, this was a more compact, lower deviation version of the yellow first refinement redistricting map created by staff. Uh, the map would bring together uh, communities of interest like Evergreen. It would unite Edenvale with East San Jose and downtown San Jose and bring communities like Harson and Willow Glen together, which we've heard our communities of interest in the testimony to date. Uh, they would bring more boundaries uh, of the district lines in line with previous district lines improve compactness by moving Lexington Hill into D5 and straighten up the boundaries between D1, D2, and D3. Uh, as a Burbank resident and a representative of the Luther Burbank School Board, I also believe this map best represents our community of interest and the interests of our working families, our students, and students and communities of color like them across the county. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Brenda Doman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I've been a resident of Santa Clara County since uh, 1967. I presently live in the city of San Jose and I strongly support the EE 2.0 uh, map. Um, it limits splits of cities and keeps communities together. I believe that the yellow unity map is a political special interest map that was presented nationwide in almost every metropolitan area, st state or county. And I don't think that special interests should be considered when putting together districts for, for uh, representation. Um, I believe C Supervisor Cindy Chavez should recuse herself from the vote on redistricting. Um, and I, uh, I strongly support the EE 2.0 map. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And Nancy, before you go on to the next one, I don't know if you have the ability to or not, but uh, Walter Wilson was number 41, then stepped away and can't get back on. If you can allow him, if you see a name to do that, please do so. If not, we'll just keep going here. He is the next speaker in the queue. Oh, there we go. Thank you. That works then. 
Walter Wilson, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. Yes, so I'm here today to support the Unity Map. Um, I support all the organizations, groups, and uh, others who are behind this map, NAACP, La Raza, Asian Law Alliance, and so many other groups and organizations and all the work that was done by Somos Mayfair and so many others to make this happen. At the end of the day, this is our opportunity as communities of color to right the wrongs. And for those people who came here and said, oh, we don't have a right to be able to right the wrongs of the past because of race, you're wrong. That's what democracy is all about and that's what this process is. And so those who think that we're special interests, I would say, yes, we are special interests. Latinos are special interests. Blacks are special interests. Asians are special interests. Women are special interests. LGBTQ, we're all special interests and we all have a right to this democratic process. I support the yellow map and I urge the Board of Supervisors to do the same. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Next speaker is Bao True. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, good afternoon, Supervisor and other uh, members of the county uh, supervisor. Uh, my name is Bao Chiu. Uh, I am speaking uh, on behalf of Vivo and others in the Vietnamese community. We would like to support the yellow map, which is also the unity map. The unity map represents the collaboration of many community activists and groups encompassing the Asian AAPI communities, the Black, the Latins, and others representing the voice of the working class and the empathic members of our communities. The unity map represents the challenging work of these communities and their leaders. We would like to have the unity map to empower and continue to empower these communities in Santa Clara County. It is an important step in empowering these working class communities to ensure every vote count and strengthen the movement for economic justice across our region. Thank you. Next speaker is J.R. Fruin. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. My name is J.R. Fruin. I am a lifelong resident of the West Valley and a current resident of District 5. I'm here this afternoon to support the yellow map. The West Valley cities like mine, Cupertino from Los Gatos all the way north to uh, Palo Alto along the 85 corridor share a community of interest in terms of their physical form, income levels, employment and specific topographic and environmental concerns immediately bordering the Santa Cruz Mountains. Even on a intuitive basis, walk around these communities, ask yourself if Los Gatos has more in common with, say, Los Altos. That said, um, none of these communities, including Los Gatos, share these concerns um, and, and interests with more rural communities that are further flung in South County, uh, including Morgan Hill and Gilroy. I urge you to support the yellow map. Thank you. Our 50th speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm a sixth generation Chicano and a uh, registered California Native Mission uh, Indian Komie. And so two fundamental principles, two fundamental um, uh, rights were deprived of the Chicano when the redlining map was made in 1938. Number one, due process of the law. That was deprived of the Chicano. Number two is equal protection under the law. Those two fundamental principles that I have a right to and that my ancestors had a right to, that was deprived of them as a result of that 1938 map. All this is doing, all I needed to know was the Senor Victor Garza of La Raza Roundtable. All I needed to know that he was in on this conversation and I trusted it implicitly. How could I not? Because we share that Chicanismo here in San Juan and this is the means by which it's corrected. President Wasserman, that was our 50th speaker. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing and now look to board members to provide input and direction to administration relating to draft redistricting plans and any proposed changes. I have some comments I would like to make that I always defer. I don't see any hands up 
at the moment. So I will make my comments. Over the past 10 years, population shifts have made the five current supervisorial boundaries very unequal. In fact, they have grown to have a 17.2% deviation. The closer to a 0% deviation, the better, so that each supervisor represents approximately the same number of people. In fact, the election code section lists having substantially equal populations of total residents for each district as its number one criteria. But this isn't the only criteria. Redistricting is a com complex process that ensures our democracy's promise that one person is equal to one vote. All three maps satisfy the basic requirement that districts are substantially equal in population and are contiguous. The key differences are how they incorporate the communities of interest testimony we have received. And I know we've all received a lot. The maps are also different in terms of overall population deviation, compactness, and whether the boundaries are easily understood. The redistricting criteria for creating new district boundaries are create geographically contiguous districts, which we find map EE 2.0 does. Keep cities whole and neighborhoods and communities together to the greatest extent possible which we find map EE 2.0 does. Follow easily identifiable boundaries. Again, which we find map EE 2.0 does. Encourage geographic uh, compactness, which we find map EE 2.0 does. Don't favor or disadvantage a political party, which we find map EE 2.0 adheres to as well. After studying all the materials and revised maps, it is clear that the refined EE 2.0 map is a superior choice. It has the lowest total plan deviation of 1.2%, and it keeps existing neighborhoods and communities of interest together. I'm extremely grateful for the work of the Advisory Redistricting Commission and for the many community members and organizations that have contributed to developing the draft maps to create fair and equitable districts. And all that said, I'm supporting the refined EE 2.0 map going forward and would be happy to make that motion. Supervisor Smitty. I'll second the motion and I'd like to speak to it if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Thank you. I. Um... <clears throat> I've actually had the opportunity over the years to represent um, much of this area, uh, including at one point about 300,000 folks in San Jose, but also uh, briefly the communities of Los Gatos and uh, Montes Reno uh, just for a couple of years. Uh, and of course, now I represent the fifth district, which is um, a combination of uh, cities that think of themselves in the North County and uh, also think of themselves in the West Valley. And so um, I have some firsthand experience uh, with issues of representation for the folks in my district. Um, and, and let me just uh, <clears throat> focus on a few points that lead me to second the motion. <clears throat> I do think um, the issue of deviation has uh, frankly not gotten as much attention as I believe it re is required uh, given the law. The, the principle of one person, one vote, meaning that districts are equal uh, uh, as nearly as possible is, is an important one. It's not the only one, but it's a highly important one. And as you've highlighted um, on that matter, uh, the EE 2.0 revised, um, is uh, clearly uh, the map that has the smallest deviation uh, and the so-called yellow map has a uh, appreciably higher deviation, three or four times uh, the level of deviation. And that's a compelling point to me. It is also, it being the uh, EE 2.0 revised, clearly the most compact. Um, I don't think either of those issues are, uh, quote, debatable. I think those are just facts. 
On the issue of affinity, communities of interest, uh, similarity, uh, you know, I understand people will have a range of views, but I do think folks in the environmental community have made a compelling case that the issue of more rural lands, uh, environmentally sensitive lands, um, is an important one, and that diluting that by removing Los Gatos and the hills above Los Gatos and the Almaden Valley uh, from District 1 makes it even tougher to protect the sensitive lands in the South County. Uh, and so I am persuaded by that. But I also want to focus for a minute, I want to ask my colleagues to focus on this issue for a minute, on an issue that hasn't gotten much conversation, uh, certainly in the uh, testimony or the many letters and emails we've received. And that's the issue of our small cities and their ability to compete for airtime in the governmental arena if they are all packed into one district as the yellow map would do with the smaller cities in District, um, district 5, the district I represent. Um, now, I know you know, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm termed out, so I don't have a, quote, vested interest in this. Doesn't mean my view is right or wrong, just means I, I really don't have a vested interest. I do have the experience of representing smaller communities over the course of my career. And, you know, Santa Clara County is very different than other counties in that we have one large city, San Jose, with roughly 52% of the population and then 14 other smaller cities, which along with the unincorporated area is 48% of the population. So the smaller cities often feel that they are struggling to be heard. Uh, you know, I try to remind the smaller cities that I represent the folks in them, hey, you know, San Jose has got a right to be heard when it is 52% of the population, just as the smaller cities who taken together at 48% uh, are also have a right to be heard. But there is a phenomenon in reapportionment and redistricting called cracking, stacking, and packing. And when you pack nine cities into District 5, which is what the yellow map would do, eight of the smaller cities and a piece of San Jose, you essentially say we're going to limit or minimize the voice of the smaller cities by pushing them all into one district rather than spreading them out a little bit more evenly so that the smaller cities play a role and have a voice throughout the county. That's why I've always thought having four cities in addition to San Jose in District 1 was a good thing for folks in all 14 of the smaller cities, particularly for Los Gatos and Montessorino, who I think will struggle to get noticed, frankly, in a larger, excuse me, in a collection of more uh, small cities in District 5. And I actually think that Gilroy and Morgan Hill will discover that they no longer have as much voice in District 1 because now uh, the smaller cities will be reduced to a smaller fraction, absent Los Gatos and absent Montessorino. So, and the irony here is I, you know, I, I hear people speak with passion and I get that, but really suggesting that the, uh, you know, more than 100,000 people in Gilroy and Morgan Hill are, are somehow dominated by the 30,000 people in Los Gatos, I think that's a hard case to make. Uh, and uh, what I would say again is if you're saying, what's most compact, where is the deviation the smallest? Where is there a uh, community of interest along environmentally sensitive uh, slash rural lands? And what is it that provides the fairest balance between the 48% of the folks in small cities and the 52% of the folks in San Jose? It's in a map that spreads those smaller cities around and makes sure that they have a real voice throughout the county. Uh, and that for that reason, I second your motion and we'll be voting for the revised yellow, excuse me, the revised EE 2.0 map. Thank you. A motion and a second discussion. Seeing none, Nancy, would you please call for the vote? Supervisor Lee? No. Supervisor Chavez? No. 
Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. No. President Wasserman. Aye. All right, that fails three to two. I now look for another motion or suggestion as how we proceed. So, um, sorry, I didn't put my hand up. Yes, Supervisor Chavez. I will do that now. You know, um, so first of all, I do wanna say that I appreciate everybody coming out to speak. And second that, you know, I, I too, this is my last, um, a term in office. And I am very interested in making sure that the way we draw our lines are really re reflective of um, the needs of each of our communities. And, you know, one thing that I, you know, I, I could just um, ask the staff a bunch of questions because there are some issues that I, that I want to better understand. But one thing I would like to request is that I got a, a revised another revised map on the on the yellow map today and then another map actually that somebody else sent right after that and i'm wondering if our staff has had a chance to see side issue and simply removed over 75 percent of the land area of the current district three which i think is far too drastic a change and frankly unnecessary and potentially uh detrimental for mopitas and barriasa hillside community Putting all these areas to District 1 is too much for District 1 supervisor's responsibility, and it's better to have multiple supervisors to cover that huge area. All three maps are decent maps and are a result of thousands of works of hard work meeting the strict legal requirements. The original yellow map also has the highest deviation and lots of rugged edges, and I'm very glad that staff has been able to clean up those and reduce the deviation significantly. Therefore, I believe the latest unit map submission has addressed most of the issues I mentioned above, but not all of them, but I can support it despite some of the shortcomings. So one thing I would like to ask would be to ask staff if they could have an opportunity to do some cleanup, some of the edges again, like keeping as much evergreen into one district as possible, uh, like including Meadow Fair into evergreen in district one, that would also help increase the Latino percentage in district two, which is a legal requirement. Again, as I said, this map is by no means perfect, but I think being least problematic, and I, as I described above. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I think those are good suggestions. The only one I'm not comfortable with is moving Meadow Fair, um, because it is a pretty integral part of the current district that it's in. Um, but one, one um, addition is I, I do want the staff to um, take a look at the Lexington Reservoir area. And um, we got a lot of feedback from people in Los Gatos that they saw that as a, a really key component as a part of their community. And I think when this map comes back, as much of that that can be included makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, community, you know, how, how the community sees itself. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, th thank no, you. Thank you. Yes, the uh, people of Lexington are in the Las Gatas School District. Um, Supervisor Lee, I, I appreciate your saying how otherwise D1 would be so, um, so much to handle. D1 now goes down to, well, is headed towards going down to Morgan Hill, Gilroy, and San Jose and the unincorporated area of San Martin. Um, who I feel for is the successor in D5. Current, I believe D5 with the loss of Sunnyvale and the addition of Monasterino and Los Gatos is gonna have eight or nine cities, eight mayors, approximately 50 council members. And the reason that's manageable is because the current supervisor is a former school board president, a former mayor, a former supervisor, a former assemblyman, a former state senator, and a, and a current supervisor. And if the new person coming in does end up with eight cities, plus the unincorporated area, plus many would argue Stanford is a city, um, I wish them the best. All right, Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. 
Yes, thank you, uh, President Bossman. I, uh, I I agree. I think it's, it's a lot of uh, cities to cover, indeed. And I got a chance to speak with uh, Diane McKenna, one of the predecessor of District Five, about this issue. And one thing she actually does, and I've not done it before, I think it's a great idea. What she did when she was serving as a supervisor was she actually had a quarterly meeting with all eight cities, mayors, and city managers to talk about those issues of interest. And I think that's such a great idea to do that. And so uh, I certainly think that would be a great recommendation for somebody who succeeds uh, our, our supervisor committee in the future. Um, in any case, I, uh, on the issue of uh, metal fair, I just want to just use, ask staff, you know, I know Cindy is not uh, uh, excited of putting in together. I just wanted for purpose discussion while we're still playing with the map to just see both versions and see what comes back with it, if that's okay. But I just want to see what would come to look like because we're still messing with the edges. I mean, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work at the end, but I just wanted to just take a quick look of where it's at. One thing interesting I want to mention is the Chavez, when we um, look at the area of this um, metal fair, it actually is extremely high Asian population. So by pulling the metal fair into district one, as I was mentioning, it actually includes the CVAP number of Latinos in district two by 0.3%. So actually you have to give more high percentage of Latinos in D2. I just want to let you know that I thought it was an interesting observation because that wasn't what I was expecting when I was looking at it. So I just want to bring that to your attention too. And I think that what concerns me is there's a natural boundary around Capital Expressway and 101 that this um, that this may create a more isolated community. So I just want you to know what, what a high level of discomfort I have around this. Um, but At what? I was just going to say that, um, you know, what my what my bigger concern is, is that that total population is about 16,000. And that's not a minor adjustment as it relates to looking at the uh, maps vis-a-vis -vis population, because um, I think one of the issues that all of our colleagues have raised is lowering that uh, deviation to the lowest number possible. So I, I will just ask staff to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I did a recalc. D5 will have nine cities, including, That's what Joe was saying. including San Jose. And without San Jose, one supervisor will be representing more than 50% of the cities in Santa Clara County. All right. We have a motion and a second. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Oh, yes, I do want to mention that uh, the Lexington Hills, thank you very much, Supervisor Chavez. I heard the exactly same thing regarding Los Gatos uh, and that area is definitely one district. So thanks for uh, adding that into that. I think that's important. I'm sure Supervisor Wasserman uh, uh, agrees with that as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Seeing no more hands raised, Nancy, please call for the vote. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? No. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? No. Yeah. All right. That passes on a supervisor. Oops, Dr. Smith. Yes. Yeah. Can you clarify the motion? We we're a little confused. So yeah. we want to bring back. Um, Go ahead, Sue Chavez. Thank you. To bring back um, to our next meeting. Um, a revised version of the yellow um, map with the input of my colleagues and their um, their exhortations around the edges, including uh, specifically, I think there's unanimity over including uh, the Lexington area in the uh, into um, District Five. And yes, I'm wondering which yellow map are we? The revised. The revised. Um, the revised yellow map. That revised yellow map or the one that was that's on your staff yellow map or the new one that was introduced by Jeffrey Buchanan to I would suggest that we use the refined yellow map with an input from because that map was public and everybody had a chance to see yeah. it. So that's what I'm gonna recommend we use. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with no further hands from staff or board members. We will consider this meeting adjourned until December 7th. Thank Have you. Good evening. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Recording stopped.
Zoom will now be closing. Thank you.